site, but he was taken down. Turnstar, oh, massive kills! Massive round from Turnstar. I can't to the Barco takes out Aspie. Where things start to get a little bit more dicey, Turnstar is getting another one to follow it up, and wow. One v two, perfect first shot. The second one is there for him. Down for long to hear you stop that from happening. Doesn't come in time. DCH gets an angle, gets two down. Throw on out. And DCH off the swing. A souffle swiftly steals that away. Seal as well claims his 13th kill. 14, 15 would get the game. See, Ducks makes it a big, big win. Take a little international spot, which could be interesting. Uh, you're out there, so you, you hear things like that. Oh, did I just get like a piano <laughs> riff, or is that just me? <laughs> that was, that was me like in the that. background, baby. That was me in the background. Of course, we got Xenox, we got Guz joining yeah. us here for the pre show. Xenox, I've worked with you too much already, mate. How you doing? Yeah, good. I'm just fixing my lighting. Hang on. Yeah, please like bring it down while I speak to Guz. Guz, how are you, mate? As, as, as usual, you're ready for it. You're, you're here for yet again another day. Yeah, feeling good. Um, I was craving some dessert, so I actually just uh, ducked out and got some ice cream before. So I'm happy. I'm doing well. Look, we uh, we enjoy dessert. Oh, God. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, he's the brightest star we've ever seen in our life, and other times we do. Get I was going to go with that. I was going to go with that, but you, you stole it from me. I'm excited <laughs> for this, though, Rob. It's a very good league. I think uh, we've been kind of saying it over socials over the last couple of months, and um it's a region that pretty much peaked really at the back end of the the last year's stages going into si etc we saw again what bleed were able to do in si it's a darn shame of course there's only one slot now uh, in terms yeah, of the uh -huh. majors it and it makes it very difficult does it not for these teams and uh, already cut through and already stacked in terms of competition does now lead me to believe this is going to be the best value region in apac where you spoke about the major spot. Let's go ahead and go and look holistically on uh, what it looks like for the actual global timeline. Not so much just for Asia, but of course, the way it works, if you have not been tuning in up until now, maybe you're a Jinxie fan, maybe you're coming across to check out the new Rainbow Six Esports ecosystem. It's not new. It's been around for a hot minute. Stage one leads into the major. Teams qualify through their performance uh, in either those, you know, league plays or last chance qualifiers, depending on how you want to look at them. Then we've got a little bit of an off season by a little bit. It's quite a big off season, three months. In fact, there is something coming in that time. So that should be interesting. Uh, and then ultimately your performance throughout the year will qualify you for the six invitational, which we just saw in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Speaking of which, I think I saw, Guz, was it you that were there? Were, were you there? Yeah, I what? Pretty sure Jake and I were were at SI. Yeah, we were. Oh wow! I don't know how many times I'm going to make that joke for stage one, but it's never going to get old. Uh, just like you, Jake, you're never getting old, are you? Not <laughs> as this format. No, I mean I think the format's obviously fine. It's really difficult to probably talk too much about it, considering it's been pretty same same. I think my concern with the format, though, if I'm going to be a little bit critical, is why we've got kind of a three month off season between. The, the first major and then going into stage two, I would kind of like to have seen a bit more of a break from, say, SI into stage one, give these teams that have kind of rejigged, reformed a little bit, a, t a bit of time heading into the stage, but it does make it exciting. It does make it fun, and everyone's obviously on the same playing field. It does, though, give an advantage for the teams that have kind of stuck together, and I actually kind of like that. You want incentive for being a team that sticks together, has a core four or five, and so therefore, with this current format, you do actually get that incentive. Well, that's it. A couple of teams have made some changes, but I guess if you're looking probably toward the, the top end of, uh, well, at least the teams we expect to do well, Michael, uh, consistency has been key for them, and it looks like they've come into this league pretty, uh, pretty well put together. 
yeah, totally agree. Um, I'm fully expecting those teams that have banded together to be the best performing here in Asia. And honestly, unless you had any critical uh, things that you needed to tidy up heading into this particular year, you don't want to be mixing up the formula too much with only one spot for the major now. It is cutthroat, as Jake said. It's going to be the most high-value league in APAC, no doubt, in my opinion. Honestly, in terms of globally as well, it could well end up being one of the most competitive as well to get to the major. So, yeah, uh, I think the teams that have banded together will do a good job here. I think it's really important as well to uh, state the obvious change. You know, we've now got one league instead of two, and it's not just every team into a last chance qualifier fighting for those positions. It is, as Gaza said, and it's probably the perfect word for it, it's cutthroat. But let's go ahead and have a look at the teams to see which of the eight we think may well be pushing the envelope. Maybe might be the, uh, the right word here, Jake. I think we've got a couple of massive contenders, and maybe... I mean, maybe we might see one of the most competitive regions. I mean, I would imagine that's kind of the assumption that we've already been providing, again, on socials and already here now as well. And you kind of look at the rosters that we've got for those, of course, aware, Bleed Esports and what they've been able to do internationally, not just really at Six Invitational, also going back to Atlanta, arguably should have been there at Copenhagen as well. But the team that was there, of course, Fury and Walt, they've also continued to do the experience they can bring as well from Six Invitational, for example. Then you add in New Look, Elevate Rossa. They've gone overseas. They've picked up some new players. Direwolves make their return as well. And they've kind of got a bit of a rejig lineup too. There's also a lot of players now coming in from the Hong Kong region. We see that alone with Daystar. I'm very curious to see what they could bring to the table here. We haven't really seen that in the past when it comes to a lot of the Asia leagues that are ran. So that's something that's going to be new, invigorating, exciting. And coupled with the fact that it is the Asia League, of course, now encompassing all of Asia. Southeast Asia, along with South Asia now combining, we've still got two teams from South Asia. Knock Knock, which is pretty much the old Monkey Hunters roster. And yep. then, of course, Haseeb Warriors. And so they've also had a couple of little roster changes too coming into this stage. It's very reminiscent to what we've seen pretty much across all of the regions, Rob, where we've got a bunch of teams that have made one to three roster changes. That's no different here for the Asia League. Yeah, and I think it's it's pretty cool to see a lot of uh, a lot of familiar faces, a lot of familiar names. You know, most of the players that are in this league, I'd, I'd probably hedge my bet that like maybe 70, 75 percent of the players in this league are really long term players in uh, in the Asia region. Just as a whole, they've been around since you know twenty nineteen. Some of them much earlier than twenty nineteen. Uh, but obviously, guys, you know, I, I think it's probably important to contextualize what teams we expect to maybe. It, it's hard to say, but maybe bottom out a little bit. Do we do we expect maybe the Southeast Asian teams, the ones that really have those those global names now, you know, the Bleeds, the Furies, the Elevate, we probably expect them to be the better teams in this instance. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. In fact, this graphic probably splits them quite nicely. Top four were the invited teams to the league, and then respectively we had the Southeast Asian qualified teams, the, the bottom two um, on the left, and then the bottom right are the South Asian qualified teams to their own respective open calls. Um, from what we've seen historically over the last couple of years, there has been quite a gap between both SEA and SA, so Southeast Asia, South Asia. I expect that to continue. And realistically, we're probably only looking at the teams in the top four to qualify. And I think we'd be remiss to say it's probably between Fury and Bleed. However, Elevate and Diewolves, I think if they can piece it together and make a good run at the right time, could also be a threat as well. There's some exciting prospects and maybe some storylines that we're going to have to do justice throughout this league, but it's time for us to turn our attention to day one. This is the first step on a very long journey for some of these teams, but also a continued journey at that. You know, we saw the likes of Fury, Elevate, and Bleed over in international events last year. SI, obviously, uh, Fury and Bleed did actually perform incredibly well. So it's really set the stakes for this uh, tournament for this stage. But Xenox, I mean, do we dare talk about the very first matchup? Uh, I mean, we can quickly touch on it as probably what I think will be the game of the night, and we'll dive deeper into it very shortly afterwards. But looking at the games that ahead, straight away, you can kind of see um, for the South Asian teams, talk about, you know, baptism by fire in the opening day, going up against the likes of Elevate, then going up against the likes of Bleed. I think they're going to be the contentious, re I guess, sub-region within the Asia League when it comes to South Asia. A lot of the times, historically, we get to the playoffs, we get to the Asia League playoffs, 
and they just fall apart. They crumble. This time they'll get far more experience as we're going to play more games. And the beauty of it as well, and kind of talking a little bit about the format, is it's group stage, but it's essentially seeding from for the playoffs later on. Now, mind you, you don't want to finish in the bottom two or you miss out on playoffs altogether. So it does kind of have still that element where you need to pick up wins. And that's going to be difficult in a region like this, where I think it's going to be incredibly cutthroat. And so therefore, if you're a Hasib Warriors, if you're a Knock Knock, if you can get a bit of a win here, best of one, day one, take down one of the big boys, that goes a long way to securing a position probably in the top six and then maybe a good spot going into the playoffs. Of course, as we know, playoffs, all best of three, and it eventually leads to a grand final. That's how you then qualify for the major. So group stage matches here, probably not too important. Like if Bleed lose today, that doesn't necessarily mean they're out. They can't make the major. Oh my God, shock news. It would be more of a shock because their opponent... Yep. But that beauty of the format now is, of course, best of ones. Yeah, it's more seeding. And it's a, an exciting day for Daystar as well. I can't remember the last time we saw players from Hong Kong competing uh, in such a prestigious league, if you will. Uh, and the fact that there is an opportunity. Yeah, we've, we've already dropped the big word, guys, and I don't get too excited. But the <laughs> fact that we do get to see they are the newcomers to the league. They're the only team not returning in a respect, either from a long time ago or from very recently. They are the new top dogs in the scene if you will uh who knows what we'll expect from them but they have ed at the helm and that excites the living hell out of me because boy have i missed that young man uh, and they take on ed's former team fortunately in direwolves so it's all exciting there's so much to go through but guys it's probably in is it time to, to start focusing on the first matchup i, th I think it might yeah. be about that time yeah you let's do it. Let's do it. Let's I can't sit it. through another. I uh, can't sit through another Jakey up. So let's let's, let's, let's dive into it. it. You know what? I'll I'll let you take this one. But Fury, a roster that uh, was the only team to actually go to both majors from the Asia League last uh, last season. How do we expect them to perform today? Yeah, at least on the international stage, Fury have slowly chipped away at their standings. Copenhagen was a disappointment, 21st to 24th. Atlanta, a small step up, so they were able to breach into the top 20. SI, I, I, I guess in some respects, it isn't really that much of a step forward because there's only 20 teams at the event, but a 13th yeah. to 16th knocked out by our brethren uh, in, in Bliss and a 1-2 best of three. It was a little bit sad for them. However, I yeah. think Fury have taken a lot from the last uh, 12 months of competition, have continued to improve. Um, yeah. But I sort of posed the question, I think it was actually during Six Invitational, right? Like heading into this year, and they knew it at the time, Fury have to be even better, in my opinion, this year. They don't have that second spot to the majors to fall back on. Bleed yeah. arguably are stronger than them heading into this year. So they're going to be following them. And um, I think that this group stage is going to be particularly important for them if they want that really, really good seating in the playoff bracket. Yeah, I think it's really important for, you know, the, the conversation for Fury domestically. They definitely have always been the second, maybe third best team uh, out of Asia. And it's, it's been that way for, for quite some time. But really highlighting their performance at SI, obviously in groups, they probably uh, outperformed many expectations. They went three for one, which I think shocked everyone, you know, finishing second in mm -hmm. their group. Granted, you know, there is a big caveat to that. It was probably the weaker group uh, in everyone's eyes. So there were a couple of free jabs. There are at least close games that you could uh, contextualize for, for their performance. But look, nevertheless, we come into 2024 clean slate and we hope to see them do well. But let's start talking about their opponents for tonight. And this roster, this roster excites me a lot. Before I give it to the wonderful Jake Xenox Van Diddy to run us through this one, I actually messaged Onagiri earlier because he was down on, you know, as a sub. I asked him why he wasn't playing. He said, and I only care about this because I love Honakiri. He said that he's focusing on university and that uh, IDFC is the better player at the moment, considering his attention is completely, uh, I guess, askew with uh, you know real life issues. <laughs> so that's uh, that's a pretty good expectation for this uh, for this roster. Maybe one day we'll see Onagiri rejoin it. But Xenox, what can you tell us about? Yeah, I mean, it's been interesting, of course, when there were no cap, they were looking for an organization. And I was actually, I'm going to toot my horn here, but I was the first one really? to kind of pick up because they all got kind of signed as streamers or content creators <laughs> or something. And I, I put the pieces together. Now, for those unaware at the time, there was actually a roster already under Galita Esports in terms yep. of the organization. So that was one way to kind of get around probably the contracts that were in place. They clearly wanted to pick up these guys, the ex-Alibate roster for those unfamiliar. And, um, and they did so. 
as content creators first and then transition them to the main team once the old team's contracts basically expired. So kind of smart, you know, big brain, well-deserved. And they get themselves a good roster. Uh, as for the team itself, I, I'm, I'm going to be completely honest. Maybe years gone by, this was a roster that could dominate in terms of this region, especially when they had Onigiri. With or without him, I think they've definitely taken a few steps below. They've missed out on mages. They've missed out on SI and all of the experience that comes with that. I think Fury's gone past them clearly. I obviously know that Bleed are going to be well and truly past them. So that's already two teams that you need to overcome this stage. Uh, probably putting Galita around that middle of the pack. But if they can find some good form leading into the playoffs, the players are there, Rob. And then heading into a best of three, there is every kind of world in which they could make a bit of a run. But would I put you know, them in the top two right now? Absolutely not. No, absolutely. It's probably important to say, you know, it could be a return to their former glory, but that's, there is such a long way before we even get to that conversation. Fortunately, we don't have to wait any longer for the vetoes because they're ready. Let's go ahead and figure out where we're going for the very first map. So no skyscraper being left uh, to the leaders, Bam. I'm not even going to go and play by play these bands. We can probably just talk about the fact that this is an opening match. It's the very start of the stage. Things are always exciting, but really the expectations can be thrown out the window. However, Oregon being picked, it gives us a nice blank canvas to paint the picture guns. Yeah, I mean, it really doesn't get much more basic than that. I will say it is uh, quite notable that Labs has been let through. We're seeing a lot of teams in a lot of different regions play that out. Um, Labs was only touched once in the LCQ Stage 2 2023. Um, so it would indicate that the region as a whole is, you know, more open and willing to play that particular map. Oregon, funnily enough, was the most played. So seven players in the LCQ. We're going to see it here once more. Um, back then, it had a 56% defensive win rate, and there may be a world in which it trends a little bit more defender-sided even still. Um, so yeah, keen to see how this plays out. I don't know who's starting attack based on the graphic, but um, whoever is attacking, unfortunately, will have to grind away at these rounds to try and find at least a few to give themselves that platform for the second half. We can roll the dice and just hope that it's for the best. Uh, I have been told it's actually Fury that are attacking, so maybe, maybe that's probably the, for the best. Uh, Jake, just given the fact that, you know, maybe if Kalita is starting out on the attack, there's probably a couple more question marks. Potentially. I mean, Oregon is very, very kind of default at this point. I think it probably isn't so bad for Galita to go to a map like this, where it is that stock standard staple structured kind of setup style that we can typically see. When everyone thinks of Asia, by the way, they probably think it's going to be this like super fast pace, all aim, no brain kind of mentality, but that's not really been the case, at least for the last, I would actually dare say like 12 months. I'd say pretty much for the majority of the 2023 campaign, a lot of the teams within at least the Southeast Asian portion of APAC of South Asia, there's, there's so many sub-regions within sub-regions, but you get my picture, which is very much that these teams actually do play that kind of structure to approach and it has very much trickled down we see what bleed can do especially also fury they don't very much play this just sort of super run and gun meta i wouldn't be opposed to seeing a little bit of it just to kind of shake things up when it does come to oregon it can be a little bit you know snooze snooze festy but um in terms of this particular matchup i think for galita this is going to be a very difficult task and I don't know if the map really was going to make too much of a difference. I think Fury very much should have all of the experience to be able to take this game. Well, what's important to note is this isn't Japan. This isn't Korea. This is Asia. We don't just have to listen to these two monotonous gentlemen. Let's just call them that. That's probably the best <laughs> safer broadcast. We've got two other legends joining us, Dev and Mandy. It's the Ice League team just back together. You can't get rid of this, can you, Dev? No, can I actually kick it off with a fun fact for you, Rob? Oh, here we go. I love fun facts sponsored by Jake Xenox and Diddy. So, Jake Xenox and Diddy, this is uh, thanks to him. The last six times that Fury has played the No Cap Esports roster, so now Galita, Fury has won in a dominant fashion. So, this is actually even more of a challenge for Galita than perhaps we originally intended. Mandy, do we uh, do we feel excited for this region? You know, given the fact that these changes have come in so hot and heavy, you know, there's only one major spot now. The, yeah. the the league has shrunk dramatically from two to now one, and I mean, it's it's pretty much absolute chaos. For sure. I mean, this should be a really competitive region. I think they've got robbed of a major spot, and I feel like that's a general consensus because of <laughs> how tight the league is at the top three, right? So I think it should be, should be good. 
Mandy's going to lose her nothing. job after saying that. See you later. I didn't, I didn't say nothing. I didn't say nothing. I'd just like everyone to know that was uh, that was Mandy. That was daughter on air. You can tag her <laughs> on Twitter. But I, I think the, the general consensus is that this league is going to be a very close one. And of course, the opening match, well, it really may well have the impact that we hope for. Who knows? It could fizzle out. But Devin, Mandy, hope you enjoy the matchup. Thank you very much, Rob. Mandy, this is the region. I know the OS is close to our heart for us being from OS, but to me, this is the region that I get most excited for in Rainbow Six. Asia, Southeast Asia, and now even with two South Asian teams in the league, it just hits differently. This region, this sub-region, if you will, of the Asia Pacific has always proven to be so close, so tight, and have so many fiery up-and-coming teams, and yeah. not to mention Bleed and Fury and what they've been able to achieve on the global stage in the last year. Yeah, definitely. I feel like how tight-knit this region is goes back all the way back to APAC South days, right? It's not just when these regions split off from there, but even back then, it felt like there were seven teams that could compete for that major spot, right? I don't think anything has changed from there. This region's always been super competitive, super close. And you know what? I feel like the vibes in this region are pretty unmatched as well, right? <laughs> Everyone here is like super energetic, really positive. It's going to be a fun one. My PC is crashed. Hello. Can you hear me, Mandy? <laughs> So I've heard news that we've lost Dev, so we're going to jump into Oregon. I don't know if we're going to keep going with it, but it's just going to be me for a little bit while we get Dev back. Yeah, I've got confirmation that it is just me for a little bit as yeah, we jump into Smash Up between Galena and Fury going into Oregon. I feel like the desk has prepped this one pretty well. It should be uh, fairly one-sided towards Fury based on historic um, results, but can Galena put up a fight? We'll wait and see. Jake, you are. I think we're getting a friend. I'm so confused. There are so so there are many friends in my comms at the moment, but not on the stream right now. Which one am I gonna get? Hello, Mandy. Can you hear me, Mandy? I can. Earth's oh, I really hope that everybody back home can hear me as well. I apologize, guys. <laughs> My computer decided to chuck a hissy fit, as we say down okay. under. But we're not down under anymore. We're in Asia League, as we said. And this is the game of the night, Mandy. We've already prefaced it. Fury versus Galita Esports. Uh, the old no-cap R6. If you want to really turn the clock back, the old Elevate roster from back in the APAC South days. Yeah, Onagiri might be taking some time to focus on University, but IDFC is a phenomenal player. And Sapper's back, which is what really excites me because he was on the bench for a lot of last year. And Sapper is such an insane player. Of course, Galita do really have their work cut out for them in Fury, uh, a team that is actually, believe it or not, the back-to-back -back champions of this region. Fury came first in the last chance qualifier for Asia League in Stage 1 and Stage 2 last year, beating out Bleed both times. Uh, and now they really have no choice but to come first now with Asia only getting the single major slot. I mean, I think you can look at it either way, right? It's either that Fury have no choice but to come first, but also that Bleed can't really be dropping the ball if they get to that grand final at the end there, right? We saw them do that, I think it was twice at the end of Stage 1, but uh, uh, Stage 1 and Stage 2, but they got fortunate enough that they accumulated enough points for the six invitational and then they were both able to meet each other there as well so i think yeah like we've been prefacing it's very top heavy this league and the competition for that one spot will be pretty big but i don't know i've got my eyes set on fury i feel like they should be pretty strong contenders for it I would really love to see it. I've got a soft spot for Fury, and they are kind of the, the small fish in a big pond. If you compare them to Bleed, who has a, a far larger support from their organization, not to mention Julio, a world champion, coaching them as well. We've flown through the bands already, Mandy, but I think this is one of the first times I've ever actually seen Grimm taken out in the band phase. Yeah, Grimm has suddenly become very popular in the last couple months, I suppose, really with the changes that have come through to him, and... Don't know why, but maybe these teams have decided that he warrants a ban. Maybe something to do with uh, it's a comfort pick Attackers or something to, to do with the way they don't the like bar. the zoning utility. But whatever it might be, for some reason, they've decided to take Grim out. And what that does mean is that all the other tools that are left for the attack have been left in. All of your hard reach, all of your anti-wall denial. Uh, things should be getting opened, especially stuff like your hatches. Although two brow isn't, Attackers and it is being played the at the moment. So 
regardless of that, it should still be a pretty challenging map to attack. Yeah, we haven't seen a huge amount of impactful Tuberau compared to when he initially was introduced because of the various nerfs that have come through. Uh, he does actually have the ACOG, the magnified scope now on that DMR, and it was already bloody good with the 1.5. Now it's even better. Uh, but yeah, the way that the uh, the interaction with the the insulation, I forget the technical term that they use, but you know, Tuberau, it used to be that as soon as the ice dissipates, the electrification comes back. And now they've made it so there's a few seconds where the electrification will not come back. And so any hard breach can continue to fuse and detonate. And that does make Tibrao a little bit less powerful, but still in conjunction with the Kaid and the Goyo and the Smoke, all of these time sync operators, yeah, I would not be surprised if Galita do steal away a lot of that time from Fury. We have got Dark on the Deimos as well on the side of the attack from Fury, and it makes me a little worried for any stray roamers out on the ground floor of the map, but it seems like all five of the defenders are falling back towards the site for Galita. I9 now making some vertical onto the top of the freezer stairs, washing out any players left inside of Z hallway, and well, easy as he does it, that's the roam clear done for Fury and all of Galita back on the bomb site. Mark is loitering here on the rear stairs, looking to hopefully take down any drones that come through, or anyone that overpicks, but I wouldn't be surprised if Fury are very cautious here, very careful. Oh, here comes Sapper. He's in Sapper spot, but he's being met with a shield. He does a huge amount of damage onto Lycolas. Oh, but I9 comes in to support. Lycolas somehow manages to stay alive, even on one HP, and take down Mr. Punch for his troubles. That was a massive shot from Sapper there, but Lycolas still managed to survive and deal damage. Man advantage now for Fury, even though Lycolas has been taken down pretty low, all he needs to do is spearhead this push here, and there's an opportunity now for Fury to try and play the trade game as they go in for the execute. A minute and 20 left to go, so they've still got plenty of time to have a think about what they want to do next as well. It does look like they're having a look at maybe getting this hatch open as well, although I don't know if they have the secondary utility to do it. Okay, they do on the Deimos, which is good. Tracking onto Tubrow as well, so just double checking where the freeze charges have come in through the other side, and that will in fact be not really tricked, but denied for a little bit longer. Yeah, I don't think that the, uh, I think the installation that I was talking about before will allow this hard breach charge to detonate once the freeze effect does go away. It should be just about now, I believe. Like Colas, as I said before, very low HP, and that means that a single bullet, a single whiff of gas, or a tiny bit of Goyo's fire will take him down instantly, which does make him very much a vulnerable target. 30 seconds left on the clock, and Mark is reinforcing off Elbow and detonating a Vulcan canister. Uh, this is a really awkward position now for Fury. Time ticking away, and Galita are using every PC util they've got. Out goes the Zoto canister to slow down the position, but DCH has been taken out. Mark finally steps up for two massive kills, bringing numbers advantage back into Galita's favor, and Mark finds the final one as well. A beautiful close to the round despite the numbers deficit. Galita have no fear. Yeah, really calm and composed there in the last couple seconds of the round. They realized that Fury went for the switch to go for a back push, realizing they couldn't get the freezer hatch open. And then by then that reinforcement had already gone down on the elbow rotation. Really shut them out there. At that point they had to funnel in through one entry point that they had going into the bomb site and they played the crossfires really well. Well played from Galita, but it is the basement bomb site, and we do expect the defense to be winning those ones out. I think Jake and Gus will be Attack the first ones to say enemy. that this is the bomb site oh. that the defense gets properly tested. I think that's their favorite thing to say on a cast. Uh, uh, dorms is really where Oregon gets determined. Can you win your <laughs> dorms defense? Can you win your dorms attack? Yeah, yeah. This tends to be where the brawl comes out, which is fun. I've seen a lot of those uh, those one v ones going around as well. You know that massive trend. You know Jinxie oh, yeah. and all the streamers yeah. loving those one v ones. Um, it's always on this bomb site as well. Yeah, I mean, we you actually played... won your 1v1, right? I was going to say, we've played 1v1s on this bomb site, and it took me many Ten rounds, but I won. <laughs> Not against you, you but I won. Well, I lost mine, so maybe I think by <laughs> default that means you are the better player. Oh, uh, anyway, it doesn't really matter. We're watching these 10 players play this bomb site instead this time around. It doesn't look like they are playing um, set aggressive rotation hole going into closet with the shotgun as well. So for Fury, they've got one. Uh, point of contact there early on to contest. Nevertheless, it does seem like they are posturing up for this double window push instead. 
Yeah. Quite like the operator lineup. We're seeing out of Fury as well. A lot of creativity. Gridlock doesn't see a lot of play. Amaru, obviously a pocket pick operator. Not to mention like Holus here on the Deimos, which we've now seen two rounds in a row. Fury are getting really creative with their operator lineups. We saw it, of course, in the first round with Blitz as well. What are they cooking? They're rotating almost all of their players over to this big window. I don't mind this yet for Fury. I don't think they quite telegraphed what push they're going for. It seems like uh, they are looking to at least get some control over on the small tower side of the map. Nomad as well is going to help zone out some of those roamers from going for the retake when they eventually go in for the execute in through the double window. Line up for Dark on the gridlock does make me think that they are going to commit to this take at some point. Looks like a bit of a tussle about to go down in Z as uh, DCH on the other side of that hatch could do some damage to the players in dining. You know what I reckon it is? I reckon is the strat it? here is to try and kill this player in kids' dorms. Isolate them using the Deimos. Get those wall hacks, get those pings, and oh, then get a true. player down play below with the buck yes. to play the vert and flush them into the player on the double window. But an early pick here from Mr. Punch. Dark gets punished by overextending here. His gridlocks track stingers don't prevent that from working out. Now DCH is in a world of hurt, low HP, but still survives. Finally, the kill goes down, and surely the intention is for the Amara to go up the hatch, but that ain't gonna happen, because Mr. Punch is continuing to be a demon downstairs. He's found three. Sapper as well to support, and this Deimos has gone down, perfectly baited by Mr. Punch. BG man in a 1v4. Look, it was a lovely idea from Fury, but execution was far from there. And that's primarily due to Galita, their proactivity. Oh, what a shot! Mr. Punch finally put to rest, but a 1v3 is a nigh unwinnable task here for BG man. I'd have to agree with your comment as well. It's a good idea, but I think they jumped the gun on their idea, right? When you want to push with the Deimos and go with your team and try and isolate a loose Roma, you, you can't really do that when the Romas aren't exactly loose, right? We have two players in the ground floor playing off each other, playing crossfires, when they're just simply walking in and not being cautious about the two remaining Romas on their floor while they're trying to play this fancy vertical against GCH on the other side. It, it is overthinking it a little bit, and I think ultimately jumping the gun on what is a novel idea, but not that well executed. Yeah. I, I just, I have a soft spot for cool ideas like that, man. Do you, even if Me too. they don't work yeah. out, I just, yeah, I love to yeah, see I it. Like it. So too. I'm, and you know, I love to talk about Operator Cosmetics. And so I'm going to bring up the Fury background card. Looks awesome. That's also the brand new Fnatic one in the top left, which oh, is pretty cool. cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The new tier one skins came out today. Very is cool. The, is the Fnatic the background also the, the anime? Off. Metal. They are all anime metal. Oh, I see. Like, no. Yeah. All right. The only, yeah. I think the only one that's not anime meta is the sound or the VRX one, and that's the cat meta, which is like, they're just like, they're playing 2025 meta no, right now. No, they're they're thought, ahead of the game. I thought VRX did both. I thought they did the cat girl meta, like the anime cat oh. girl. I thought that's like playing both at that's, the same time, you know? That anyway. is 400 IQ. That is 400 IQ. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I feel like Elevate has put like a legacy on the anime meta that will never be broken now, but you know what? <laughs> <laughs> that is okay. I can get behind that. That's cool. They're rocking the orange together as a team. Yeah, I do like that. It is funny though because Galita's logo is blue, but they're on the orange team right now, and Fury's logo is orange, but they're on the blue. It's, that's really triggering something deep inside of me. <laughs> not right it's just wrong <laughs> so it goes fury on another attack attempt galita winning two out in a row now and it is going to force them to go and try a tertiary bomb site this time around meeting and jin seems to be the one that they've gone for as uh, dining's gone a bit out of fashion these days dch looking for a spawn peak out of t3 but isn't able to find anyone it's always hard to flush people out of this t3 position but you do have to be pretty ambitious on your defense when you force some of these tertiary sites like meeting we're seeing now. And Fury, to their credit, have been really prompt. So I don't think they've wasted much time in these rounds. They've found the opening pick in the first round. And of course, things didn't work out so well for them with Mr. Punch's roam in the second. But I want to credit, they, they seem to always have a clear idea of their intention, even if sometimes they get a little bit caught off guard in the execution. Now here comes Critcher. He's on for an entry. Oh, quick round of the corner and a beautiful shot there onto IDFC. Looking for a second one now. Critcher is such a dangerous player and Mark knows it. And so he will fall back, but not without at least trying to take something back. Critcher's found another with the SMG 12. He is on a tear. 
and Fury have two players in the advantage. Sapper looking for something in return, but he is eventually forced on back again. Mark goes down, so Fury are farming. Galita need to start making some plays now. Three players in deficit. That was really good stuff there from Crit on the entry. Really caught Galita off guard in the top floor, finding the entries on the back of the Dokapi call as well. It is forcing now the remaining two players of Galita to try and make a play with the numbers deficits. The only way they can possibly come back into this round. DCH going for a retake back Reload. up the top of the stairs. Never mind, he pulls off that as well. Yeah, Galita very much in a bit of a pickle now. Five versus two is a tough one to come back from. DCH was spotted as well on the hack camera. Sapper, his position revealed by the Logic Bomb. I don't think anyone is in position, but here we go. DCH finds one. The trade, though, makes this nigh impossible for poor Sapper. Nice impact, but I don't think Lycolis is going to mind too much. These crossfires are pretty challenging now to try and deal with. And Sapper gets a little bit stuck. Oh, nice shot in the BG man. Vertical angle, he is hyper aware of. Farm not just stats. a flashes court. Yeah, we'll farm the stats. Yeah, <laughs> all right. See what he can do. There's a player above. I mean, like, there's just no way that he wins this. Surely, like, nah, three players all separated. It's a valiant effort, though. You've got to give him some credit. He's going to try. He's going to dance around. But Fury aren't silly. They won't overcommit. I personally just want Critchet to confirm the 3K, but it looks like Sapper's not even going to try and hit that diffuser. He will just sail on out. And now it is physically impossible to win the round for Sapper. So at least try and farm some KD. Eh, never mind. Crit J's got it. He gets the 3k after all. And finally, Fury are on the scoreboard. Really solid round there for Fury. I think like you pointed out early, everything that Fury does is with conviction and with intention. Like, yes, it might not have worked for the previous two rounds, but this time around, they went in for it. They backed themselves. Crit J lands some great shots on the entry, who, by the way, had a really great performance at the last six Invitational and it wins them out of the round in the end. Very much in the early game, I felt like the round was done and dusted. Yeah. Kind of in the story for two rounds in a row, right? Because Fury essentially lost the round quite early on that dawn need to attack. Locate and Despite having that nice idea. Nice Speaking of operators, like, we're still seeing more nice ideas. Like, just teased out now, Deimos, Monty. Also, shout out to the Galita team house. This is the same one that they used to play in when they were with Elevate, so I assume it's owned by some it's other company the and they're like renting it out. But uh, yeah, very cool. The terrifying clown. Yeah, return. I was say, scary on. clown house. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first oh. time that I saw that, I actually like jumped away. in the background. I was like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Nostalgia one. Uh, I don't know how you could play, like, if your monitor goes black and you just see the reflection of the clown behind you in the mirror, I would absolutely shit myself. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Here we go. Galita. So, having lost their tertiary bomb site, are now able to go back down to the basement. Has been unlocked for them once again. Last time around, I feel like it was pretty decisive for Fury, not able to land the execute that they needed to, even with the numbers advantage as they went into it. So, I'm not expecting too much difference, to be honest, from Galita. Yes, they are looking for a bit of a roam now. And yes, the Deimos is on board, so if they find an opportunity to capitalize on one of these stray roamers, that could lead into a pretty successful execute, but it looks like they're falling off pretty quick. Richard, I'd be worried about if I'm a roamer. Amazing how some people can be so proficient with high recoil guns like that SMG-12. Now, who's Dark just scanned? I, I thought I saw for a second he scanned someone, but... Can't quite see now. There is quite a bit of a roam going on here. Of course, we've gone back down to the basement. And so it's a very extended roam from Galita, no longer just relying on Sapper on the freezer stairs at Sapper spot. And as a result, Fury have to clear. But when you've got Deimos and Dokabi uh, and the Monty to boot, roam clearing is actually not always as challenging. But hang on a sec. IDFC's found the opening kill and... Fury are not looking so hot on this roam clear after all. Yeah, they're really holding on to the roam, uh, are they, Galita? They're really uh, showing a lot of tenacity here in the ground floor as the roam clear comes through. Critche has been pretty brave on the top floor in the entry so far, but Dark going down does scare them away a little bit. Some of the flashbangs to go through. Oh, and the Monty to follow, taken down by the Oryx, but not out. Trades come through as well from Critche himself. IFC will go down. There's still a player on the back stairs, just taking a bit of damage, but Mark is able to get away with his life. 
you Attack go. Kill finally confirmed. Diffuser. That does mean we're at even numbers as well. Crit Shake and Hat Cameras. Open up this hatch Attackers as well. Wow, such a different interpretation of this defense, isn't that, Mandy? Like, Jolita went from having full, like, sight presence and, you know, Tuburau and Kai to going for such an ambitious roam. It's hard to say at this point who's actually won that roam game. It is kind of tough to say. I would agree with you. I feel like losing the Monty going into the Execute is a pretty big boon, I think, for the attack at the moment. I, I felt like Lycolis was quite impactful on it in the previous attack attempt that they did here. Uh, not just that, but in general, even though you have to make this translation work into the basement, it can be quite tough with only three people to do so. Mark's well in a, in a very good position to try and contest this hatch drop once it comes through. The flashbangs will initiate the Execute, but where's the entry to follow? Need to have an ambitious entry, but Mark is ready to receive. I-9 goes down, but who else but Crit J to get a response for Fury. Sapper's in a solid spot, but if he is checked, he will be susceptible to Pika's advantage. And I can hear Crit J ready for it, Mr. Punch. Finds one, Crit J trying to find something, but there's nothing for it. Galita again hold firm on the basement. Yeah, composed defense once again from Galita. I really liked the idea of going for the extended roam. I was a bit nervous, to be honest, to see that extended roam going up against the Deimos and the Dokubi combo, but I think they played that really well. Playing close with each other, even though Deimos is activated and someone is getting pinged, if you're not a stray roamer, if you're not super isolated, I think playing off the back with your team and allowing the trades to ensue through the rounds uh, was a good way for Galita to have dealt with that. And then came down to the execute played it composed, waited for the time to tick away, Fury failing to land another execute in the basement, but what can we expect? It is still the best. Switching for electronics. Yeah, very true. Can't celebrate too much when you win a basement defense. That said, 3-1 is not bad. There is a solid chance Fury could tie the scoreline from here on out, but I don't know, I think Galita has got to be pretty happy with where they're at at the moment, uh, especially considering, and like we had talked about in the pre-show, Fury have bested Galita in every single time they played each other last year. Uh, well, I should specifically say Fury bested no cap R6, which is the Galita roster, the roster currently playing for Galita with these five players more or less. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, any round, any advantage that Galita can get, that's pretty impressive. Uh, especially with how tight the league is promised to be with Fury, Bleed, Elevate, uh, Galita, uh, potentially some of the other teams as well, now being real top contenders. All right, here we go. Bit of a one-on-one -on -one going on down in the basement. It does seem like Critchet's got some idea that Mr. Punch is on the other side. Now, it's making me thinking, maybe Crit J is trying to bait Mr. Punch out here, right? Use some of the activations, see if he goes for a run out. But Mr. Punch, being a bit more cautious about that, is going to go for the spray down through the wall into E, but not able to connect the shots. Crit J as well, thinking the better of it, not taking that one versus one, and is going to reconsolidate with his team instead. A bomb has been located. Here we go. So, who's been tracked? Mr. Punch seems to have been tracked by the Deimos at the moment. I believe we're seeing an 100% pick rate from Fury on Deimos, Mandy, isn't that? That's quite something. Not a lot of teams have picked it up, and usually it is for like a, a pocket strat, if you will. But no, Fury are indeed going for this exact same attack again, the vertical push with the Deimos, and I-9 is just looking for this player in dorms. Oh, DCH is dead to rights. Crit J takes him down. Great usage of the SMG-12, great usage of the Logic Bomb, in fact get that audio call and of course with uh, DCH going down as well and well now Mr. Punch it is devastating for Galita Fury in a five versus two they just need to regroup and form up and execute Jumping in now, the last player left is Sapper in the one versus three and BG man can take him down fairly easily Fury managing to land yet another attack going up against Galita in very clean fashion this time around their idea is somewhat working eventually with the info with vertical it flushed the players out into the remaining uh, cutoff players on the windows it was really well executed there that time around from fury not only that but i think keeping better taps on the roamers this time around both the roamers on the ground floor uh, were taken down pretty early on in the round which compounded into a successful execute yeah three two is not bad hey attackers need to that's pretty good that's, yeah. that's, yeah. gotta say fury 
Yeah, good roam clear. Uh, really, I just want to keep crediting Crit Chain. Like, I know he's on seven kills. He's easy to just put on a pedestal. Uh, but man really knows how to be self-sufficient and help his team at the same time. Like, you just chuck on that logic bomb and then walk around and, and use the sound. Key. So he got a really free kill last time. And uh, yeah, it goes to show that that really cool idea of an attack, it does end up working as long as you don't get flanked and, and dominated by those roamers. I mean, that was awesome. He literally rounded the corner to a guy on his phone and took him down. <laughs> That's what she saw him from across the room. That was that cool. That is a Dokubi's dream that right there. That was cool. Yeah, that was remaining. awesome from Critchai. I mean, he, he's had a pretty stellar performance since the beginning of this year going through the SI, and I don't see that stopping anytime soon, especially with this uh, opening game going into stage one of 2024. So, Mandy, mm -hmm. I, I've done some research, um, and I, I have a findings. proposition. All right, so I had a feel. I remember from casting Galita last year that we actually weren't saying Galita. And now I've looked it up, and the word actually, it, it's like a Spanish town or it something like, like that. It sounds like you've been doing this entire time. I feel like I've been, been casting as well. <laughs> Real, oh, I've, been, I've been casting <laughs> as well. Like, all this found a kill. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I'm yeah, still yeah, casting. Yeah, yeah. But I'm pretty sure it's Jalita, like Jalita. genre. So the, the je sound is like genre, so je leader. Not ah. je leader, je leader. Ah, I whether, see. whether that's easier or harder, I don't know. Have fun with that. I have not done any research myself, so I can only confirm with your findings. I'm oh, a big fan of linguistics. Yep. I had to look, at, look up the international <laughs> phonetic alphabet, no joke. <laughs> That's good work from you. Excellent work from you. So poor Sapper down here has been tracked by the Davos on the pulse and he's thought the better of it and is going to fall to a safe position down on the ground floor. Meanwhile though, these remaining two or two or three players within the bomb site are about to feel a little bit of pain as the execute is about to roll on through in the next few seconds, I would believe. As they are trying to entrench the bomb site. Critch J trying to go for his one to one against Mark. Doesn't uh, win that one out. Yeah, I mean, it's a solid pick there for Mark, but he is essentially trapped now in Attic. He's just decided to go prone. He's low HP. All right, like Olus. Turn it up. Big kill. And he uses that Vendetta perfectly. Mark's actually found a second and dropped back to safety onto the site in meeting. BG Man. Oh, he had the read for a moment there. IDFC gets lucky on the timing. He's not exposed to that bottom white stairs window. Meanwhile, Mark has actually decided to go back up the stairs and is now flanking again. IDSC caught in a, a real pickle. And here comes Lycolas once again. Who gets taken down by IDFC? The death mark does not work in his favor. 2v3 for Fury and Jalita have a really solid chance now to win the half outright. Big round for Mark as well, all the way over in pit through Attic, finding his two kills and getting away with his life has put Jalita, Jalita, that's what we're saying now, in the man advantage. <laughs> Fury now trying to find an in onto this bomb site through the vertical, but all the players have vacated to the rooms adjacent. Uh, to creep down the white stairs, try and look for a pick, and try and find their way in. Oh no, right around the corner. Check your corners, mate! <gasps> Zappa! That is damn stylish if I've ever seen it. Dark and trade. But a 1v2 is not going to be easy. Now Mark's low HP, but Dark is even lower on time. He has the diffuser in hand, but there's no chance he's going to be able to stick this. He may as well just get off it because Mark is about to punch him in the face. Doesn't matter because he gets off anyway. Saves the KD, but he doesn't save the half. Jalita, take it 4-2. Exciting stuff between these two teams. We want to see Jolita ahead because this could be their revenge arc beginning. That being said, they are about to switch over onto the attack. And as we found through the past few games this week, attacking is rather difficult at the moment in Rainbow Six, especially on a map like Oregon. Yeah, you never really know if uh, it's going to end up being uh, quite a defensive favoured game. What was exciting in Oost this week, I felt, Mandy, that yeah, we did have some games that were defender sided, but we okay, also had some that were really strong on the spot. attack. We were lucky we got to see a couple of chalets. I think it was the Bliss versus uh, Antic game. There were some really solid attacks, mm. if I remember correctly. Yeah, obviously different story on Oregon. Uh, there's a lot that you can try, uh, as we've seen from Fury, and you know, I'd say a lot of innovation. Fury aren't just going for bog-standard old-school attacks. We're not seeing just 
pull rushes or slow map controls into a three, four way pinch like we used to see last year. <laughs> uh, we're actually seeing some exciting stuff with the Dagger, the Amara, located and the bomb. Park vertical style. Ten seconds remaining. Uh, but yeah, obviously, two rounds. It's serviceable, not ideal. And Jolita, uh, pretty well set, assuming they can start their momentum off well here in the second half. I think that's what happens when, when you've got some of the operators like Dokubi, like Deimos being left in the Dokubi especially, which Mr. Punch is also going to bring uh, on his side of the attack as well. I feel like very much expedites the roam clear. And on a map like Oregon, where you kind of have a lot of things that you need to do right to make an execute work, you at least want to power through some of that early to mid game quickly. And Dokubi certainly helps to expedite that process. Very much so. Both teams are running two roam clearing operators all the time. For Fury, it was always the Deimos and the Doke, and now for Jolita, it's the Doke and the Lion. So it sounds so fancy when you say I know. I'm also. I'm not saying Jolita. I'm really trying to make sure it's a Jolita. I feel like I feel like a young or something, which is funny because it's a Spanish <laughs> word, but whatever. All right. Mark is able to find one at yeah. least. And I guess who? It's say. Kuche. He's the one yes. you want to kill. I was going to say, and on the roam clear as well, we just spent the entire early game prefacing that their roam, roam clear game, oh my goodness, should be pretty good with the operator lineup that they've got going. They've run two of them, and they actually capitalize on the back of that one's Critchet as well. Yep, he's the guy you want to take down, no doubt about it. Fury 4v5 is still achievable on this basement bomb site, but up to Jolita to make sure that they do their due diligence, uh, pick a solid execute, and use this numbers advantage to their advantage, because otherwise things could go south real quick. There's a lot of utility clear, bulletproof cameras, Vulcan canisters, uh, and mirror windows as well. Fortunately, plenty of util on the attacking side to achieve that. I just have to get it done. Drone activated. Does look like Jolita posturing up now for a backside take onto the bomb site. Mr. Punch uh, getting ready to make his way on through Bunker at the same time. We've got a hatch drop, we've got plates coming down uh, the rear stairs as well. Uh, that being said, it does actually look like a little bit of a split execute. It seems like a 3-2 split going into this bomb site, and I think with the numbers of bandage that they've got, they can probably afford the plays to be able to do so. There goes ECH to claim the first one. Oh. There is a good trade though from Lycolis. Now Dark's been taken very low. The Vulcan canister will keep him alive for a bit longer and prevent the push from the attacking side. Meanwhile, Fury put their attention on this rear push that Jolita are attempting to make work. I-9 spots a player for a brief moment, but Mark is actually looking to force down this plant. A flash might be able to secure it, but in amidst the chaos, Fury, all three players win their ones. And Jolita fall apart at the dying moments. Almost a plant, but not to be. Oh my god, you blink it and you miss it in that execute, don't you? Any second through that execute, the plant is going down, the flash came through, and then boom, the round is over for Fury. They're able to claim the, the gunfights that they needed, come uh, accomplish the shove in the execute there, even though Jolita had the numbers advantage going down into the basement, uh, ultimately not actually being able to play off the back of that and actually play into the trade game once they went down for it. Playing the objective instead, Arguably, Attackers it might not be a mistake, just a situational moment, but really, uh, ultimately, Fury landed some pretty sharp shots. Yeah. I'm pretty surprised that there was uh, the ability there for the plant to be denied by I-9, because we saw I-9 was in Freezer, right? Yeah. And Mark was the one planting, and he was the one who killed Mark. So, I don't know, you think usually the, the place that you plant to try and be safe from Electric Freezer is immediately on. in the side door and slightly to the right, and you are more exposed to like, the behind-the-bomb angles, but you're safer from Freezer. So, I don't know whether the plant position was perhaps slightly different to what I had anticipated, or whether I-9 really had to swing that. But regardless, all three players from Fury sprung into action at the same time. It worked out, and uh, yeah, Jolita still have their advantage, but it's slipping away quickly, as it always can on Oregon attack. Well, you know what we say. If you want to win Oregon, you got to be winning your basement. So now we're up in Kid Storms of Fury. Hopefully, a little more tested this time around on their defense. Jolita making their way in through the ground floor so far. Once again, running the same double roam clear lineup with Dokubi and the Lion. Try and flush out uh, any any loose roamers here on the ground floor. I think there is only one for Fury if they want to make this effort work. i 9 is doing his best Mr. Punch impression. So a 3k from Mr. Punch playing Solus on this bombsite roaming down below prior. 
drones do continue to come through. And IDFC on the buck, looking to imitate something we saw from Fury on their own attack. It's not the exact same, no Deimos, for example. He's around the ACOG on the buck, so it's going to be tough in these close scenarios. But he always has a skeleton here to bring out. Crit J comes to support. Two roamers now, but the pressure continues to mount from Jolita as well. Mr. Punch moving in through the hallway, he's just got timed again. What is the plate? How is Jolita actually going to push it and take this ground? Never touch go out. It does make me think that maybe they don't actually want to creep through the entire ground floor. Maybe they're just trying to pull reaction here from the Romers down to the ground floor. Meanwhile, the pressure's going out on the bomb site. At some point, surely these Romers have got to make the move, and I feel like that's the theory going on behind it. Even if they try and come up through the lobby stairs, there's the Doki be there of wow. Sapper to cut that off as well. And he's actually made his way on all the way in through lobby and just missed the player coming around from Z. Oh, but BG Man does find his kill as a very late rotation from Jolita. Leads them directly into Fury's waiting arms, but I think BG Man might have been a little bit baited. Jolita are not sure what they're going for. They're now rotating over to Master. Still some players at Big Window as the E1D goes out. DCH looks to make his way forward, but Critchay's found his kill and is not yet traded. Running around a muck in classroom. It's not looking great for Jolita. Fury have got two players in advantage. The fire from the Tachanka is locking them out of taking advantage of the space that they've now gained. I don't know what Jolita are meant to do here. I don't think they can do much here, Dev. I think this should surely be a Fury round as Mark is trying to make a last-ditch effort to make this work for Jolita. But with 20 seconds left to go, the crossfire is very much established now on the side of the defense. This should be a round for Fury. Oh, BG Man's got a solid position as well. The wall behind him still solid. He wins his one. Is there a trade? There is. And Mr. Punch goes in. It's him against three. And it's not going to be easy with such a small magazine, especially not when I9's coming for the biggest flank we've seen all day. And a great shot secures Fury another round. And with that, they've tied the scoreline. Solid round there for Fury, especially on the roam game, not getting overzealous on their rotations down on the ground floor. I felt uh, was very much the right decision to make against what Jolita were trying to do. It felt like they were sitting there on the ground floor, waiting for a long time, trying to pull a reaction from those two roamers down on the ground floor. Uh, but then uh, the patience of Fury very much paid dividends towards Attackers the end. They're finding the right timing on these Jolita players as they tried to switch their focus in towards the bomb site. They found the right timings on the flanks, and then from there on, they just had the numbers advantage they needed from the late round. Sorry, I was kind of flashbanged by audio there, but <laughs> really loud replay. I was like, I'm just going to let this speak for himself. Um, I actually really enjoyed the Tachanka last round, Mandy. <laughs> I'm, a, yeah, I'm a sucker for funny ops, and Fury have really been delivering. Uh, yeah, obviously, it's, there's a lot of nuance in it, so it's hard to exactly like describe during the round the impact, but it just looked like the Tachanka was just firing up the whole site as soon as Fury were thinking, yeah, maybe Jolita's going to look for some kind of execute here. Um, and, yeah, I really like that. Uh, it, it really did send Jolita packing. They were very confused making late rotations. Right, so here we go for Jolita. Looking for a way to bring this advantage back for them. Previously holding 4-2 up and now not having one around for their attack just yet. This is the tertiary bomb site now though, so if there's any opportunity to win out and attack, it would surely be this one. Very true, and this is where Fury won their first attack in the first half. On that tertiary site. It's about that tertiary site. It starts with a solid roam clear, that's how it started for Fury. Though could be once again in play. I do. I'm very curious to see what this Brava is going to be able to achieve because there is actually a solid amount of utility that can be packed up. I'm thinking maybe the Malusi Banshees are. Okay, very early we have an exchange, a trade back and forth. The Malusi is able to get that trade back. And Critchay, yeah, big play to lose, I guess, but he's been quiet for a few rounds now and now he can just flip cameras. Great cam in sight though from Sapper on the attack. Perhaps an opportunity to put that pressure onto this side player. Oh, but once again, they can't jump the gun. Here's I-9 down in the basement looking for a flank and is able to claim one onto Sapper, completely unknowing where he is. But here's Nicholas 
inside of meeting all on his own. He has a feeling that there might be a player inside of meeting, and in fact, there oh. is. DCH and Mr. Punch have somehow cracked their way into the bomb side. Yeah, but I9's nine got the first. It's actually not going to be easy. Here we go. Patience is a virtue for Mr. Punch, who finishes off like Colas, and that does flip the switch. The man advantage now in the attack's favor. Jolita have once again pivoted, but look at this! Oh, I9! Black denied, but he is traded back. As he hits his 10th kill, he puts it over to BG Man, hands him the baton and says, you've got a 1v2 now. Mark forcing that diffuser down, Mr. Activated Punch. Diffuser. To support, and now it is a, a proper 1v2 retake for BG Man. A fantastic gun in the MP5 with the ACOG to support. But against two players playing a solid cross, this is not going to be easy. And a very off angle is currently being held. He's not going to check it. He gets wall bang for a spell. And I don't see this working. The drone spots his position. He's got some form of audio call, but this is once again a crossfire that he will not be able to deal. <gasps> Mark goes down, 1v1, BG man, shut down by Mr. Punch. Jolito get their first attack and the lead once again in their favor. Oh my God, that was a bit close there for BG man. Really nice headshot in what seems like a very tough situation there on the retake and almost landing the final one as well. But the super surety is too good for Jolita and the one attack that we were hoping they would be able to get onto the tertiary site, they do in fact claim. Yeah, a very tense end round. That was back and forth, Manny. So many, I mean, it, it defined by the very start of the round where we just saw a yep. direct trade, you know, one play, kill, play killed for Jolita and then immediately Fury gets one back. Uh, ben, Jolita had a nice attempt at a play on site and then yeah. I-9's there and then that ends up, you know, falling on its head and somehow Jolita gets side control. A real roller coaster of a round as this game has just continued to be neck and neck uh, as that round was as well. But it's not going to be easy for Jolita to actually convert that into match point now because the basement is, of course, available for Fury. Yeah, this is going to be a piece of one to attack. I, I just want to compound off the back Attackers of that last point that you were talking about, Dev, bar. as well. I, that round very much felt like my characteristic of what we've seen between these two teams so far. What I enjoy about this region yeah, so much, and especially insertion. between these two teams, is that it feels like they're just so unafraid to throw Five their bodies at problems, but in like a calculated way, right? When, when they know that they need to be there and they need to be in that fight, they won't be afraid to go and take it and actually jump their way on into the fight and absolutely run for it. And, and it makes for this, this really exciting dynamic between these teams. Yeah, well, when you've got a classic uh, matchup like we have here, Fury versus Shalita, once upon a time we would have called it Fury versus Elevate back in Elevate's prime. Uh, yeah, you expect a, a solid match, and it's a testament as well to how far Jolita have come from last year, where they got decimated every time they played Fury in two BO3s where they didn't even win a map pick. And now here we are, where they are leading by one round, but perhaps not for long. They will have to back it up with a very solid basement defense, which is now starting with the roam clear. And they're going up against a full anchor setup. Four players on drones as well, so it does make me think that they've at least got an inkling that the map is free real estate now. The vehicle surely confirmed that as well from uh, IDFC. Five players on the bomb site now for Fury to a bit of a lull in the attack for Jolito as they just set themselves up for the mid round. Attackers recovered the defuse user. This round, I say Needle meme set. aside. Like, what is what are the key <laughs> points? <laughs> because it's not easy to crack into this bomb site with the setup like this. That's a good question, uh, especially with the line they've got as well. Well, I mean, okay. So, as it stands, once they hit into the bomb site, well, first of all, they've got to get this hatch open. There's two barrel on the other side. That's what BG Man's working on at the moment in tandem with Sapphire and DCH to try and play this mini game, get the hatch open. Then after that, I think it's about trying really hard to consolidate the utility in the right place at the right time. I feel like if the right flashbangs land, there's no warden on the other side of this. If the entry is pretty successful after that, there's an opportunity I here, I think, for Jolita to land this attack. But nevertheless, it's still pretty difficult. The power positions in itself are inherently quite strong on this basement bomb site. And even then, getting this hatch open has already proved quite challenging for Jolita. The time is ticking away. The last set, well, one set of Habana charges has just been electrified as well. So if they want to sink even more time into getting this open, maybe it's not the right call to make here. They, it looks like they're going to pivot and go for a front attack instead. 
I think there's no choice at this point, right? Like one of the key win conditions in that hatch, as you said, has been taken out. And here we go, Fury firing up. Sapper and Mr. Punch both go down and it just goes from bad to worse. Is it going to be flawless? It seems so. Yeah, that is Basement of Oregon for you. Absolutely untouchable. Fury, textbook stuff, patience to a virtue, playing the trick game on the hatch and then holding out in the dire moments. We are back up 5-5. Five, five. We're hitting break point. Next player to lose a round will forfeit their chance of winning all three points out of this play day and find match point for their opposition. Yeah, I mean, I think you called that one right from the beginning, Zerf. We went down to the basement and you were like, well, Fury round. And it happens pretty handily <laughs> when it came down to the execute as well. Okay, I think, you know, even if you've got the right set of utility going down into the basement, it's still pretty hard to see that utility into the positions that the defenders are in, just because they're just such, like, tight spaces that are so well protected. Uh, especially that position like right by the chassis that the Shotgun SMG-11 was in in the last couple of seconds. There wasn't a lot of time left for them to actually be able to dislodge the enemies by the time they went for the execute. And it's always going to be really hard uh, when you go down into the basement. That's why we're going to instead turn our attention back to the destructible bomb site to see whether Jolita can close it out. Yeah, I don't know if, yeah, what you're feeling there. Insertion. Coming into this game, my head said one thing and my heart said another, Five right? Seconds. Like, I yeah. love Fury, I love Shalita, I love both these teams, all these players, like, respect your OGs, yada yada. Uh, my head said Fury because, like, they've won every single time for the last mm -hmm. year, they, these mm -hmm. two teams Sense have played. But my heart said, I just want to see Sapa and the boys do well again. I want to see, I want to see the return of that 2021, 2022 form where these guys were, you know, at six invitationals and taking big names on the global stage. And to do that, you have to start by coming over your, your bogey men in your own region. And that's what Fury is for Jolita. Yeah, I, th I think despite the nostalgia attached to this roster, it is still a very tough matchup against Fury. You're, you're completely right. By all means, Fury should be winning this one out because historically they have done so six times in a row is what you pointed out against Jolita. But you just have to hold on to that poke right. We're pastors. We're allowed to oh. do that. There goes Crit J onto Mr. Punch. Mr. Punch had absolutely no idea what he was rappelling down into. Uh, IDFC could be in a bit of danger as well inside of Armory in a moment. There's a player on the other side of that trophy door, and not only that, but IDFC, uh, sorry, Crit J down below, does have a C4 in hand, so if he can sneak his way back in, back into lobby, back into garage, he, he can land something from below. Come on. Oh. Such a litter of a bit lost now after losing that opening pick. Oh, DCA just got to find this kill. Surely that nade will push out Great BG nade. Man into his position. Yeah, funnily enough, the Wamai's disc caught the nade and, and forced BG Man to move regardless. So that's actually a really solid start here for Julian. They might have lost the initial pick, but uh, I don't think they can be too upset with this. Bomb located right, by so attackers. Crit A has decided to retreat all the way down into the basement. That outline scared me in case he was going to go for that C4 onto lobby, but instead he thinks the better of it and decides to... Uh, Keep his life for the upcoming execute, the late rounds now for Jolita. Numbers evened out now with that pick going out onto close it, but even from Attackers here on out, they still need to consolidate and figure out what they're going to do next. Great pick as well from Sapper, doubling down on that initial entry, and a hole is certainly being made in the defense. Oh, but Dark does get the kill back onto Sapper again, so it's even. Their These ACOGs on the defense, so good for contesting the long lines of sight. IDFC, oh, almost lands the shot as well. Lycolis shoving out the last of his area denial as the time ticks down. Who finds match point first? That's the question on our lips. Jolita looking for an entrance and two players have crossed. One's planting right now. How is this going to work out? IDFC down on the ground. Critchie round in the corner. It's all up to Mark in a 1v2 as he finds the first of three required. Breaking 10, 10 kills and needing a hell of a lot more than that, but so patient now. Our Fury, there's information on Dark's position. The pre-fire gets what he needs, but Mark will not have time to confirm the plan. Fury finding match points, and Jolita missing their chance by the skin of their teeth. 
such a composed defense at the end there for Fury, even though they lost out uh, on the player inside a closet. They just sat back, waited for Julita to come on in, and then very much uh, relied upon a lot of that areas and all that zoning that came out from the Tachanka. You pointed it out earlier, and you said that you really, really liked it, and now I'm on that bandwagon as well. That was yeah. really good in the late game there from Black Hollis to completely deny the entry coming in through Trophy, that breach, Unentryable as well. They had to funnel in from pit, go for a really strange plant position, but that plant position couldn't be covered yeah, because of the fire that was going down inside of that trophy door, right? So, uh, Crit J to go for the swing, deny the plant, and what was a really great end round for Fury. Base device. New camera feed up and running. But are they going to convert it, or are we going to get overtime, man? That's, uh, that's what I'm wondering. I want to know. I kind of want to know as well, because this is a tertiary bomb site. Last time we saw Jolita attack this yeah. one, it was right, you know? Yeah, it's funny, apart. really, because uh, Jolita actually were able to defend their tertiary bomb site in the final round of the first yeah, half, but uh, they lost the dorms. So, yeah, well, it goes around, comes around. doesn't matter if Fury win one dorms, Jolita can go and, and win their tertiary bomb site, but Fury now have a chance to win the game outright, take the full three points home, rocket up the standings. Of course, they really want to be in one of those top two spots after the round robin phase, because that's where you get the free win in the single Elim bracket in playoffs. Uh, but, you know, it's possible that Jolita will be able to push us to OT here, steal some of those points from Fury, and this is really going to be quite a race for the finish line for those top spots in the standings with teams like Bleed and Die Wolves uh, contesting Elevate perhaps we haven't really seen them yet it's, uh, it remains to be seen I want to have faith in Jolita here me too I'm keen for this this is their opportunity to tie up the scoreboard very much on this particular bomb site. player inside a T3 that's I9 uh, looking to rip a C4 out onto any players potentially repelling in, but thinks the better of it. That was a bit brave, okay? The cross on the door, back uh, in T1, okay? Somehow he gets away with that one as well. Dev, that's made me very nervous watching him <laughs> go through those motions, but nevertheless, he, survived. he is alive he survived. and well. He's Abide. healthy, that's good. We like to see that. So IDFC now has made his way on through T3 with I9 having fallen off from that position, having a think about trying to open up Attic, trying to clear out some of these plays in the top floor, get that hatch control and see where they can convert it from there. This does feel very slow and steady for Jolita. Uh, it has taken them a hell of a long time and realistically all they've got is big tower control. Right? All five players uh, bunched up in the same position. I don't know, I'm not optimistic, Manny. This feels extremely slow. This seems a bit yikes. Uh, good info denial, though, from Mark. That's the second Valcam we've seen taken out. And now a breach as well. Uh, if we can see Jolita flush out I-9 and the defenders from this position in meeting, perhaps a plant could be on the cards. They've gone for a pretty linear take here. A minimal take, I'll say, not linear. Uh, going into the big tower only to try and collect themselves onto the bomb site later. And because they've gone for something pretty minimal, they have afforded themselves a bit more time to go and do it. They don't essentially oh, need a lot of map control, but I9 has just found himself in an amazing position here, right in the corner of the stage, and will claim the first one onto Mr. Punch, but not before being traded by DCH. With 40 seconds left to go, Mark is going to try and make his move. Yeah, the backstab is thwarted though with Dark, however, player on the site has been taken down. Oh, Dark, you've got to set up now. Lycolis is on the ground, but it leaves BG Man all on his lonesome against two players. There's just no chance that he can pick up Lycolis here. And so Sappa will start this plan. IDFC to cover. That impact reveals the position. Can he pre-fire through the smoke? It seems so unlikely. Now the plant is confirmed. And this retake becomes all but impossible. All of these attackers have fallen back. Jolita look to be pushing us into match point. BG Man still uncertain of these positions. He has to pre-fire out everything. 26 seconds, but Mandy, I don't see this working for him. I don't think so either. I think Jolita have done good here on the execute going in as soon as they taken down I-9, Defender as soon as Mark made defender. his impact through the backstab, it felt like the, the kills have very much compounded. BG Man looking for a defuse attempt, but shut down pretty quickly by IDFC. And you called it Dev, but Jolita are back on the board. Back on the board and into overtime. These guys have fought long and hard for the right to play in this league, for the right to play under an organization like Shalita. No cap R6 is no more. These guys are back and they look like a completely different team. 
They are firing up and I'm optimistic that they can, having pushed into overtime, perhaps steal another point away from the top dogs in Fury, the reigning champions. And what an achievement that would be after a whole year of having to bow before Fury as the superior team from Thailand and from the Asia region as a whole. Uh, to be able to get a win over them, I mean, it's worth so much. The Fury, on the other hand, they can't afford to be dropping points like this. They need to put this game to bed. Wall secured! Good opportunity here to put themselves on yet another match point down in the basement. We have yet to see a successful attack on this bomb site, so you would think that surely this Attackers is a solid one for Fury and will give them another chance to close it out. Ten seconds remaining. Five seconds insertion. Monty repick. Double hard breach Attackers with the Maverick, so. Looking to bypass the Kaid and Tuberau altogether. I think that is a good pick from Sapper. Mm. Jolita have shown to be a little bit slow sometimes dealing with these problems. I would have to agree with that, to be honest. I think in the presence of the Tuberau and uh, and seeing their problems from before, I think this is an excellent adaptation. Uh, if they want to commit themselves to the back take, which seems like what they're posturing to do with the lineup that we've been speaking of. Uh, so Rome clear now for Jolita, but it seems like they've realized pretty early on that the top floor is completely clear. They're only sending out drones into the ground floor, just doing some light work, uh, realizing that the real estate has been completely given up to them. It really, it is just full stack on site for Fury, which... I know, I'm actually not so optimistic about base on this lineup. I think Jolita with the the Maverick and the Monty could make things a lot more difficult on this side pressure. And it comes down to what we're seeing right now. Sapper on this hatch, opening up the meeting hatch with his Maverick torch. So he won't have to worry at all about the electrification. He just has to get enough damage into this hatch. He does have to worry about C4s, but you can see how far he's moving away from this hatch. He's also worried about getting shot up through it, but you know, the Kaid is unimpactful. The two Barao useless to stop him. Though useful at stopping the ex Kairos on the freezer hatch. All right, so E has been open. A minute 20 left to go as well, so they've made good time of this. And as you pointed out, the Maverick, certainly the perfect operator to counter two Barao, especially with some of the tweaks that have come in as well. Sapper, just, just having a quick think here on the ground floor, what's the best point of entry now uh, for Jolita as they try and translate this great control that they've got down into the basement? That's always the hardest part from here on out. They've got plenty of utility to do so. In fact, three sets of flashbangs and smokes on Mr. Punch. So if they want to isolate off one angle with those smokes, that could be their way in. Another time delay sync from BG Man. Oh, here we go. That's a bit stunned. Mark is actually far back. Here comes the Monty down the stairs. Oh, I9 taken down. His position was known. <gasps> Jolita, out of nowhere, steal all the kills. Lycolis against three. Mark on the ground. Those goo mines continue to be devilish, continue to be troublesome. Where is this Monty? The Monty needs to be the one to make the mark, but Sapper puts the final bullet in the round, and Jolita now finally have their own match points. And by winning a laundry attack to boot, what a moment for Jolita. Fury left flailing. They could very much be rewarded in this series by that one launchy attack that they needed to win. The single 1-1 one, one in the entire series so far. We've seen this bomb site played so many times, but only now is Jolita finally able to break the spell, and it might close out the game for them. Now they can go and do their own defense on the exact same bomb site, and if success proves the same way statistically, it would surely translate here as well. Yeah, I mean, going into match point and having basement defense available, that's exactly what you want on Oregon. Can't get much better than that. But if uh, Jolita could do it on their attack, I wouldn't count out Fury. And they're actually That's bringing true. the Monty as well. <laughs> but, but, but are they bringing the Maverick? Oh, they yes, are. they are, it seems. They are. 
So they've seen what a leader have done and they're like, oh, not a bad idea, not a bad idea. And they've gone and done it themselves now. Now the real question from here for me is, can BG Man do it as carefully and cautiously as Sapper did it? Last time Sapper, he was playing the Maverick real far back, being cautious about C4s, two C4s so that got sunk up onto him, and then it eventually got opened and they landed the flashbangs in the right way that the one that initiated that execute to happen. Uh, they need to get all of those steps right, do Fury, to tie up this scoreline once again. It's interesting to see Jolita going for their full site setup as well, instead of going for this big roam game that we saw from them. I think the roam actually arguably worked better, especially with the adaptation that we saw from Jolita just last round with the Maverick. Now, if you're doing the same thing, I think that pretty much counters two of the five operators on this defensive lineup. Phone rings out for Mark, and he thinks a little better of holding on to this tower position. But I think he pointed it out pretty well. In terms of the attack lineup, it does quite well counter the setup going out uh, onto the defense, but no, I like this from Mark being brave about holding on to these tower stairs for just a little bit longer, delaying a little bit more time and making Fury a bit more cautious. Every second counts here on this defense. The more time that you can take away from that execute phase from the attack, uh, the better your chances of success will be uh, on, on the side of the defense. And I think Mark is doing the right thing by holding on to that aggression for just a little bit longer. I mean, Fury still is kind of working on map control. Like, they're not really... I don't know, they're not too quick here. I think they finally have established everyone's downstairs, but you know, they were still checking little corners of these rooms and opening these hatches and such. That's a great pickup from you as well, because if we cast our minds back to how Jolita were able to attack this last round, they instantly picked up in the prep phase that there were no plays in the top floor. They only sent drones in through the ground floor just briefly for about 20 seconds, just to check some entrances, and that was it. They were already on their way in. A minute 20 seconds left on the clock on the side of Jolita, and they already had the hatch open. Oh, here goes! A wow! From Dark with the team. Oh! Unsuccessful. Mr. Punch is going to take him down on the other side. That is so ambitious, so desperate, so risky, and punished perfectly by Jolita. Fury have one low HP Monty and three guns up without the control that they were looking for. Now Sapper, he's forfeited his spot, but he is still playing aggressively, and he's really looking to harass this Monty as the logic bomb goes out. Critche goes down. Fury are on their last legs as Zappa looks to find the Monty's legs. Oh, he gets him! He's back, ladies and gentlemen! He is back! BG man's in a 1v5! Oh, Shalita! What a way to get it done! To push to overtime and to keep on pushing. Zappa puts the nail in the coffin! And revenge is a dish best served hearts! And what a way to close out that game as well for Jolita. The one laundry attack in overtime paid dividends to closing out the series. Two points on the board, leaving an extra one away from Fury. What a way to start out the stage. I'm really sorry about the noise, guys. I, it's not just me casting tonight. We've got this one as well. And she, she's a big Jolita fan, so... She saw that result and she thought, oh my, I can't believe after seven tries they did it. This goes to show, uh, new face, no longer no cap, they're on Jolita. Uh, new face, new rebrand, new year, and they're here to make a statement. Massive credit to Jolita, a well-deserved win. That was a great win, honestly. It was so back and forth the entire game. It felt so hard to predict. And then the one turning point of the entire series was that one overtime win that they got. After that, it just compounded into such a successful defense. After that, Fury were unable to replicate the, the small details that Jolita got right in that set attack uh, to then go and close out the game. And yeah, well, what a fantastic way and a great adaptation, especially from Sapa. I really felt like his efforts in that game were very much felt in the final two rounds. <laughs> he had a lot of funny moments like this one as well. <laughs> a massive game from Shalita. Fury seemed better in regulation, but everything changed when we hit overtime. A historic win for Shalita as they kick off their 2024 with a massive scalp. But of course, we'll break it down on the desk after this.
Talent Drama, take one. All right, we, this play? is a really tough call. I'm actually not quite sure about this one. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna have to think for a really long time. Um, I know my answer. Wow, so shocked. <laughs> Oh, oh, what's that? I feel dodged oh, by Dev this. Stray. Yeah, right. Dev 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 Actually, to be fair, I'll, I'll be on in five minutes and yeah. you'll be on in like five oh, minutes. Actually, no, that's true, that is true. First <laughs> frag. I don't know, I've seen this guy farm a little bit. I've seen this guy farm a little bit. I went wrong. What? I went, yeah, what? I that's wrong. what I'm talking about, baby. Big dog! Big dog! Come on, uh, yeah. Big dog. Why, why, why did he listen? I'm on drones. I figured you'd be just form picking or something. I'm on drones. He doesn't know how to get. So, it, what happens oh, is and there's a, someone drones someone into the building, and the yeah. other player is an entry. It right? was who that's gets the, the first pick, not who gets picked not first. Not who watches yeah. it on a drone. Yeah. yeah. Oh, look, this might be a controversial take, I don't know. Only if I'm on drones can this person pull this off. Wow. Oh, absolute <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, let's, let's go. go. I really have just True. continued to just <laughs> not you are, the room. You are just, you haven't I, played enough of this, The thing is, mate. Rob doesn't want to work together with anyone. No, I just want to run in and find as many heads as I can. We play it like another game that I shan't say. This is a tough one. I mean, it's not like you can't, you can't really kill yourself with nades anymore. You, you can, I've seen it. Well, you might if I haven't. I just picked the I just picked the worst. Person. It's the most. That's what I'm as well. It's the That's most. Obvious. He already knows. He already obvious. knows. First turn. Yep. <laughs> Is that a first five out of five? Yeah. That's <laughs> the first five out of five. Well, well done, done man. brother. Should be proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this one's. This tough. is actually oh, tall. I, I know who I'm going. Okay, I have a story for this one. Come on, Amanda. Oh, oh she has a story. Oh! oh. Wait, what? Yeah, but I have had say, to um... call both of you to get on an Asian show. Oh, <laughs> yes! That is true. That is true. I remember and, that. And then I called both of them over and over and over. Laura woke and me up so, and was yes. like, why is Mandy calling yeah. you over and over? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know why. And then I like, clicked in two seconds later. I was like, oh, I've got a broadcast. <laughs> like, now. <laughs> Um, oh, like I, I've got, actually got a good one here. Um, I've got a good one, and I want to. I want to see what everyone else says. Three, oh no! Two, this is a five out of five. One, Dev. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, not his fault. Most of the time, his luggage gets lost. Uh, yeah. Not yeah. due to his. Also, his um, issue. my shoes were stolen from my hotel room in Brazil, and I've never got them back. So. Are you barefoot right now? Yes, I don't actually own any shoes anymore. Um, get, and the, get the grippers out. Yeah, I've. Oh, this is an easy one. <laughs> this is easy. Flip it over. Three, two, one. Yeah. There is a reason. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, a reason. Exactly. That is bull. It's there's, not guns. Look, there's a reason we call him the content. It's not because he's good at content. It's because he creates... Sorry, did I write guns? I meant to write me. Oh, oh well, that was really good. Uh -huh. Good segue. Did uh -huh. I make a mistake? <laughs> Thank you very much for watching Talent Drama. We will see you after the break. Well, it's a one in three chance. Thanks. I, is that how this works? Is it? So, I thought there was. Yeah, one of us should at least get it right. I have no idea. This is just a guess. I, I, I actually don't know. I, I did not play any of the Rainbow Six games outside of. All right. Ready? Siege. Someone's got it right. Three, two, one. Who got it right? <laughs> Yay! It's not a question I'm answering. Shit. I played a bit of Maestro recently, but I feel like I'm getting this wrong. How? Could you get this wrong? I have no this idea. Is the, this is such an easy question. Ready? Three, two, one. Oh, I did 85. You said 85? You said it's 80. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. 80. Well, actually, See? there's 80 in the magazine. Oh, it's 81. And one in the chamber. Yeah. So, That's what threw me off. Yeah, one in the chamber. Can't forget about the is one in the chamber. Is that why you typed in 81? I did 85. 85. Yeah, interesting. But not 86. Which was actually 81. also wrong. Could you imagine 180? Don't even need to give me the multiple <laughs> choice, man. I know this one. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how do you not know this? Do you guys do you know, should be do doing you not know this one? Do you, do you not know this one? No. Some of us respect one. the law. Really? Could you explain why he's the youngest? Not because he was born after the round. <laughs> <laughs> Just 
Stop looking at Maggie's homework. <laughs> <laughs> Ready? Three, Three two, two, one. Electric cow. Or E, as we call it. Because there is technically a bomb site immediately adjacent. Um, oh, I know this one. Done! Of course no. I'm about Easy. I saw Rob's answer. I, I can't don't. wait to see how, how he reacts when he finds out that he's wrong. Easy. Three, two, Easy. one. Don't overthink it, guys. It's 30! Nah. 30 plus 1. Ah! It's, that is not true! It is 30 because there is 30 in the Ladies mass and gentlemen, the chamber. Gun, Ladies so and gentlemen, like, you see this that's right wrong. here? That's wrong! 30 plus 1. What's 30 plus 1? 30 we are 30. being trolled by Mr. I'm going to dox him right now in the content. See, you guys are rookie if you don't know this. I actually have no idea. Ready? Wait. Oh, you want to cheat my homework? Yeah. There you go. Okay. Ready? 3, 2, 1. 5. 4. 5. Yeah. Don't ever cheat off wrong. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, if you actually, if you get this wrong, I'm just going with logic here. I don't, yes. know, I don't actually. No, no, no. Logic is an operator. He's a player. There is one operator that has something really long and shiny. <laughs> what? Jesus. Oh, Ready? Three, two, one. Kai. <laughs> Wait, did we all run <laughs> Yeah, we all run okay. Thanks for watching Big Brain Six Quiz. Gun sat down just to come back and look down the barrel. Talent drama, take one. All right, when we, when we this is a really tough call. I'm actually not quite sure about this one. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna have to think for a really long time. Um, I know my answer. Wow, so shocked. <laughs> Oh, what's <laughs> I feel dodged oh, by this. Cop astray. Yeah, uh, Dev definitely how? copped astray. Actually, to be fair, I'll, I'll be on in five minutes and yeah. you'll be on in like five oh, minutes. Actually, no, that's true. That is true. <laughs> First frag. Oh, oh, I don't know. I've seen this guy farm a little bit. I've seen this guy farm a little bit. I went wrong. What? I went, yeah, what? I that's wrong. what I'm talking about, baby. Big dog. Big dog. Come on. Uh, yeah, thank you. Why, why, did he, why did he listen? I'm on drones. I figured you'd be just form faking yourself. I'm on drones. He doesn't know how to get. So it, what happens oh, is and there's a someone drones someone into the building, and the yeah. other player is an entry. It right? was who that's gets the, the first pick, not who gets picked. Not first. who watches yeah. it on a drone. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, this might be a controversial take. I don't know. Only if I'm on drones can this person pull this off. Wow. Oh, absolute <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> Yeah! Hey, uh, let's go! go. I, I really have just True. continued to just <laughs> not read the are, room. You are just... You I, haven't played enough with this, The thing is, mate. Rob doesn't want to work together with anyone. No, I just want to run in and find as many heads as I can. We play it like another game that I shan't say. This is a tough one. I mean, it's not like you can't, you can't really kill yourself with nades anymore. You, you can, I've seen it. Well, you buy it if I have not I just picked the worst. I just picked the worst. It's the most. That's what I've done as well. It's the most. He already knows. He already knows. Yep. Is that a first five out of five? Yeah. Five out of five. Out of five. Well, well done, done brother. You should be proud of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this one's. This tough. is actually oh, tall. I, I know who I'm going with. Okay, I have a story for this one. Come on, Amanda. Oh, oh she's a story. Oh! Wait, what? Yeah, but I have had to call both of you to get on an Asian show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that is true. That is true. I remember and that. And then I called both of them over and over and over. Laura woke me up and was like, yes. why is Mandy calling yeah. you over and over? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know why. And then I like, clicked in two seconds later. I was like, oh, I've got a broadcast. Like, now. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Me. Oh, oh wait, that was really good. Uh -huh. Good segue. Did I make a mistake? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let's see what we got. Welcome back from the break. A very solid start. Some com Confusing uh, points, I think, were made in the green room, in our little back room as we were watching that one. We expected Fury to take that, but guys, it was one, a lot closer than I think most of us had expected, but two, did we see glimpses of the old, but maybe new roster? Yeah, it was a very competitive game, and a lot of the rounds actually themselves came right down to the wire to a couple of key moments throughout the entirety of the match, and then obviously the big uh, tipping point really the way of Jolita was the fact that they were able to kick things off so well in overtime attacking into basement get that round across the line and they looked like they weren't really playing with a whole lot of pressure in a league which is going to be a pressure cooker later down the line that's going to be I think a very important trait for them to carry forward well we actually have Sapper ready for an interview so let's welcome in Sapper it's been a hot minute Sapper welcome to the broadcast how uh, how does it feel to win your first and opening match Oh, oh no, no, no. Can you hear me? Hello, Sapper. Can't hear me. How about we mine? How? Pretty oh, easy, a little. Can't even get close. There we go. Sapper, can you hear me? Hello? We're getting close. Sapper, Hello, can Sapper. you hear me? Earth Hello. I can yes. hear you now. There we go, Sapper. We love to hear that, mate. How are you doing? I'm fine. How about you guys? Yeah, doing fantastic, mate. We were just wondering how, uh, how it feels to kickstart with such a big win um like we pack a lot during uh, before the game day we we try hard every single game on the stream so that's all we, we read and we try to do our best in the first payday Sapper, do you feel like coming into this particular league this stage that you're behind the eight ball a little bit in terms of where the team's at you've seen fury and bleed both go over do big things internationally over the last six months or so so do you feel like you've got a bit of catching up to do as a team uh pardon do you feel like you are maybe behind uh oh no sorry i'm i'm do you feel like you are basically not in the top two at the moment in your region? And so therefore yep. you are having to catch up to those teams. So at this point, we aim to be the top one in Italy for sure. hundred percent is it's might take time. So we try to make it too. Uh, I have a very quick question about the map. There was an opportunity for this game to actually go to labs. Are you guys comfortable on the newer maps in the pool now? So it doesn't matter which map that we're going to pay. Like we prepare for everything, every single map for them. We prepare. Wow. Okay. Oh, damn. Sapper, you don't mess around. Mate, look, obviously a great start for you and the rest of the team. I've got to ask you, is that still the same clown behind you that we used to see all the way back in the APAC South days? <laughs> yeah. All of the feeling is the same, but let let me say something like, to be honest, all of uh, the team member, all oh, of uh, the analyze, my coach, if you don't have all of them, so we cannot make this, we cannot do this. No, no. Well, uh, Sapper, congratulations uh, on the win. Any final comments before we let you go? Uh, before I go, I have one thing to say to the fans, of uh, the Jelida fans. So, bing bong, ding dong, histon ko. Bye! <laughs> Sapper, take care. That was a send off. <laughs> That is one of the more legit send-offs yeah, we've ever had. Uh, that's absolutely magical. I, you know what? From now on, we're we're dropping Dev and that barking dog in the background. I want Sappa on all of my broadcasts from now on. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. What Look, did he say, Rob? I will not dare. Uh, I would not dare try to uh, replicate such greatness coming from Sapper. Uh, what I will do, though, is transition us into our next game and away from what was an incredible start for Jaleta. Uh, Jaleta. I nearly said gelato then. See, this is what happens when we start Yum. We start talking about it. I could actually go for some gelato right now, but what I could go for is the new dogs making their appearance. 
on the scene. This is this is the exciting game for me. I feel like we don't really know what to expect uh, coming into this Dire Walls game taking on Daystar, but all I can be sure of is that if that is anything to go by, the game we've just seen, this league is going to be up for grabs, Jake. Yeah, I mean, I think <clears throat> we maybe underestimated Shalita a little bit going into that particular game. We have to give the credits where they're due for Fury and therefore, of course, for Bleed as well. Mind you, it is also day one group stage. If you're going to drop a game, do it now. And obviously yep. for Fury, it's that probably an understanding where it's like, okay, we're, we're a good team. We're up there. We probably should have won this had we been on our A game. We didn't. We can play better than this. Let's take some learnings from this particular match. And also, you at least still have one point. Neither of these two teams are really going to be in fear of, you know, the bottom two. So I'm sure we will either see them meet again in the playoffs or obviously we'll see them both in the playoffs. The other thing, obviously, and we kind of didn't touch on it in the pre-show, Rob, so sorry about this, but you do have to be mindful of bleed in this particular region, somewhat similar to Bliss in OCE. So if they're going to finish first, you want to avoid them in terms of the bracket, which means you want second, third, or sixth. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. If you have a slow group stage and you end up finishing fourth, for example, you're going to be running into bleed. Well, let's uh, let's really turn our attention to this next matchup. Let's start to deep dive a little bit more. Dire Wolves uh, roster that we always used to talk about back in the day as one of the most fearless performers and some of the most entertaining names in the business obviously things have changed dramatically since i'm talking about uh but this could still have the makings of a really great team mix. yeah divers were very much when they came onto the scene the unknown quantity that sort of filled their shoes over time and uh, definitely became a, a bit of a name stay in the region for sure um unfortunately though they did sort of peak then drop off roster changes movement things they could and couldn't avoid over time started to compromise their ability to perform um up into the point where the name kind of i guess shriveled into a relevancy that's probably a little bit of a harsh way to frame it but compared to the heights in which they were once at i think it's probably a pretty fair statement so there's now a rejuvenated roster more changes in play i'm eager to see if they can recapture some of that magic that they did produce in the past well, it's probably, I, I guess, maybe irrelevant, to, uh, you know, just add on to their performances over the last 12 months. You know, we saw them kind of, I, I'm not going to say stumble through their uh, group stages of both stage one and stage two, but there was nothing significant to write home about. So coming into this league, uh, obviously, we always have high hopes for teams, but Jake, could we potentially see, uh, you know, uh, uh, like the conversation about uh, Jolita, could we potentially see uh, a, a rise back to the prominence that we once saw? Or do you think maybe in this kind of a league, it, it might be way too difficult? For, for Jolita? No, 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 for Dire Wolves. Oh, for Dire Wolves. Yeah, yes. I, mean, I, I mean, to be fair, I'll actually probably put them in the same boat anyway to kind of go into that. I think that you sure. kind of look at where both teams have been previously, where yeah. they're at at the moment. Yeah, there's a lot of question marks. We had question marks on Jolita. Yeah, maybe answered a few questions though in that win over Fury. But Dire Wolves, I think... It's still very similar in terms of the roster that they have that they kind of had throughout 2023. And so therefore, mm. for me, it's like, have they actually changed the roster enough? If they haven't, then it's a question of what they've done behind the scenes in workshopping themselves to go that next step further. Obviously, you go all the way back to that like original 7th Heaven roster. A lot of that is pretty much gone now so that you can't really go too far back. Um, and the kind of new age die wolves, unfortunately for me, I just don't think has what it takes to again, kind of match the heights of a bleed or potentially even a fury. But as yeah. we just saw there from Shalita, maybe the gap isn't as big as we actually thought coming into this league. And so therefore, if they can just find a way to get good form, peak at the right time, go into the playoffs, snatch a best of three hero there, they could put themselves in a position. But I mean, as we will probably repeat throughout the entirety of this entire stage, there's only one spot. Can you take down Bleak? Can we even get into that conversation? That's going to be unknown until we kind of get closer towards playoffs. Do you want to know what it is unknown? The roster we're about to talk about. Hey, Star, what do they have coming into this league that might throw a spanner in the works? Could they be the underdog story? Could they be the, the hero that arises amongst what has been an incredibly uh, competitive region for quite some time, Guys, We just don't know. 
Yeah, and I, I guess it's uh, a little bit ironic then that they're taking on the Divals, given that in some respects they have quite a similar history in terms of entering the Tier 1 scene, being a very much an unknown quantity, and untested quantity at this kind of level. Um, for those who are unaware, they qualified in, uh, of course, the SEA Qual. They unfortunately lost to Jolita 2-0, but based on what we just saw in the previous match, but it's probably not all that surprising because Jolita are pretty no. switched on. Uh, lower bracket final, though, they actually absolutely stormed through against Varian X 2-0, 7-1, 7-0, Bank Chalet. So they stormed through in that regard. So there's some talent in this, in this roster. It's going to take them time though to adjust to this level of play um, and unlike a lot of the other more experienced teams in my opinion that will go in uh, not cruise control but they'll be far more relaxed in this phase of the event because they know it is for seeding this team may put some unwarranted pressure on themselves uh, when in my opinion they should just be looking to improve so we'll see what their approach is and uh, see if they can perform inside of the server it's an exciting moment nonetheless for them and for hong kong as well Look, it's a, a tough conversation to have, Xenox, because generally we would look at this league and say, you know, uh, the fact that it's top six make it to playoff, you know, there's all of these great conversations to, to be had. But obviously when it comes to a team like Daystar, probably the number one thing that they're going to need to take away from this is experience, right? So these best of ones, I mean, it, it's, it's that conversation that Guz is just alluding to there. How much pressure do you put on yourself? Oh, you shouldn't really be putting any kind of pressure on. I mean, I like in this, maybe you go back to the original opening stage of Apex South when we got 7th Heaven and what that roster was able to do and sort of make a name for themselves. Can Daystar kind of look to emulate that a little bit? Again, unknown quantity as much as really we've ever really seen before when it comes to Asia League for obviously this region, then obviously then this team. But you kind of go back and look at some of their results, beating out Varian X, the team from Thailand who uh, has been around the block for some time. So it kind of gives you maybe some kind of inclination as to where this roster actually is kind of at. I think for them as well, they should hopefully have some kind of surprise factor to a degree. They did lose to Jolita for what it's worth, 2-0 in the um qualifiers coming into this league but then won the lower portion so obviously there's at least a bit of known quantity for probably the other teams that did face them in the qualifying format there is footage of this team so you can vod review them but they do come into this at least in a great format talk about timing you've got yeah. plenty of time in the group stage win a couple of best of ones make sure really what probably should be job number one get out of the bottom two make it to the playoffs anything can happen from there so i'm very curious to see what this roster can obviously do throughout the rest of the stage well, you're liking them to 7th Heaven, and of course, ED's at the uh, front line of that, so who knows, he might be able to run it back with a completely new roster, a completely new look in a completely new league. Let's go ahead and have a look at the vetoes and determine where we're going to be heading for this matchup in particular. I Again, oh, Nighthaven Labs banned out really early. Guys, that's an interesting one given what we've seen so far. Yeah, it almost made it through in the previous uh, veto tonight. And again, I flagged at the time that Nighthaven was the least played map in the Asia LCQ Stage 2 last year. So this is probably playing out in a little bit more of a familiar fashion. The final three then being Sky, Club and Chalet. Uh, Clubhouse and Chalet tend to be a rather 50-50 when it comes to the veto. Um, I guess the reason Club is being banned in that instance is they probably don't back themselves to have the same level of fundamentals as Diables do in this particular matchup. So going to a map which can be a little bit more free-flowing probably actually leans a little bit more into them considering I'm expecting a, a team brand new like this or, or newer to the scene to play a fresher brand of Siege which is reliant on things like splitting your attacks, lurking into the map, and that is really quite prominent on a map like Chalet. So we'll see what they're able to do here Daybreak and um, obviously Diables in response. All right, well, let's welcome back our uh, two beautiful people. Uh, the, where's the doggo, Dev? I I really was hoping uh, she's, we would she's just... She's right. Hope. She's right here, but... I'm um, kind of hoping for yeah, dog no, in full I'm, frame. No, mm. I, if I picked her up, she would bark again. So I'm not going to do that. I don't know. I think the rest of the uh, Twitch stream, we want we all want the bark. Can you bark we for us? I apologize, <laughs> mate, if you're lucky. Maybe what, by what the time it gets to 3 a.m. and if we're still casting. What about a howl? <laughs> Can we get a howl from you, James? No, she's going to go nuts if I make any animal oh, noises. So you know what? We, should all, we should all make as loud animal <laughs> noises as possible through Three, the headset. Three, two, one. <laughs> go on, guys. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. No, you lead no, us. I, you lead you us guys are all waiting wouldn't. for the rest of you to I do it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Mandy, yeah. would you do it? Would you, would you lead us in with a howl? Um, I would not howl for Sasha. <laughs> Sorry. Well, okay. we used to get howls of the diewalls, so I'm kind of sad. But we do get to see, obviously, you know, uh, a very interesting new team coming through, Mandy. This is really the start, maybe, of a, an exciting journey. 
Yeah, I think so as well. I feel like um, they've certainly made the run through the qualifier. They've taken down teams that were previously in the tier one scene at yeah. uh, this time last year. And I, I feel like that's enough to prove themselves to be here in this league, to be honest. If anything, from that last game, we should probably go into this one open minded. It's going to be a close, uh, it's going to be a close tight knit tournament, even between uh, teams that are newer to it as well. Yeah, I feel like we uh, probably should have stated at the start of uh, Asia League. Just come in with an open mind and you'll have a bit of fun. Let's uh, let's leave you two to your own devices. Enjoy the game. Very much, Rob. Yeah, I think this is going to be a fun one because while Diewolves were directly invited into this league and they had decent performances last year, fourth and fifth place in the relative LCQs, uh, we have a bit of an unknown quantity in Daystar. And as we have talked about a bit, their coach, ED to play for Direwolves as their captain, IGL, primary leadership figure, and often clutch master. Now he's taken a back seat, he's gone behind the scenes, but I think there is a massive opportunity here for our first upset of what will be many in the Asia League. You know what, I'm going to say second upset. I'm going to say Asia leader taking down Fury yeah. was an upset. I reckon we could have double upsets today, Mandy, because Daystar are going against Direwolves on a map that Direwolves aren't perfect at. And so I would really give some credit to Daystar that they could make this work. Honestly, I feel like if there's any opportunity here for Daystar to have a good debut, it's probably against Direwolves. I mean, you, you could argue that going up against um, one of the teams qualifying in through the South Asia um, qualifier would have been an easier opponent to start off with. But I feel like this is a pretty fair middle ground for them to be able to test their skills, especially on a map like Chalet as well, which as we've learned over the past couple of years of it being in the pro pool now has become one of the more developed maps uh, for these teams. I can only anticipate Daystar probably know what they're doing on this one, just as most of the teams do at this level. Yeah, so if we have a look back at uh, APR's results, now Guz even mentioned that, uh, that of course, so Daystar used to be APR. That was the team that they played through the, the qualifiers for. And uh, they won against Varian X 7-0 on Chalet. You look a little bit further back in the Elite Community Series. They won over a team called Primitive 7-4 on Chalet. They won uh, in the uh, back at the end of last year over Champion, a well-established team, 7-4 on Chalet. And you look even further back, you know, earlier, Blazing Star 7-0 on Chalet. This is a map that Daystar have always loved. And on the flip side of that, Diwolves lost this very recently in the Elite Community Series to a team called Devil Package that don't even play in the Asia League. So really, you could not ask for a better opportunity for Daystar to kick off with a win in their debut. Right, so here we go. Ban phase is rolling by us as uh, we talk about the stakes for this match. And I think, yeah, it's, it's been pretty interesting so far. Monty has been taken out. Seems to be a staple pick so far of the region, at least off the back of that last matchup between uh, Jolita and Fury. It, it felt like it was being picked essentially every second round. Div. I don't know about you, but yeah, certainly taking away Monty does take away a bit of a front line, I think, for Diwolves very much starting on the attack. I wouldn't say that on the attack on Chalet, there is a bit of like a, a necessary evil on your lineup. I feel like there are a multitude of things that you can make work, especially in the current meta. But I think that Monty in this particular region is a pretty fair band to go with. Yep, I'm a big fan of it. I think it's a smart band, especially when you're going up against a team that, I mean, I know a a APR, they used to be called yeah, Daystar, like they're an unknown quantity, but uh, was, it a, was it deliberately a smile? It, it, it looks just... like a little swell. That was so cute. Anyway. <laughs> that is really yeah. not. If intentional, I respect. Uh, but I've no doubt that this Monty band is intentionally going to um, prevent Daystar from having uh, free map control, you know, that kind of brute force ability that Monty brings to the table. Uh, for the astute of you who've been keeping on the patch notes, there was recently a patch note that came out about shields. That uh, obviously we've had a shield rework recently, but the shields now, um, in the new patch, no longer are your feet exposed while you're just crouching with your shield. It used to be a little bit more exposed. Um, so shields, right after the shield buff, have just been buffed again. <laughs> so, ah, uh, yeah, see. definitely want to get rid of those. Interesting. Very interesting. So, uh, was that? intentional from the beginning it makes me wonder anyway don't worry we'll have this discussion later speaking of shields we've got Osa being picked up in the absence of the monty we still have at least some of the shield control some of that zoning control that uh, we wanted in the first place and that's on on Felix, on dire wolves my marine on the other side for daystar is gonna look for a roam over in the top floor and not to be met by anyone as dire wolves looking to sweep across the map from inside of library Cover 
does seem to be KZB the first point of contact. As you said, Momo's up here as well. Vert, potential. Can actually work both ways pretty well. Mika on repel now. So he's going down to outside West Main. So Daewoo's are looking up to pressure this. Obviously, it's a big roam from the basement, but they're not overcommitting as of yet. They're not just sending bodies in. They're playing it nice and slow. I think it's the right play. Uh, you've got some really strong operators here uh, on the cards for the defense uh, on this top floor. So you want to be careful at KZB. Don't go running straight into a Solus, for example. Interesting defense as well here from Daystar. They've actually elected to reinforce off the master walls and then leave the office walls soft. Fairly unusual uh, for this uh, defense of the bomb site go over and signing. Now, what that does mean is that they have given up control of office entirely to the attack. That's why this ram gadget can go in and play the vertical. That will vet then vacate dining. But it means that it's made it much harder for them to actually then get control of the full top floor, getting control all the way inside of uh, Master, for example, and translating that to Trophy is much harder with the setup that they've gone for. Oh, Pico almost lining up too, going into Kitchen there, but not quite able to land the shots. And with a couple, uh, just under a minute left to go for Die Wolves, they need to figure out what they want to do next. KZB walking into the line of sight uh, of Pico as he looks through the vertical, but Neon's able to trade that one back. I say finally a pick here for Pika, but might be enough even though the trade came back again because Daewoo's have a solid breach and they have the Osa, as you mentioned earlier. Felarks here has found a nice long angle pick onto Hijack and he's going to bring out the second shield. And Nade comes out. Lovely to see Osa with Nades in the new Year 9 patch and he's going to move on up. Souffle coming to support. He's a massive player, but a great C4. But the flank comes through. Neon does recompose. After his C4, he finds a kill to back it up with the SMG. Joe goes in, but Momo puts Seal in the ground. It's a 1v1. Shotgun v shotgun. And Momo gets it. Not every day you see the double ITA sidearm shotgun go head to head. But there you have it. Frost winning it. With the Halo skin, no less. Well, it was a close round between these two. Very entertaining. Uh, as it came in through the execute, Pika managed to find the two picks to kick things off from his window. And uh, eventually, uh, Philarx making those Osa shields work very well to his name. Able to claim two very long line of sight kills. And I think ultimately for Daystar, even though they lacked a little bit of that discipline from the early to mid round, somehow they got scrappy enough in those fights to claw the picks back in the late rounds. And my God, what a 1v1 it was to close it out. Yeah, I was, my brain was just trying to keep up with it. As soon as I yeah. saw the double IDA shotguns against each other in close range, I was like, mate, you could not ask for like a worse gun to be trying to take that fight with, and yet both of them have it. That's funny. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like that one could have gone either way. It just, it just felt like such a scrappy round from the beginning to the end. And to be honest, I feel like that is what we're going to see from these two teams throughout the entire time. Lack of discipline, but it makes for some fun gameplay. It really does. I was, I mean, obviously, have a very solid foundation back in the day. Pika and Souffle are the real OGs. They've always been star players for this roster, and now they are the veterans. Uh, Pelarx has been around for a hot minute as well. Seal, we could say. Joe's really the, the main new one here for Direwolves. Uh, whereas on the other side, they start a lot of new players to this level. All right, here we go. Pika, the man of the hour. And you look back statistically in 2023 was very much the highest rated player for direwolves uh, for the year top rated in the league for the last chance qualifier in stage two as well and uh, very much nowhere near the rest of his teammates we're looking towards him to see what damage he can do now just postured outside a library seal as well is going to try and capitalize on some of the info going out into office as well there is momo rin on the other side joe is going to take an engagement onto a player inside a solar but seal here is the one that we're really on board with has been really cautious oh my god <laughs> <laughs> okay well that's a nice way to kick it off i love the keratos add a little bit of style and flavor to it as well i don't know what you're going to do here dials you better have something cooking because 3v5 no refrags so far. And at the moment, they're seemingly just baiting for picks. Joe's low HP. Yeah. 
This is not a great start to a round, i got to say. Oh, and what? there you go. It goes from bad to worse. Momo's doing more. Momo's actually got the Keratos out as his primary. Joe almost finds a freebie, but I think he's just fluffed his chance to do so. Melox is jumping into the action now. Kotli is looking for something to hold down this fort on the site. The rest of his team nearby, but it's pretty basic. It's pretty easy. One kill. Oh, Ooh. this is the chance on the second, but it doesn't matter because his teammate comes in to support. And that is an even more convincing round to get off a day stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Daystar are just looking to hold their ground in the individual points of the map, really. Momo, even though there was info on him, he was able to find three from the same half wall, or two or three from the same spot in half wall. Not only that, but Kotli as well, holding on to the bottom side right at the end there and preventing anyone from getting in. It just felt like, yeah, the engagement's looking pretty disconnected, I would say, on the perspective of die walls. It felt, you know, like a more one-to-one -one engagement than looking for refrags, looking to play off the back of Intel. And uh, it just felt like that's where Daystar thrived. They won all their engagements, and that was close of the round. It's me. Hi, Manny. What? It's a Mandy. What? What's it going on? <laughs> <laughs> Why am oh, I go. in a box? <laughs> that was so scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unlucky there. <laughs> Now, the real focus we want is to put on Diwalls and Daystar. I want to say mainly Daystar. You know, Chile is a pretty attack side of map. We're already seeing Daystar with two rounds in a row on their defense. So, go. good start for them as the underdogs. And uh, starting on the unfavored side. They're looking very organized. they got to credit. Like, we already rattled off the stats. Chile is a great map for them back when they were APR. Not necessarily so for Tywalls, but we're really seeing that in the deck of strategies. You know, when you're bringing out Castle and Mira, you've spent a lot of time dry running something. Yeah, absolutely. I'm looking forward to what this will come up with. Not only is there the Mira dev, but there's also the Castle and the Izami to try and protect the setup going on as well. So it makes me think that Daystar have got a lot of layers to this onion. Here you go, uh -huh. Souffle. I know, we've been talking about, about the, the onion, onion meta again. <laughs> yeah, back around the onion meta. Uh, good first pick, though, on the side of Die Wolves, and probably what they need going into potentially uh, their third attack rounds here of losing out to Daystar, who have looked pretty sharp so far in the series. Getting at the first pick will be a little bit of a spike of confidence there. Yeah, KZB's low as well, so could be a nice way to get it back. And there you go, KZB finished off, but goes traded. Still, that's a win for Direwolves here. Numbers advantage, and yeah, it's just gonna compound. Hijack is able to find his kill. Just back into the realm of possibility. Neon is a great weapon to deal with these long-range engagements as well. UMP can be a bit of a headshot machine. And yeah, for Direwolves, you just gotta be really careful here, because it could so easily become just a couple of 1v1 fights, and they lose this advantage. You know what? You never know. I agree with you. You've got to hold your tongue between these two teams. You never know what might come out of the hat. A seal looking to repel up, but decides to take the ladder instead. I mean, fair enough. You're a bit further away from your opponents. The bees locking out a jump out as Neon goes for the swing out onto the balcony onto Souffle and takes his head clean off. You said it, but the UMP does pack a punch and is a bit of a headshot machine. And here goes Felarx onto locking in onto the player inside a closet. It's hijack. It's all on his own in a 1v2. Come on, Iwals. 2v1. Yeah, there we go. Just lock it in. Hijack goes down. And a solid conversion of the early man advantage. Oh, you saw the nades sink on through. That's beautiful. You can't cook them anymore, but you can mm, still very use nice. them to flush positions. Very well played by Iwals. They finally have their first round. But, of course, they start now have kitchen dining back open again and bar will be open this round as well so we've seen good things from them it's still mm -hmm. early days in the game yeah absolutely and not just that but even though we are going back to the kitchen and dining bomb site which yes daystar won but it was like by the skin of their teeth right the ita 1v1 right at the end there it's gonna be hard to replicate that same success especially when you're relying on such a scrappy brand of gameplay that they've been bringing into this defense so far right i've been enjoying it i think it's pretty fun to watch but it does make me a little bit worried for them and surely this is a chance for direwolves to tidy things up a bit get a second crack at some of these bomb sites now you've seen the setup as well 
They are pretty solid setup as we've seen from the A-Star. The Maestro as well, really good site information. This Rome game on the top floor was quite a challenge for Direwolves to clear. And uh, I've actually seen the Osa this time for Direwolves as well. I thought maybe we'd see a similar idea, but instead going for this Ram, so perhaps a very vertical centric take this time. I would have to agree with you on that as well. Last time around, they brought along the Ram for a similar purpose, and it seems like Daystar have gone for a similar setup themselves as well, not electing to reinforce off the office walls, but instead take a step back and reinforce off the master walls instead. So once again, it does a forward control to die wolves all the way up through office. It will allow them to play the vertical. It might not be necessary for them to take the entire top floor, but that's the risk that Daystar have gone with um, for this particular strategy. Really scared as well, just seeing how aggressive Momo is in this top four, a little bit too much towards library. I think he's fallen back now on the souffle. Pretty uh, ambitious to try and have just a crack in the window, but he could catch someone off guard here from the big window. My wolves are really are taking their time here, looking to clear. It's a, a nice setup for they start completely locking off office and focusing instead on bathroom and master as their primary points that they're trying to hold on to for as long as possible. It makes me wonder if I was really going to force this clear. It, it is intriguing, isn't it, right? Because in theory, for Die Wolves here, once they've got the office control, they don't necessarily need to push out further than that. From that point on, they could just hold on for the retake and then look to pressure the objective instead, which seems like what they're going to go for here. Felox is going to open up the wall. Kotli is a bit too late on that uh, KE charge to go for the trick on it. And now it's just up to Die Wolves to actually pressure out the site without losing their man count. Joe on the top as well with the ram charges is going to completely vacate the bomb site directly below them. That's a massive blind spot for the Ooh. defense. Oh, if they can land the attack following from that, Pika as well with the first pick of the round. That's really good flank watch as well. And um, Guy was put that pressure on by verting open the office floor, forcing Momo back. And there's Pika on the upside down repel waiting for the player hijack for a trade, but it's just not going to happen at this point. Pika's rotated his position over to the trophy window. And Felarx is trying to set up for a plant position. However, still Evil Eye, not dealt with. Another player pushing in from West Main. In come the flashes. The Evil Eye still delivering the information. These flashes aren't landing. He needs to wait for Souffle. Joe finds his pick and Souffle's timing is off. He at least gets something to bring it back. And Hijack left all alone. Won't even find a second kill. Seal puts him in the dirt. Direwolves are firing up. It might have been a slow start, but this is much more the form we've been looking for. Yeah, very well red attack there for Direwolves, very much playing into the weaknesses of that defense, taking full office control, realizing that was the real estate that had been given to them for free and fully capitalizing off it, completely vacating the bomb site down below inside of dining. I just allowed Phalox to send in those flashbangs, allow his team to make their move off the back of that and then go and play the objective. But even that wasn't necessary because they were able to collapse in onto the claustrophobic bomb site that was left behind in the wake of that vertical play being played out earlier in the round and yeah die wolves i think with a very calculated execute towards the end there and it's forced day starter to take their tactical now as well i think this is probably a good time to take the tactical pause right you when your first two defenses that's a bit of a uh i don't know if upset's the right word but you're going against the grain right you're starting strong on your defense the favored side on chile when you are the underdogs uh, and since losing two in a row afterwards, and particularly that last one was fairly dominant from Direwolves, uh, this is the time where you want to jump back into it. What is ED saying to the guys during this tactical timeout to bring them back together? Attackers need mm. to locate uh, that's a good question. I think, for me, the way that I'm looking at this team at the moment, and uh, with the lack of experience they've got in the Tier 1 scene, I think when you repeat a strategy like that, like you haven't flexed that much of the strap book, right? You've gone back to the same bomb site, you played exactly the same setup, and within one round, Direwolves have gone and figured out a pretty clear adaptation. I think it's important then for a team at this level to not get locked in their way of thinking and think that just because the strap book is there that they have to go and stick to it. They have to do it Rio for Rio, word for word. I think, you know, ED in my in that instance is probably better off encouraging them to try new things, uh, you know, keep an open mind in the server and be willing to go back to a different bomb site, try something different. And, you know, I think 
the longer that you can prolong that line of thinking, it's it's probably better for a newer team. Reload. Definitely agree. They still need to keep trying new things. Moving over to bar games, which was a bomb site that they won quite convincingly, I think. I think that really just mainly uh, was on the back of it was Momo, the guy roaming in the office for like three kills last time. Oh, and he's, he's already started with one. Yeah, he's doing it again, but he is traded. So uh, I think that's not too bad for Direwolves. Yeah, it's uh, losing a player, but you can't be too upset when you've taken down the top fragger from the enemy team uh, and the main roamer that stunted your push last time around. Direwolves once again looking to sweep the map. We've seen them do this essentially every attack around. It doesn't look like they're going to change their pace anytime soon. Aided by the bees, of course, Souffle is going to zone out the player inside of the display hallway, and KZB can no longer sit on that shield without getting pinged out by the intel, and that will allow some of the attack players to start to creep their way on through the building. Look where the bees have actually... A couple of bees have gone a little bit further down the hallway as well. The bees are flooding display, and Joe is able to push on the back of that. Get that kill. Great way to clear the position. Neon is able to find Pika though. Hijack still got his position at the top of blue. Oh, this is great. Yeah, the oh, perfect operator to be playing here in Ivory. Able to contest so many different long angles. Direwolves need to figure out a way to deal with them. This is where I want to see Direwolves slow it down here and just be cautious going into the last few plays a day so you don't know what kind of tricks they're going to pull out of the hat. And at this point, if you're too overzealous in getting this control on the top floor, one of these guys is probably going to fall to Neon. That's why they need to be really careful. He's just sitting in an off angle inside of Library. I don't know if they know he's there just yet. It's funny because he is actually vulnerable to a really solid upside down repel on that window and he's almost never going to that fight. You just need a crossfire here, Direwolves. But Neon is still not revealed. His drone was spotted out early. Oh, Neon does find one kill, but is traded on back again. Good refrag potential there from Diewalls, and they lock in. Hijack, you know, 1v1. Oh, but he loses it. Joe gets him on the angle. We get to see this shot as well. Quick adjust at the last moment. And a quick spray down to lock in Diewalls, getting three rounds in a row. Yeah, really scrappy round between these two teams once again, but I think good composure there from Direwolves at the end to play the trade game. Uh, anticipate the re-aggression that came from Daystar. I feel like Daystar have been quite a forwards team in general, characteristically, um, throughout the entire series, and I think it was right there for Direwolves to make their move, but then expect the retake to come on through from Daystar, and uh, they ended up making the decision to double push back up the stairs, try and retake the top floor to aid their teammate, which I think ultimately was the more undisciplined decision to make, and Direwolves punished them for it. I think Diewolves have a pretty solid read on the aggro. Yeah. Rotations. So we've seen it two rounds in a row now. Diewolves, how many players are dying? Because Daystar are just trying to make some moves, make some rotations. And uh, yeah, the re aggro, yeah, it makes sense, right? If you're a player down, you want to get back into the fight. Re aggro, because if you don't, if you play patiently, then more often than not, you're going to lose because you're at a disadvantage. But it's just being read too well. Five seconds to go. So they start, take their tactical after losing two. They lose the following round as well. It's quite grim. Yeah, it is a little grim for them. I wouldn't say it's like by means and ends all over for them or anything like that. I think they'll still go into this next round feeling confident. I feel like that's been sort of their brand of gameplay so far. They've looked really, you know, they've done everything with conviction. And I think that's, that's quite positive for the team at the moment. It's just that not everything feels as calculated as what Direwolves are doing. I think that in terms of the way that Direwolves are interpreting the game and the motions of it from a macro level, they look a little better at the moment. The last three rounds, that's for sure. They haven't been... I guess the last round did end up as a 1v1, but these rounds don't feel close. Always yeah. Feeling all right, so here goes Joe from down below. They have got some info onto the player on the ground floor. That's the, the vigil of KZB. Bit wary of some of the vertical from inside a bathroom, but um, there's no one there to meet him on the other side. There is still that player now being red pinged out as well. So vigil will know that he has been spotted out and he's going to make that rotation out inside of jungle. Seal is used the opportunity to get aggressive. KZB tries to fool the drone. Souffle has gone in for a backstab, but he is taken down. Trades back and forth again. 
Sky Wolves come out in the advantage. As I say, Ooh. that Neon comes up to steal it back. Momo jumps into the fray as well. Seal left a little bit separated from the ability to refrag those players. And now a number down. Sky Wolves have just two players up to try and force themselves in. Now they're very close to this bomb site. Drop the bomb diffuser. Oh, cheeky angle. Yeah, nice angle from Momo there. Off angle right in the middle of the office wall. Not one that someone would expect and seal with the 1x. Isn't going to take that engagement to his favor. Going to try and put an ass charge in the wall. At least make a run in hole to make uh, this entry work. Three headshots. Off, let's see. Time to ash it up. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Could he maybe plant here? Give them hell and then some. Almost baited out. Momo's going around the corner. He knows about this aggro. Oh, spots uh, two players at once and can't adjust the target in time. So a good, solid and patient retake there from Daystar. 3v1, but they don't over-aggress. And they do finally break the spell that Diwolves had placed on them. Three rounds in a row, and finally one back to even the heart. It really feels like every single round that we've watched is somehow in like within 30 seconds of the round, it's 3v2 or 2v3, depending on, I don't know, whose side you're on, right? It just feels like that early game pressure that's coming on from both of these sides is so scrappy um, both ways, and they're really keeping the pace with each other so well. But then it, by the time that we hit that late rounds, it ends up being so situational, and, and it feels like whoever is able to dial it back a little bit, like take a step back, just a small one, and then actually think about their situation that they were in for a little bit, they end up coming out on top there, right? I felt like Daystar in that final defense, yes, they realized that they had the numbers advantage, but they didn't make the decision to go and re-aggro and to put themselves forward, right? They realized that their teammates had done enough work. Whereas I think for Direwolves got a bit overzealous there in that two on three or three on three, trying to go for extra picks, right? So I think, yeah, in the end there, it's, it's, more about discipline, I think, once it hits the late round between these two teams. And I think whoever makes that decision first seems to come out on top. No, I feel you on that. Both these teams seem to be looking when they're a man down to be aggro and locate a bomb and That's what they started with doing when they lost that room. And you've got to be really careful when you have that number of like you saw they star in that 3v1. I was failed to do so, they got punished. Now they have failed to win their attack off. Back it up on defense. And hopefully Daystar have cleansed themselves of the shakes that they had at the second half. Well, the first half. They lost the throw. Pretty optimistic for them now. Moving on to attack on Chalet can always be a bit of fun as long as you've got the right mix of patience and aggression. Just a little trick. Bit of info onto the lesion here on the ground floor of Felox as Momo Moon's actually made his way all the way down into the basement. Felox could be in a bit of a pinch at this stage if the West Main push does come up from Momo Rin, although he's pretty wary of the flanks come up from behind him. It's a little unclear to me exactly where the push is from the base star. They, they keep repositioning. Yeah, they have lurkers kind of sneaking their way into position, but also players outside the building readjusting. That's not the other way through stairs, but... AZB is... Garage, this is... Is he going to go and try and clear Felox from below with the first? Mm. Perhaps. Could be the play. Here comes some util. Bees go out, and Felox is indeed pinched out. Great usage. A player on the trophy window deals the killing blow. Good start here for Daystar on the attack. You called it perfectly. The util sync was what they need to land that attack and start off certainly very well for them. Another firebolt to go in might enable this repel in for Daystar and they can claim a little bit more control of the map. Keeping in mind the bomb site is in fact this top floor. So as they make their way in, they can very much posture for an execute from that position. Neon here. He's actually gone and repositioned to the double window now. So Soufflé Good to have a flank, especially if Pika's doing a solid job of distracting. Joe has a great position. Oh, Souffle is going for it. No! You're a soulless. You should never be dying to a Claymore. Now Joe has to do it all himself. 1v2. He hears that plant going down. Probably to force it. 
Impact goes out. Bit of a pre-fire. Oh, he spots the first and the oh. double. Massive clutch. Daystar kicking themselves because Diwals have just stolen the round. Oh, man. Seal is happy about that one, mate. He's just absolutely stolen a round away with his teammate from... Uh, with his teammate Joe from Daystar. Great attack from them. Very calculated uh, going in towards the bomb site. They took their time. They even had pinches and flanks going on at the same time. Souffle didn't spot up the Claymore and it all looked like it was going so well for Daystar until Joe was just able to clean up that 2k right at the end of the retake as the plant was going down. Scrappy round once again, but Diwolves come out on top. Defenders, protect your bombs from being defused by attackers. Yeah, wow. No Daystar, that was so close to being perfect. Like, they really brought it back. Well, I thought it was a very solid uh, attack. They were patient, they repositioned, they found a hell of a lot of picks. I believe it was Neon found most of them. Get a replay of that clutch. So the impact, it didn't achieve maybe as much as intended, but it really it was just hijack over peaking there, getting a bit overzealous, allowing that 1v1 to come through. Well, Joe Gore's having a phenomenal debut, I tell you what, Mandy. Ten kills in seven rounds. Neon as well on the other side, 12 and 5. We've got some big hitters on these teams. You take those guys out. It feels like the round is done at that point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, these guys have just been fragging out against each other, but I think you said it right. These two players have very much been the stars of the server for their respective teams. Uh, someone else I want to point out as well is like surely I know we keep seeing Momo in these like really aggressive positions and it feels like when he's there in the early game <laughs> it matters you know it matters and Souffle has gone and taken him out last time I think we saw him going for that Rome oh uh, sorry that Lurk game on the Ash across the other side of the map Souffle's gone and read into that and he's taken him out early yeah, big early pick but Another one goes through. So good C4 from Joe, who's now found his 11th kill. Yeah, this is pretty awkward now for Daystar. Hey, you come back with the delay from the 3v5. It doesn't happen without you getting a couple of freebies. And so that's what they will start to look for. But it's not going to be found. Knee on the top fragger in the server has been served. 2v5 now. KZB is just waiting for something. I don't think he's going to get I don't think he's going to get anything either. Diwolves look pretty patient in their positions there. There's a player behind the cabinet to his left. That could spell oh, no. disaster for him. That's Felox. He's going to round the corner with the Vector in hand. Uh, oh, no, he hasn't gone through that Rosie. Oh, no, it's free oh, round the Rosie. Round the Rosie. KCB, <laughs> he's just going to backstab him, but it doesn't matter anyway. Peek is able to claim up the last one, and Diwolves get a round that was well-deservedly theirs. Yeah, it was until a brief moment of a day star showing up. But oh yeah, all right. I was have found the round. And with that, Mandy, they're actually starting to run away with this game. Uh, it feels a little bit slow and steady that it, it come to this point. And you said it well. A lot of these rounds are really scrappy. Like, so hard for these teams to, to maintain a numbers advantage. And an early pick here or there because of oh my the God. advised swing. <laughs> <laughs> Was so I was like cat and mouse, but you've just watched the mouse go through the wrong hole. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> not good. Oh, oh God. Good star, mate. Yeah. Like, oh. well, they got to do something at this point. They're going to see the first snowmobile wine attack. Maybe that'll merit something for them. They themselves didn't collect to defend it at all on their half. I don't know if that's because they... And no good at the site, and perhaps it reflects poorly on their chances of winning here. Or maybe they think that it's a bad site and they have some amazing attacks for it. I'm going to be optimistic for their sake and say it's the second. I kind of want to believe in that too. Um, I like the lineup that they're going for. This is quite exciting. They've got Nook. I like this. Nook has gone out of fashion a little bit these days. But when it does come into play, it's exciting because it's, it's new and stuff. Also, Hot and Cold's really good at it when he does it on SSG. So I'm hoping for KZB's sake that when he goes into his attack, he can do his best Hot and Cold impression and try and inject himself into the map and find some good kills. A while since we've seen a lot of good around. It's the silent step removal and the nade nerf. And the She's a bit squeaky nerf. now. She's had a lot of nerfs. Kind of mm. unfortunate for it. Uh, Nade is actually being changing right now. I think that, yeah, it's to clear util on the wall. Let's see if it works. No, it 
Didn't see. Okay, all it seemed to do was clear a Vulcan canister, but still the wall is electrified. I'm not sure where the electric. Wall is. Oh, maybe the Vulcan canister was like on the floor, like blocking the nade trajectory. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. body blocking it, Goyo thingy blocking it, canister blocking it. Oh, there is a player on that window, and they know. Freebie. Kill him! Oh no! Get him, bro! Get him! He's right there. <laughs> no way, Souffle gets away with his life there. Oh dear. He really oh should my. have been punished. That should have been a free kill for Daystar. And it will go begging. They're lacking a lot of confidence on their attack. We've seen it now for the third round in a row. Just a little bit of shakes. That drone came out, clearly pinged it, and yet not the commitment to land the shot, not the commitment to swing on the back of it. And now just so much time being wasted. Pika does mask the sound of his drop, but Cotley immediately Ooh. goes in and finally gets the opening kill for Daystar. That was a bit brave there for Pika to then go in for that rotation and Cotley finding some good timing on that as well. Here goes Hijack down the lobby stairs to try and find the remaining players in the ground floor, but it seems like most of them have fallen off. I think there's only one left somewhere on the ground floor. Nope, all four of them now back in towards the bomb site, feeling like they've got enough value out the room. But here's where the ram is going to start to come into play for Momo Rin. Uh, putting the Mars rover down on the floor is going to force some of those defenders to at least vacate half of the bomb site going into Wine Cellar. Yeah, the thing is, there's still so many good power positions for Die Wolves to play, and that's exactly where they are in a blue behind the shelf in Snummer Bill and uh, in Connector, even in the safe spots in Wine. And so we need to see Daystar pinch out these positions. This Connector hat being open would actually assist with that. The gas is going to lock out Con. There's no solid breach on the snowmobile wall. Hijack has oh to no. rotate. No way of clearing the electric floor. What are Daystar going to do? Because they've lost their backstab as well. It's looking very rough for the newest team to the league. But they finally found another pick. And oh, another one wolves. at that. Seal steps up and holds the fort down on site. But it does leave it all up to Felarx. Cotley's gone down. The fuse are being planted. No gas to speak of. Zero on the clock. Hijack forcing down the plant. Momo looking to cover. The plant has been confirmed. And Felux, he finds his first. The second now goes begging as Momo's gone upstairs. And it's biding his time. It's baiting it out. And there's the R4C to deliver the killing blow. There is no world where Daystar should have survived that round. And yet they did. I cannot believe that Direwolves have just given them that one. What on earth was that round there? Daystar, by all means, did not have any win conditions going into that round, right? I mean, maybe they went for the one plant spot that they actually could have made that work with the connector drop. But in towards the end there, Direwolves just going in relentlessly for those last ditch engagements. That was really scary from Direwolves and Daystar somehow able to collect that one off the back of what was a pretty monumental uh, yeah, rush into the bomb site in the last couple seconds in the round. They absolutely went deep for it because they knew that was their final win condition to possibly get that done. This blue push in particular uh, onto the one player that maybe could have prevented this push coming down from the main stairs, not just that, but in tandem as well with the connected player going down was what they needed to secure that plant spot behind the shelves. I oh, know, Mandy. Direwolves are not You'll looking know. in great form at the moment. It's oh, it's just it's so hard to watch a round like that, where they really should have had everything in their favour, where it looked like Daystar were just going to fall to pieces, and then, yeah, that happened. Uh, even Felox had a decent chance at the end there, but oh, it's it's moments like that that make it really hard to believe in Direwolves at inverting these advantages. We had... A slew of really solid rounds from them in a row, and then something like that happened. I mean, I'm, I'm going to sound like a bit of a broken record, I think, talking about this, Jeff. But like, I, again, I just think it's discipline, really, between these two teams, honestly. I think there have been some rounds that I feel have gone the way of one team over the other because someone has chosen to be a bit more a bit more patient for like one or two more seconds or actually gone and taken a step back and thought of the situation in a situational way and then gone and problem solved or something like that right whereas i feel like you know in that last round there for example ty was lacking a bit of discipline getting a bit overzealous with gunfights being relentless it's not always the solution i to put your finger on a solution when you're in the middle of a game as well the Diwolves haven't yet taken their tactical it is on the cards for them, still available. Based on the other hand, 
wasted theirs. I did say wasted. They immediately lost the following round. They start going to have to keep pushing from here. Three more rounds in a row to guarantee the full points in this matchup. The Iowals just need one all round to secure their first point of the season. Here comes a run out from Souffle, but it's been red like a book. Great start for Neon. Diwolves already fighting from the back seat. Good first pick, but can they convert it from here on the attack? It does look like a solar centric one for Daystar as they shape up to repel their way on in. KCB down below has an inkling that Felux here is actually going to look for the hat drop as the way out. Could be potentially a great read here. Damage ringing out for Hijack as well. The LMG ringing true onto Joe as he's taken down very low. And there goes Momo, though, on the other side to claim the second one for Daystar. It's certainly looking like a solid attack round from here on out, but you never know in these rounds. True, Joe is still alive, and he's been one of the most dangerous players. He finds his 13th. Oh, dear. He's been downed immediately after. How have Daystar just sat on windows and repels and found four kills? I would love to know. Diwolves, again, struggling Attackers with their discipline. As Felark's going to be able to get this revive off. Seems to be some information ringing out on the site. He is going to pick up Joe here. So one teammate back on his side. A full rotate out of Daystar. It, yeah, they've gone actually to completely change the side of the map they're going to push from. And he's jumping on his cameras. I don't know what's going mm -hmm. on. Joe's found Momo. This is very scary. Especially mm -hmm. when Kotli gives up a pick like that. How is this happening again for Daystar? 1v1. Neon versus Joe. The top frag is in the game. Go head to head. Neon round in the corner. But he doesn't know where Joe is. Keratos oh, no. to win it. Diwolves. Once again, a match point, but stolen away. Oh no, I cannot believe that's just happened twice in a row now. But on the flip side, instead, Dev, Daystar, they had that round two right. Solar attack, first, second pick, even third pick coming in. And then somehow, maybe the overthinky. The, <laughs> the overthinky. Let's disease. fully rotate. It's a 3v1. Let's fully rotate to the side of the map that we haven't pushed yet. <laughs> That's, that's what I'm thinking as well, right? We're, we're on site. We're on site with Felox on board with him. His teammate is down. He's being super cautious because he thinks that all of us swarm in on the site. They're the one person on the bomb site. And then they're on the other side of the map. It's it's strange, I think, to put it in any way. Dev, it feels a little bit overthought there from Daystar. And it cost them, unfortunately. Felox was able to get the pickup onto Joe, who put a pretty great effort in to win them out the round there. I mean, it's 16 and 6 at the moment, plus 10 for his KD. To be fair, on the other side, like, Neon's having a great one as well. I believe he was 16 and 8. That's still a 2.0 KD. Uh, it's just, it's so painful to, to get that hope for Daystar when they seemingly have a really strong round with all those early picks. And it falls apart. Diwolves credit to him, like they've got some good pickups. I've been really impressed by Joe. We've said his name a lot, but you know, he's the newest one on this roster. And uh, I think that he's uh, really a very fiery player. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's just, it's so challenging to know what to say about these teams when it is a lack of discipline sometimes that lets these rounds slip away. I mean, I think, yeah, Joe's just been, like, excellent. It feels like all the positions that he's been thrown into has made an impact, like, quite a heavy one. 16 and 6 is no small scoreline, especially in a matchup where it feels like there's gunfights left, right, and center. Uh, it's certainly an advantage here to be winning those ones out. And I think, ultimately, yeah, for Daystar, that last round was probably the most curious of the lot to me, that it felt like that was the most convincing entry into the attack that they'd gotten, and then not able to convert it after that is certainly something that I would go back to the drawing board and have a look back at that one again. Well, potentially the final round of the game here, Mandy. We're going to kitchen dining. This was the second round of defense we saw out of Diewalls, and it was a pretty convincing one. They start after fumbling that massive opportunity, have a, an even bigger task ahead, and that is tracking into this bomb site, which seemed to be untouchable from Diewalls. And I don't think they're going to be able to achieve that by sitting on windows and repels like they did last round. I'd have to agree with that as well. I think they've got to get their hands dirty in the building, and that's exactly what Neon has decided to do. You pointed out pretty well the 
are the top fragger of this server so far. 16 and 8 as well, matching so far. Uh, his counterpart in Joe on the other side is going to be the entry for the team, followed up by KZB. Sweep across the map so far, so good, although the next challenge that they have to face is getting open some walls. And well, even though Thatcher's up, they haven't brought it along with them. Guess who they've killed? The man of the hour. The man of the hour, the man himself. Yeah, if there's anyone you want to take out as an opening pick, it's definitely Joe when he can clutch up like we saw last round. Like you said, Util's also part of the game, and we've got a shield cleared. Nice job. Piano, Neon. He's been the playmaker for Daystar. Top fragger. Still a, a little bit of progress made here on the ground floor and on the top floor as well, but Sufai is still contesting. Hijack is going to... Oh, I was going to say open up, but no, the Tuberau is there to delay this for as long as possible. Oh. Neon's good for another one. Maybe he's going to pop 20 kills in this game if he keeps it up. Out go the concussions and threatening a push into sight now. Did Daystar commit early? What on earth? The double claimer on the door as well. Neon is cooking something up. He only needs two more for the 20 bomb. There is a player in his sights. Can he take him down? That's Felux on the other side. No, he can't. Pico is going to take him down from elsewhere, and that's the 20 bomb dream. God, now for Daystar. With 45 seconds left to go, it is back to a three on three once again. And Daystar have pretty much rotated as well. We've got a player outside of West Main, a player outside of Trophy. Hijacks also here on West Main, so all of that control established on the lobby side, on the top floor, completely gone. In goes Hijack, somehow manages to jump in without dying. But Daystar are now in a rock and a hard place. The Souffle up oh, above, Souffle. trying desperately to land some shots. His position revealed, but he gets spotted by a player. Walking straight up the stairs, Hijack steals that. And now Felarx, he finds his first. Almost a second, but not found. Pika now coming in for the flank, has to 1v2 for the game. A C4 to go out, it could make a nuclear impact. A 1v1 oh, now. Momo against Pika. Does he have the info? Does he know? He's got an inkling. Momo can't wait forever. The DMR packs a serious punch. And as he rounds the corner, it's only going to take two bullets to win the game for Direwolves. Oh, clutch after clutch. Scrap by scrap. Piece by piece. They steal the game away from a valiant effort of Daystar. But Direwolves. They're the top dogs today. Yeah, they certainly are, Diwolves. What a way to end out the game. Like you pointed out, it felt like it was clutch after clutch, crazy round after crazy round. Win conditions out the window. It was all in the gunfights at the end there. Pika landing some very critical shots in tandem with his teammates to close it out. I'm just looking back at my notes. I like clutch, uh, clutch, 1v1, clutch, retake. That was a crazy game. Yeah, Both of these teams know how to make plays, they trust their instincts. When you got one guy going 18 kills, another guy going 16 kills, you know uh, you're in for a treat, especially when they're on different teams. Uh, I will credit Daystar though. Four rounds, four good rounds, uh, that's credit to him. And you know, three, four of those 1v1s went the other direction, we'd be talking about a completely different result. Yeah, absolutely. I think between these two teams, it was just, it felt like any round could turn on a dime the way that these 1v1s were going. And I think 7-4 scoreline probably doesn't do justice just how close some of those rounds were. Yeah, very much so. We'll break this all down after the break.
Sniper's activated. Defenders have located the diffuser.
Hello and welcome back from the break. Nice performance from Dire Wolves, but are we still impressed, Mandy, with uh, with Daystar's performance? All things considered, they, they are a new team, but they looked confident. They looked like they were in there and they were doing things with conviction. And I think, honestly, for a first game, that's, that's all right. Conviction is pretty important in a league like this, Dev, considering the names you're going up against. Yeah, very much so. Uh, yeah. Direwolves have players like Pika and Souffle who've been around for ages, and players like Joe who are fragging out like crazy. So credit to Daystar. I think they gave it a lot. There were a couple of moments where it really fell apart for them, but I really respect that they came out of the gate swinging on defense, unfavored side, two rounds in a row. And mm. even after losing the round following their tactical timeout, they still managed to bounce back the round after that. Overall, a really tough game uh, and just a lot of 1v1s and clutches that went against them and one that went for them. So I wouldn't be too cut if I was Daystar. We've seen good things and I think we can see more against some of the other competition in the league. Well, it's time to hear from Seal himself. Not the singer, but the player. Seal, welcome in. Oh, hello, Cousin Xenox. Ignore those two there. Oh, okay, we'll, we'll talk to Seal in a hot second. Don't worry about it. We'll come back to them. Don't stress too much. Uh, Dev, I, I guess my, my follow-up question was going to be probably more primarily about where Direwolves now place themselves in in terms of like what you've seen inside the server, the confidence, obviously just finishing commentating them. Uh, you would have a little bit of an insight. Do you feel confident? Uh, I am not yet sold. Um, yeah. Like, the fact that there were so many 1v1s and clutches, typically not a good sign <laughs> for a, a team's consistency. Like, you want to be uh, dominating, or if you lose, you want to be able to see that, like, next round, okay, they revise. And to Dawa's credit, uh, in the first round, I believe it was, they really struggled on their attack. And then a couple of rounds later, when they went back to that same bomb site, they completely changed their strategy. They looked really organized, and they had a great adaptation. I think it was something that you actually Andy. So we have seen good things from Direwolves. I don't think they're going to be on lead Fury's level as of yet. Uh, even, uh, I was going to call them NoCap, Jolita. Uh, <laughs> who knows about Elevate? We haven't seen them yet. Obviously, we'll see them up next. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not quite sold on Direwolves. I do think the league is actually getting more difficult this year uh, with teams like Bleed leveling up. Fury has really found their feet. Uh, Elevate's new roster looks pretty dangerous and Jolita has finally found themselves. So I actually think Direwolves will struggle to get into well, they've uh, started off their campaign in the right way. We will bring in Seal this time, and it works perfectly. Seal, can you hear us? Okay, fantastic. Uh, we <laughs> can't hear you, but we're just going to go along with it. Seal, uh, I've got to ask you, how does it feel after your uh, your first win in the league? Uh, it feels good, but the win is kind, kind of tough, so I think... We will need to prepare more for next match and match after this year. I wanted to ask about your newest teammate, Joe. He did really well today. I wanted to ask, where did he come from? How did you guys find him? And um, how do you think he's impacted the roster? Uh, as you can see, like, Jogo is a very strong player. And we are stronger after we have Jogo, but uh, where do we fight Jogo? It's it's a player. He's a player who was already well known in East Asia, and he wasn't 18 like this before this year. So we fight him. We need him, and he joined us. Yeah. Great. Uh, I wanted to ask about the rest of the stage that is coming. Last year, Die Wolves had, were fourth place and fifth place in the last chance qualifiers. How do you think that Die Wolves will go this year? And which team do you think will be the biggest challenge? Bleed, Fury, Jolita, Elevate. Um, I think Fury will be the biggest challenge because they are, their play style are so unpredictable. Uh, I think our performance will be better this year. Yeah, we choked. We choked a lot. We choked a lot less stage matchmaking uh, to no cap. Right now, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
look, that uh, that roster's obviously improved themselves as well, so it's obviously going to be quite competitive. We always like to give you the floor seal. Is there anything you'd like to say uh, to anyone watching, you know, whether they be fans, maybe even family, anything you'd like to say? Um, keep supporting us, and we will not let, let you down. Yeah. Seal, congratulations on your first win, mate. We'll chat to you very soon. I uh, went really Australian right toward the end of that interview. I noticed <laughs> just, that. I was like, <laughs> mate, you're making it hard for him. Yeah, that just... <laughs> G'day, mate. How do you yeah. think it's going to go? Yeah, How's it going? Mate, good. Well done. Good on you, mate. No worries. <laughs> well, uh, look, obviously, Mandy, there's, there's some discussions to be had in and amongst there. It sounds like, you know, Seal understands that there are uh, hurdles that they need to overcome, obstacles that they need to get around, and they are fully aware that this is going to be their path forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I still sound pretty confident in their pickup in Joe. It seems like this is a guy they've got their eyes on for a while. And so in my eyes, this is hopefully a roster of five that they can now work with in the long term to then go and improve and be a competitive team. Well, I think that that really, I think that's going to sum up that matchup. I don't know if we need to talk about it too much more. Dire Wolves, they start off with uh, an important three points and we've actually been able to see what these stars can do. I mean, this roster might actually come out of the woodwork and start to compete. I think it's also important to note uh, while we were in that game, ED finally replied to me. ED, thank you for replying to me. Uh, I know I'm probably least on the priority board, uh, but he was saying that this is very much like a, a, a stage of uh, enjoy tier one siege enjoy the moment and, and compete and really it is a big throwback for me dev uh for seventh heaven so i mean i'm excited to see what this roster could do in the future but let's go ahead and uh, start talking about the rest of the night we've still got two games to go so if you're only just joining us don't fret uh, there's plenty more to come, obviously, uh, early in the night, as they would say. We've got Elevate versus Knock Knock next up, Dev. Uh, these last two games of the night, I mean, they could be blowouts, they could be close. We really, I, I feel like I don't have a good gauge on them. I know we expect probably Elevate and Bleed to come out on top, but very rarely does Asia go to scripts. Yeah, very true. We already saw that with the Jolita game. So I would love to see some upsets here. Of course, South Asia now getting the spotlight for these final two matches. Knock Knock, the former Mon Monkey Hunters roster, and Haseeb Warriors, the former Haseeb Warriors roster. Before that, they were called Rush B, but that didn't go so well for them, so they'll probably want to forget about Stage 1 last year. And of course, they're going up against two of the best teams that we've got in the league, Elevate, uh, who attended the Copenhagen Major, and Bleed, who attended the Atlanta Major, and of course, uh, the Six of Invitational where they had a stellar performance. So these are, are both David and Goliath matches coming up. And I think most people are going to be picking the two red teams. Uh, but if you're a South Asian fan, then you're definitely going to be rooting for the underdogs. Yeah, well, let's start talking about the Goliath in this situation. Get a, an understanding for the roster that uh, is now uh, a, almost a, a bit of a Frankenstein uh, in a sense, Mandy. A couple of new players coming in. Mm. Arpe and Speakeasy obviously hold down the fort uh, from the previous stage. And I mean, they've got a, a world of knowledge and experience at their feet, right? Yeah, absolutely. Last year, they were the runners up for qualifying into Atlanta. They missed out by going by just one map. They eventually got taken down by Bleed, who did end up going. And then after that, made a pretty deep run at SI as well. So all credit to them. But for Elevate, I think these guys very much in 2023 were in the shadow of third place throughout the entire year. Unfortunately, not quite being able to break in uh, through Fury and through Bleed. But now they've got some new guys on the roster. I want to talk about someone like Shed, who's come into the region now Historically, he was put on the team called Ji-Hu, who I believe have been playing in the EU Tier 2 for the past couple months. So I'm really wow. curious to see what impact he's going to have coming into a completely different region. I mean, we've seen uh, we've seen what happens when other regions kind of mix and melt a little bit. Uh, do you think that this could be an overall net positive, Dev? Or do you think maybe this could just be one of those cases where, you know, we're, we're just going to have to wait and see? Now, look, I, I can tell you right now that anyone watching from Europe is 100% saying, oh, yeah, these guys are coming in here and they're going to completely shake up the league. Uh, for those who missed it, G Who actually beat G2, which is, I think, I think they were called something else and they changed the name to G Who after they beat G2. I don't know the exact timeline of it. Uh, but yeah, like, they're a quite a formidable team. They also beat Makers as well, which is a fantastic team. This was back in the South Reach qualifier. Um, 
yeah, like, that's not nothing. Beating G2, the same G2 that was, like, top six at SI. Yeah. Uh, and these guys were in those games. Uh, so it was a huge export. A lot of people were talking about them coming into Elevate. I know that uh, Elevate, the org themselves, like, they're very much a global brand and involved in the global community, and they made a big hullabaloo about, yeah, we're picking up the G Who players. Uh, so, yeah, it could have a big impact. Very different style of siege we play down here, and uh, very different community. Uh, I guess it helps, obviously, that everyone but Shed is actually like from Asia. Yeah. Uh, but I'm just keen to see what happens. Like, bring a little bit of European spice, European tier two, tier three spice into the mix, and, and see how that hangs down in the Asia League, which is very competitive. Don't get yeah. too complacent, even coming yeah. from Europe. That's what I was going to say. We'll we'll wait and see where Tier 2 Europe really is after this stage. Knock, knock. Who's there? It's knock, knock. Let's talk about the roster that <laughs> we expect to be the David in this situation, Mandy. It's a very tough uh, discussion when it comes to Southeast Asia versus South Asia. South Asia's always felt a little bit behind the curve, but at least we've got names and faces that we know uh, ha have been tried and true for at least the last four or five years. Yeah, absolutely. So unfortunately for these guys, they did end up playing in the last chance qualifier for the majors in both stage one and stage two of last year. And both times they were first rounded by a Southeast Asian team. So they have yet to win a series in the new Blast format that actually allows them to compete against South Asia for a major. So this is their chance to go and prove themselves. Deb, do we think that they could do it? That's I'm just going to keep it as simple as I can. Do you see Knock Knock upsetting Elevate here? So, but I don't know, like MH were always a really solid team. They've got Envy as well, and he was on Shaheen's and they had some amazing shows. So like this, you could, I don't know, I'm not sure. I may have to ask some of the South Asian community, but you know, you could say, oh yeah, it's a South Asian super team coming up. Uh, like these guys have, have all played for forever. Like Rattler, Beat, Ittery, Sandy, these guys have been teaming for ages together. Uh, and they've kept playing in the South Asian region, been kings of that for a while. They keep coming into SEA for the various like major qualification pathways that we've had in the past. And yeah, it's it's very rare that they would actually find a win uh, against the the South Asian or Southeast Asian teams or Japanese or Korean teams that they've played. But you never know. There's always going to be a first time. And maybe the fact that they're playing against some of the Brits will actually help them out. I know this isn't cricket, but uh, oh, a bit of oh. a bit of India versus UK, maybe. I don't know. You never know. You never. You could throw a bit of spice in there, a little bit of spin <laughs> in there to uh, turn things up. Let's go ahead and talk about the Nat Vitos. Uh, again. Conversations in this region very rarely uh, take place around maps, Mandy. It does feel like most teams are pretty comfortable, but you never know. Uh, a spanner in the works could change things up. I don't think there's going to be. I think Oregon's probably where we're going to be heading, somewhere like that. And yeah, I think you might come be right. Down to consulate. And it's not going to happen. We're going back ah. to Oregon. Again, though, Mandy, there's there's much of a conversation to be had here where really some of the importance for these South Asian teams, for these Davids in these Goliath storylines are going to come down to, you know, playing these more familiar maps, playing more familiar play styles and not overcomplicating. Yeah, absolutely. I think you may as well give it a try. Go to a staple map, something that's probably more developed, and just, just give it a crack. Don't overcomplicate it. And I think that's a completely fine approach going into this matchup. Yeah, I think, Dev, overall, we, we have very clear guidelines for this game. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Elevate win, knock, knock, lose. Yes, but knock, knock are really good on Oregon. I'm, I'm looking for some kind of copium here. They're on a four-game win streak on Oregon in the last year. They've won it 10 times. Last time they played it was uh, only 12 days ago, and they 7 0 won't stop peaking on it. Like, hey, yeah. that's that's something. I mean, Elevate are also pretty good on Oregon. They're on a six-game win streak, but I'm trying to ignore that. I'm just trying to look for something for knock, knock. Uh, and... For me, it's just going to be confidence, like, come out swinging. It's what the, the region loves to do. Um, I think Elevate might play a little bit of a different style of game. Uh, I haven't seen them play in their new format, in their new roster. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, just knock, knock. Like, give it a crack. Uh, yeah. Try and cook. Do it up. 
try and cook. Uh, we all know how that one usually ends. Let's welcome in our two great interviewers, uh, Set Hawks and Guz. Boys. Interview- interviewees. Interviewers. No, 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 no. You boys were the interviewers uh, for pretty much every every major part of this broadcast. Uh, look, obviously coming up against South Asia, Southeast Asia, the discussion very much here on the desk is it is always an uphill battle. Uh Guz, do you see Knock Knock getting a you know a couple of rounds on the board? Do you see oh. them kind of getting cl- well? <laughs> I can't do, take do you that think name seriously. Close? That that's the question. Wait, take what seriously? The name? Yeah, oh, probably the not... question. Honestly, <laughs> we've had worse days. We've had worse <laughs> names. Uh, we've been doing this a long time. Um, look, I think there is a world in which defensively, at least, I'll probably be compact enough and and have enough skill to get some rounds across the line. I wouldn't be too shocked yeah. if we see that. However, I think Elevator probably spent a long time really preparing this team and getting some good fundamentals under the belt. Shed's a big factor. If he's able to come in and actually bring some some fresh ideas and energy into the team it could go well could also be a case where he doesn't mesh so i think yeah. we'll get a bit of an insight on that today yeah we've seen uh, we've seen different regions come into the uh the apac just the wider apac uh region before and some mesh some don't so i guess that's probably warranted to you know keep an eye on but xenox i feel like you might have a uh, a knock knock uh call in you what do you think ah <laughs> uh, i can knock knock joke <laughs> No, no, I'm talking about Save it like for the end round play by play, man. Yeah, like like a knock knock, who's there? Bang. Like kick nah, the door. I don't know about that. Surely. I do have I do have one knock knock joke though. Do you want it, oh, Rob? I would love it. Knock knock. Who's there? Dewey. Dewey who? Do we have to keep telling knock knock jokes? Ah! <laughs> no, we don't anymore because we do actually have to throw to the game. So boys enjoy. Oh, thank God. <laughs> that was actually one of the better throws that we've ever done together. So <laughs> honestly, well done. We get into the game. And honestly, I do agree with the desk seg- uh, sentiment, guys, which is that this is kind of that David versus Goliath matchup. We have seen time and time again when we typically get to playoffs for Asia, obviously for those on familiar that previously used to be southeast asia and south asia separately then they'd meet in the playoffs and every single time as great as south asia was looking and they'd send their best teams they'd get knocked down a peg yeah for sure so i think we're really going to see if that storyline is going to continue here for 2024 with both the game here and then the one to follow as well but yeah keep the jumping to things oregon sets the stage for an intriguing game and yeah some cool storylines for both teams jumping into it it certainly does. We've got uh, another Oregon on the board here tonight for the Asia League. And excited to see sort of what can be brought to the table. I mean, we do have to give, you know, a, a bit of hope for the likes of Knock Knock. And maybe that hope could be that Alovate might take a bit of time. New roster, you know, can they gel together quickly? It is only day one if it's going to happen. Today's the best day for the surprises to take place. For Doc Doc, it is a team that has obviously been here before and played these teams and has history at this level. And maybe the safe keepings of a map like Oregon could be actually a bit of a safe haven. Kind of looking at their qualifiers and how they got here. This was a map that was very influential. They won their 7-0 against One Stop Peaking, which is not a bad team either from the South Asian region. So clearly a map where they're going to feel quite comfortable. Um, kind of looking towards that upper bracket though, it did suggest Hasib Warriors was kind of the team out of that region that of course probably might be regarded as the one seed if you will a chance though for knock knock but it won't be in the first half with elevate on the defense first i'm fully expecting them to put and set a really really high lead in this game in the first half so the onus will be on them and an opportunity maybe for knock knock to steal an attacking round here or there yeah knock knock need to establish themselves a, a safety net for that switch of half so looking at obviously it goes without saying a minimum one round but ideally two um, attacking into oregon should be possible um, certainly not impossible at the moment, but yeah, we'll see how they go. In terms of bands, Thatcher and the Grim, Grim's a bit of an intriguing one. It does leave the Ying up, which often is banned out in general, but especially here on Oregon, because there's a lot of different strongholds where if you can get the upper hand with a Candela Flash, it can often unlock a, a critical part of the push for the attack. So we'll see if that's something that Knock Knock lean into. Defensively, it is the Solus and the Fenrir, so two very powerful defensive operas dealt with. And it does mean that the Valkyrie and the Azami will make it through. What's your expectations, though, for this, uh, I guess, stage, actually, really? I mean, we, we don't have to very overcomplicate one game. But for the stage, the fact that we're getting more games from these teams from South Asia. You've also got now Daystar from Hong Kong, who actually looked pretty good in their match. Oh, by obviously falling short. More opportunities to play 
against the Southeast Asian teams who have clearly, with time, gotten to a pretty good level. You would hope, therefore, that for Hasib Warriors and for Knock Knock, they can actually improve quite dramatically as the stage progresses. Yeah, I would imagine so. I, I, I still think that heading into it, you know, day zero slash day one at the moment, I'm finding it difficult to pitch the South Asian teams, the two that are in the league, making it into the top six. I could see a world in which it's stacked with the SEA teams top six, and then unfortunately South Asia does miss out on the bracket. I think that's a very real possibility. But it's going to come down to, as you've sort of alluded to, their ability to improve throughout the stage. I've got to say, though, they're going to have to improve quite rapidly compared to 2023 because we've already seen the likes of mm. uh, of Jalita, Daystar. They are looking pretty solid. So the onus now on Knock Knock, on Hasib Warriors to fly the flag for South Asia and prove that they deserve a spot in that bracket. We'll see if they'll be able to do that. Good opportunity. Good test as well in this opening game. Oregon, maybe a bit of a comfort pick as well. A little bit on the defense, though. Already aggressive-looking lineup when it comes to the Oryx, the Capcan. Legion to some degree as well. As we've got entry in from Sandy. Top floor, push in through Trophy, clearing out Kid Storms. Safe, smart, so far from Knock Knock. as jittery over towards Big Tower. And Haikal is also lurking in that Big Tower position. I'm expecting Elevate to really, at least out of these two teams, be the one to, at times, go for that ag aggressive punch in rounds. Hold these aggressive angles. You can see Speak Easy, top freeze the stairs. Oh, they're not really kind of just sitting on site. Elevate definitely will aim to find an opening kill or two. So the Ying is in play round one, and like I was mentioning a little bit during the ban phase, a lot of the sites and the way in which they are typically played, the Ying is so powerful in dislodging one of the defensive positions, which then has the ripple effect of weakening the rest of the defense. So it's really important here that Rattler gets himself in a position where he can utilize those Candelas, and then either himself and all the rest of the team in sync need to then play around that accordingly to help unlock the crossfires that this basement site does deliver. So for Knock Knock, it's about getting the shock drones in play initially, dealing with mirror windows if possible. That's the first job outside of the obvious hard breach, which I think they've done an okay job in at the moment. Then followed up by the Capital and the Ying in combination for that execute. They have plenty of time to prepare themselves and gain a little bit of information if needed. And we'll see them probably go for this hit in the next 20, 30 seconds. And that is expended. Still that pillar position. He's very much under lock and key for Elevate because of Van Heikal as the drone coming down from Sandy now tries to push him out of that position. Flashes as well. Drop down into E-Box. Double drop. In fact, big stack here from Knock Knock. And now actually all pushing Pillar along with that blue push too. No real contest. Oh. Eventually the swing from NA. Now obviously he has lost his life. Jittery good there. But a Capcan EDD. He's able to get at least one back up close with Bailiff. Not bad from RP. And suddenly Elevate got themselves the lead once again. Swing from E-Box is good though from Jittery. He finds two in the round. The cross, though, very strong here for Elevate. Over towards that bomb chassis position for Speakeasy to shed in towards Freezer. They don't panic. Nitro sells great from NC. The follow-up as well from Speakeasy. And suddenly, Jittery finds himself on an island and Elevate too strong on the defense. Yeah, the initial laying of the util there for the attack was not too bad. And you could see that unlocked positions like E-Box, Pillar, and they're able to work around that. Secondary hard breach on the wall. All that groundwork pretty good and Knock Knock doing a good job in that phase of the round. But then they lack that follow-up utility, whether it be, you know, Capital Bolts or, or Ying Candela's deep in towards site. And it meant that the Nitro Cells were then in play. No one on the attack had the ability or the read to go deep with the Freezer and the close closet angle being held. It had that... You know, crossfire effect goes without saying. So it's a good work there for both teams, but ultimately Elevate just a little bit more disciplined. Um, they're able to peel back that defense to the back line, and without the tools to deal with that or any uh, additional pinch with a back push from Knock Knock, uh, that was going to be a very, very difficult attack to make work. But again, positive signs for both teams round one. Yeah, I mean, I think that you could probably argue Elevate looked pretty strong all the way through there, considering the positions they still held on site were very much strong. Knock kind of went for a pretty basic E-Box drop. To be fair, though, it was somewhat successful, at least on the initial drop. The initial swing as well defensively from Elevate wasn't really strong enough from N High Kel. That's going to be a very difficult name to pronounce. I'm going to have to probably just call him N High. 
I, I, I'm sorry, but that's just what he's getting because Wait, he, he is a. Who are you saying hi to? <laughs> <laughs> You're a troll. Into the second round we go. Kid Storms here up above top floor. Uh, his basement has been won successfully by Elevate. And so for Knock Knock now over to Kid Storms. Don't change up too much. They do bring the IQ. Still Sandy on the buck. The Nitro Cells available. Three, in fact, for Elevate. Oh, whoa! Wait, what? Is that a grenade from Envy? Where did that actually come from? I suppose a double window. I guess he's uh got the lineup ready to go, and the fuse time actually optimal in getting that down. So up I now low for the remainder of the round. Nitro cell, of course, a critical piece of utility later on. It's so important that he stays alive and a good start for Knock Knock in that regard. We do see the, the defense, though, respond with Games Ball now reinforced off. And so that adds another layer for the attack to break down. They do have Ace, though, so dedicated hard breach. Some of us can deal with that quite promptly. IQ also in play, so Whoa, back to the Valkyrie discussion. There is that direct counter in play the for the attack. I think this is a really good lineup. Ninety seconds remaining in the round. Ape very low in health due to that earlier frag grenade. Be trying to open up this game's wall with the Selmas. And suddenly rotate through classroom. Main entrance push here from Knock Knock, getting themselves a bit of that first floor control. MC over towards security though. Nitro Cell thrown over to the balcony is well short of the mark. At least a little bit more emphasis on the vertical nature of this particular site from Knock Knock going down below, pushing now through Z. And Hyatt able to get the Nitro Cell kill though onto Envy. And so Elevate will find the opening kill of this round. MC has not made a sound in security, and that's a lovely little jiggle peek. MC also did get the win over towards security. Sandy won, but unfortunately the numbers for Elevate are far too strong now for beating a one versus four. 40 seconds remaining in the round now, push through Trophy, trying to just bait out some swings from these players. And Hikal too good for the SMG 11, strong holds. Over towards Attic, over towards Security. Denied any kind of games push. Across the board, Elevate. We're far too good on the defense. Yeah, that pit position as well, providing a lot of value there to the defense. Knock Knock presenting uh, far too many unfavorable 1v1s. And unlike the previous round where they got a little bit of a foothold for then the second phase of the push, you, you can sort of see around this point they're draining man count, double stack pit still from the defense, being uncontested really uh, by that attack. So. Again, good work Jagger from Elevate. Fortunately, the positive side's probably lacking a little bit more um, in that second round for Knock Knock. But we'll see how they go on the tertiary side. This is going to be the most critical objective in this match, especially for Knock Knock, because they need that wall of safety. They need that moat around them heading into the second half, and their best bet is winning this objective at least once, if not twice. So we'll see how Elevate go in dismissing that threat. They'll be eyeing off the 3 0 star. Yeah, I agree very much when it comes to Oregon. Tertiary sites are so prominent for the attacking team. Needs to be won. If they're not, then... Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a difficult ask. You imagine Elevate, if they're able to go, you know, kind of around the world once again. It's going to make life very difficult. A little spawn peak potential here from Shed. This is what Elevate is certainly capable of. These aggressive plays in your face make your life absolutely miserable. And pretty much no real surprise with the way that they're playing this. It's up to Knock Knock though to be prepared, to be ready. Drone game is good initially, getting some information there, as much as possible. And very much understanding that Enhikal is sitting over towards the classroom. Logic Bomb rings out from Envy. They go for the swing. Well, Jittery is going to win it out. Enhikal will fall. That's a good clear classroom. Good utility of the drones along with the gadget of the Logic Bomb from Envy. And that's one down. Yeah, it's a really time, uh, well timed pinch there from the attack. They get a, essentially a free kill to kick things off, and they might be able to steamroll it. Ape falls, bot Loading white stairs. Be just able to survive. No calls left. But the damage already done here. Elevate now isolated on this first floor. 
We may see an attempt to retake this position, but with dedicated flank watch in the gridlock in play, that makes it a little bit more challenging and will absorb impact grenades from the defense. So good work here from Knock Knock, but it's this phase of the round once they do the hard yards early where they have altered in the past. So we'll see what the execute is like. Speak easy with a very clean Going shot, back. though, to make things intriguing. And if he's low, no more logic bombs. And how much of that was a factor as well for them getting an opening kill. Can't play off of it now. Sandy getting low on that skeleton gear as well. The shoulder people speak easy. Does at least find some information. In towards meeting. Goes for a re-peek now. From Breach. The timing on that smoke though. It's impeccable. Basically saves that life. Sandy though with a very... Very desperate entry and Speakeasy was still in a prime position and is very much still in a good position to have an impact in this round, but they both survive. He doesn't get any downs. Jittery though towards Z. Now impacts as well for Knock Knock and Envy as well. Down to only Speakeasy and they should know exactly where he's going to be coming from. Makes a big run. They are qu all quite low on health. Spots one, but then in towards security. Envy with a long angle. And on the board, Knock knock a foul to round win. Yeah, with that execute coming through and the smoke's going uh, down, I would assume that Speakeasy's calling out that the plant is likely to be going down in that instance. And there was flank potential through Z, retake potential as well through Kitchen. Yeah. Again, maybe it's because our focus was so focused on uh, Speakeasy himself that it was difficult to understand what the other defenders were doing, but it felt like he was the only one really in a position to pressure that attack. attack and it was pretty easy when it wasn't synced up later on with the bumpy ones being sent at the attack in the post for knock knock to clean that up nicely so early uh, first signs really found this match of elevate making some fundamental flaws but it's the tertiary site far more forgivable they can return to form on the primaries maybe then tidy it up for round six again a single round probably won't be enough here for knock knock so it's an intriguing point of the game and if Knock Knock can tidy up the late round here on basement, it could again make it even more uh, interesting as we uh, head into this. Yeah, unfortunately, you're going to need to find a way to get one of these primary sites, maybe even both, if you're going to be able to take down Elevate. Tertiary site's one thing, but you give them the credit where it's due. I think the way in which they won it was honestly pretty decent. Started that round away, which they were able to Reloading! drone out, util out, a couple of players in classroom, and then eventually pushed in. Jitter with the entry in towards Big Tau. This is going to be the real big testing, though. How can they I'm take reloading. laundry and supply on Oregon against a team like Elevate? Lots of time to go for the roam here, not really. Anyone from Elevate inviting all that much pressure up above this time around. Stark contrast to the previous round in which they were you know, very much looking to deny a lot of the entry positions. Freeze the stairs, back stairs, holds, everyone else on site. So very much shaping up for an Elevate bunker on site. Not engaging in any kind of contest up above. You can see the way that beat is playing. Top floor clear as well for Knock Knock. It is that perceived pressure. The notion in which Elevate like to play aggressive. And so very much, Knock Knock still have to do the due diligence. Clear out, take their time. Envy though, well, he might skip a step or two. Default shot out as eventually it starts to be used. And Envy now has freezer stairs. This is not too bad with 90 seconds left in the round, but they're going to have to do a little bit better and faster elsewhere. Yeah, you can see the cogs turning there a little bit for Envy. He was maybe thinking about uh, sneaking past the default camera, but that will not work out. Mav in play. So a little bit more of a dated way of opening up this hatch, but it does alleviate you from having to play impact amps. Um, and, and the Thatcher is banned out, of course, so the Mavic almost required. Unless you're able to navigate that Twitch through to deal with the Electro Claws, and that has not been the case this time around. A minute to go. And the drones will now come through, so information gathered here for Knock Knock. A lot of it is going to come down to execution, timing, landing your ones, playing around the candelas and the bolts from the Capital. So we'll see how they layer this util. Attackers dropped the diffuser. Slightly different approach this time, I think. Maybe a bit more front-centric through lobby. Last time it was a very much uh, back-focused, a pillar blue. 
That said though, Rattler will rotate, so he might be the X-Factor this time around. And Jittery also goes outside Monka as well. Yeah, the E-Box drop was their primary method of entry. I had nothing from Laundry or Freeze aside. Rattler with Kendallas. That was the final one, by the way. Still 30 seconds left. Not playing off of said Kendallas. Sandy up in flames at the moment. It's beat. It's pretty much dead. Double kill, though, goes away. Knock, knock. Eventually, the trades come through. But knock, knock. We'll retake the lead in this round until eventually and high hell and lovely play from Shed as well off of that keeper barrel. A bit of a one way there in through Freezer. Rattler was getting the plant down, eventually pushed off it. And into Red type needs to basically find the kills and he cannot. As soon as Shed was able to win that battle in Freezer, that changed the entire course of the round. And Elevate will take basement again. Yeah, I think that round probably ultimately ended up a little bit more closely uh, fought and contested than I initially um, expected. We, we saw the Candelas being expended in towards Pillar and a lot of that was to try and facilitate the push through Bunker to then help the pinch um, connect from the front push uh, lobby. And said player outside Bunker was getting stalled out by those smoke babes. Um, eventually the pinch did come through. But Defender, whilst that all happened, the Jiddy was caught in the rotation. The reason he's alive last is because he's out of sync then for the rest of the push. Nina 1 versus 2, but that time left, never winning that, especially without utilities. So, again, elevates su supremacy on the primary side. So, we'll back that up once more here. And uh, go 4 from 4. And then it will set the stage for a pretty pressure inducing final round of half and knock knock. So far, been some good signs from Knock Knock. Good moments in these rounds. Unfortunately, good moments though don't get you Five wins. Seconds. And Elevate's the kind of team that can probably go to another level if absolutely required. But at the very least, for Knock Knock, these have not been super one sided rounds. I mean, the round wins for Elevate so far have actually been, you know, a bit scrappy. Knock Knock are very much forcing them to play hard. Get another opportunity on kids' dorms before a more potential opportunity awaits over towards the tertiary of kitchen meeting. Hi, Cal, over towards Armory. A bit more of that aggression here from Elevate. Just starts to sink back in after cooling off on it in that previous round. Large pressure towards Big Tower. Jittery on the repel. Just outside. And MC all the way at the top. And spots a little Holy angle no there way. onto Jittery. Takes one shot. Then on the other side, though, Sandy out in the exterior finds the kill onto MC. And somewhat similar to that classroom clear out earlier in this half. They've done it again here towards Big Tower. It's the second time that Knock Knock has been able to coordinate as a team really nicely to clear out a player. Yeah, the overaggression from Elevate now a couple of rounds comes back to bite them. Can they though rely on the late round proficiency to win out this round? Or perhaps a response to the mid round. It's end high this time to find a pick. And that is the hard breach or one of said hard breaches dealt with. So a bit of pressure now on Envy, but still two summers in pocket. So gains more position too much of a threat. There is a summer gate though, and that means that Utah will need to be sunk into that particular doorway. Otherwise, one Starmer will all but uh, be available. Sneak Easy looks to double down on that position, just provided a little bit of additional support and pressure. As we can see, Diffuser is on the balcony. So that's likely going to prompt a rotation here from Knock Knock eventually. Wall now reinforced off. All of it, happy to, to peel back and forth at that position for now. They sense that time is beginning to drain, and they will force Knock Knock into the Utah game and the Hardbridge game. Saw a couple of Rotaros available for Jittery. By but he's in a position already inadequate. He's got a good line of sight in towards Kids. What a, what a shot from Shed, though. Game sense and awareness. The way in which he peaks that angle and he gets the headshot kill. Attackers Five and one now for Shed. And suddenly with 30 seconds left in the round for Knock Knock, this is looking extremely difficult. Sandy will backfill in towards Attic. Take the position of Jittery. Rattler starts moving forward. No real options here. One though presented by Speakeasy after he got the kill onto Envy. Seconds left. 13 seconds left and an up close and high kill. Get through to Sandy and Rattler into one versus three with really no time. Despite even still having the kit, you can't really give him much of a chance here. And Elevate are going to make this a 4-1 lead here on Oregon to begin. 
Well, a fist bump from Shed. Understandably so, he confirms that round for Elevate. Four primary site attempts and four victories for the defense. So Elevate putting themselves in the box position to set up a 5-1 lead at the conclusion of the half. They do, though, need to win the tertiary side, and there were some concerning signs for them on this particular objective last time. It is once again meeting Hall Kitchen. Knock Knock went for a push through split after an initial Defenders isolation on Roma through classroom. Elevate failed to respond accordingly and pretty much fed ones in the post. So we'll see how they adjust this time around. Perhaps a greater emphasis towards that body position early on to stall it out. Looking back at the last round though, round number five, you noted that the ability of Knock Knock to actually put those Romans on arms has been really, really strong. Unfortunately, when it comes to trading out picks and finding the ground very deep into the ground, where that communication and innate synergy uh, really shines or flounders for teams in Siege, they just don't quite have that X factor going for them. No, and, and that's probably going to be where, as the stage progresses, they can continue to develop better ways in probably hitting site directly. But so far, in terms of that step one approach in team coordination and synergy to clear out particular roamers and players, yeah, they, they actually done a really good job. I give them the praise for that. They get themselves another opportunity on the tertiary site as well. And if they win this, two fours a pretty decent margin against the team in which they're playing. And they then get to go onto the defense themselves. Of course, playing from a deficit, they'd still have an opportunity though to get themselves back into the game over the overall scoreboard. But Speak Easy gets aggressive. We saw this from Elevate opening three rounds. They've played the same in the next three rounds. Tertiary site round three, super aggressive. Deny entry positions. They've done it again here, and this time Speak Easy gets the kill onto Rattler. So Elevated very much playing this kind of scripted gameplay in terms of how they want to approach these sites. This time, though, they get the benefit. Last time out, they got cleared out. Jammer activated! Yuki Auto Breacher through the window then. The sound cover potentially. Drew might be able to cook up a solo play with a flash through said window, but that's probably not ideal. Unless he's getting assistance from somewhere else, Big Tower. And that may be the case. Osa is in play in that position, so Talon Shields. Hard Breach up. Ape is in a position himself to bandit trick that wall up above, leading into Attic. <laughs> New Jammer hasn't been dealt with. Eventually is. A minute 30 on the clock and things not looking ideal here for Knock Knock. Elevate just need to keep disciplined, which they're doing at the moment. Just not give away anything for free. We'll see if this wall gets opened up. No, New Jammer. Impact EMP though in response. No easy way for Elevate to now deny that. Also speak easy back to the sandbags position. And again, groundwork done here from Knock Knock. We'll see how they go about actually pushing and putting into the site. Four Nitro Cells available for Elevate. Very much makes it far more difficult for Knock Knock, even with my Osa Talon Shield. Here's one of them from Speakeasy. Goes with that nice and early, but again, three more that can eventually come through. Attic Control as well, by the way, still there for Elevate. And so, therefore, this makes it extraordinarily difficult now for Knock Knock to really get to play down. Oh no. As soon as you enter in, you are just going to fall, meet your demise. And Heikel up above, they've also got the bandit there to make sure they can't actually open up that attic wall. Despite the fact that meeting has been breached, it doesn't really mean that you can just get the site. Envy does find a kill onto and Heikel though, the two brow has been dealt with. Jittery taking his time. Eventually flashes go out, Jittery now makes a, a big abundance of noise to push in towards kitchen, breaks that window, man's by himself. Oh, Let's get a nice little one-tap headshot onto Shed, but hasn't got kit, hasn't got time. It will be 5-1 to Elevator. Speakeasy pops up. Gets, him now, gets himself a nice little free kill. With the SMG 11. And overall, a very successful defensive half for Elevate. They get five rounds from this. Puts them in a pretty good position where all they have to now do is basically win the tertiaries. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty much job done. Really good work there in the previous round. I like the uh, the layering of the potential bandit trick there, although it never really came into fruition. Unfortunately, Knock Knock probably tried to shortcut that site a little bit too much by just opening down below. And then Jittery, who was honestly at that point in time, the only way they get back into the round. He didn't have a big order to, to take down the barricade. Had it punched the mirror window at that point into the master's position and uh, ultimately baits his team and doesn't Reloading. actually seem to push. Just makes it a little bit challenging for the two stuck that breach to really get much done. 
again, late round, knock knock, falls short. A lot of positives to take away in terms of their ability to get map control and take down roamers for the most part. That was actually quite strong. But plenty to review in terms of their, their comps and positioning late rounds. So we'll see if that improves over the course of this particular stage, but it was at least in my eyes, one of the concerns I had for them and probably the Civ Warriors as well is just that late round proficiency. So we'll track that as the stage goes by. So a long, long way to go. I'm focusing in now on the second half, as mentioned. Elevate, very strong position. Primary sides aren't must win, but I, honestly, I think in a match that should be pretty one sided, they'll be backing themselves in to do a good job to close this out in something like a 7 1 7 2 fashion. It's very easy as well on laundry and supply to kind of go into your shells. I'm kind of hoping Knock Knock won't do that. So far, positioning says they won't. Easy entry though from Ant Heikel over towards Shower. One spotted towards top white stairs. Well, Sandy just gets caught completely off guard. Probably not anticipating that he'd already be bot white. Rattler in towards security. Had no knowledge of this. Attackers have dropped the bomb diffuser. Obviously made noise i'm almost certain of it michael is very much aware and there is one inside of security so rattler now kind of just uh, in a bit of an island position if he goes for the cross he may very well die he does make a bit of noise then makes the cross he actually got the kill onto ape so talk about win-win scenario for rattler gets out of that position in security and finds a kill yeah, good Nitro Cell anticipating the pinch there up above the, the logic bomb meant that his position was revealed and he anticipated the said pinch to come through but responds well and critically gets out of that position instead of holding it. It means now that Knock Knock can fortify four players down a basement. Still a decent position to find themselves in. Again, though, nature of basement though means if there's only four defenders up, there is inherently a weakness in at least one of those points of entry. So this will see where we get to, uh, this will test elevate rather and We'll see if they're able to find that weakness, exploit it. They've got plenty of time. Hatch being worked. They have the next 30 seconds or so to drone forward, get info. Um, they have plenty of drones uh, still available for, plus any shock drones remaining. So we'll see what uh, the push is like. Speak Easy is the one with the fuser in hand, and they will center themselves around that pillar and e box drop. Under a minute remaining now for Alabate to move forward. Been a bit of a struggle for Ape, unfortunately. 1 and 6. The rest of the team, though, has been forming up to par. A bit of drone information. Only 4 remaining for Elevate as Shed goes for the rotate over towards Blue. One spotted elbow. C gets a kill on to Rattler. Elevate have got themselves an advantage and one player known on the defense in terms of his position. Double drop Epox. One over towards the killer. They win this battle. Uh, Ormish ended up shooting his teammate coming down back stairs. Nitro Cell available. 4B puts it away. Brings it back out. He's the last one alive now on the defense. Still no kills on a donut. It will remain that way as Elevator far too strong on the attack in towards the basement of Oregon. Across all angles, they had everything covered. Unfortunately for Knock Knock, they just got overwhelmed. Tactical timeout has been called by Envy, but they are in a deep hole. Five match points now for Elevate. And you can see it's quite a stark contrast in the late round between the two teams there, where I think in that position, we probably, again, probably would have seen Knock Knock Flounder. Elevate, they dedicate that double hatch drop, yet each player is sort of in sync as to what they're watching, either side of the pillar, making sure that player can't escape, that's synced with the back push down the stairs. There's also then the late pinch coming through Freezer, and that's why Beat was so afraid of the, the pinch as well late. Like, they had all their bases covered and made it very, very challenging for Knock Knock to prevent the drop. They also couldn't really play far back because of the pressure being applied from multiple angles. So just really, really good clean stuff there from Elevate. The expectation was that it's likely what we'll see, but for them to pull it off was quite nice. Again, there was that very small move there where I thought there could be a TK <laughs> potential, but again, they're, they're too good for that. Yeah, they've been too good inside of the server as well. There's been little minor elements where Knock Knock have been given praise in this match, but overwhelmingly it's just been too easy for elevate across the board defenders protect your bombs from being the same that attackers. these are the opportunities group stage day one you know, a new campaign lots still to be played lots of other teams still to play good opportunity to learn from this kind of game where you can improve, how you can improve. 
And even just being inside of the server with these Southeast Asian teams on a regular basis outside of a, a one-off playoff event in which previously no you might have only played one best of three, guys, And then you were done. Or two. And that's it. And so you've got far more of an established base, at least now within this league, that you can, with time, continue to find avenues of improvement. Five that has to, to be the mentality of the team. That they are not a finished product. And that Jackson they've got a lot to learn. To locate a bomb and it. Clearly from this game, a lot to learn indeed. Down 6-1. Tactical timeout. What have they communicated? We go to Kids Dorms. A beautiful sunset. Uh, it's 1.30 in the morning. I'm pretty sure the sun set a long time ago, Jakey, but I'll take your word. Oh, you meant... Oh, you meant... Uh -huh. Jittery, though, big tower. One of the things we praise knock on one in terms of their attack was their ability to isolate rooms like this. So we'll see if Jittery is able to hold down the line. Hasn't really got much defuser. in the way of support in manpower nor utility. So this is very much a Hail Mary play and a Hail Mary situation. And said player is off the board. That was not the best of executions, unfortunately. At least not from the defense. Elevate doing a good job to set themselves up for the 7-1 dub. You know what's interesting in the way in which Elevate kind of approached that? Is they did it very quickly. I see a lot of teams sometimes that try and clear that big tower defender really slowly. Oak and prod, they give them too much respect. Elevate just like, yeah, he's there. We'll swing double window and... Well, the, the two windows and, and just flush him out. They did it so quickly that Jittery just didn't even have really time to process the best way to defend his position. Overwhelmed. Rattler dies elsewhere, by the way. I mean, this game is essentially over. With 90 seconds left, Elevate with a two-player advantage. It's going to take something quite critical for Knock Knock to salvage this round. And I'm not sure of a closet hold. With an inward-facing mirror window to do the job. Sandy towards pit. Okay. Still a very good position here with that mirror window. That's something that can be far more impactful. And Heikal close by. But you can already see from this POV that Sandy is just under an immense amount of pressure. With the window push, with the hallway push. And Heikal does actually find a kill on NB towards closet. That hold clearly wasn't going to be good enough. Love the swing though from Sandy. Gets rid of MC. Needs to probably take this fight now. Gets himself into position to deny the next swing. If he wins it, it's suddenly a two on three with a little bit of time for Alavay. Never mind. Ape loses. Well, Ape just kills everyone. Ape gets rid of Sandy. Beat. Game over. 7 1. Beat down. A stark reality for South Asia is very much that this is not going to be an easy league. And the Asia League is still firmly going to be dominated by those of Southeast Asia. Yeah, good debut for this rejuvenated Elevate roster. They didn't have to show all too much, but the execution for the most part was clean. The only blemish was on that tertiary site. Outside of that, phenomenal work. Um, players like Shed, Macy, both having really, really good games to kick things off as well. So positive science for Elevate. And again, breathes life into that top six discussion. I'm still very much of the mindset, especially after watching that South Asia, probably 7-8 for now. However, every other team in the mix really has a lot going for them at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's never fun to see these kind of beatdowns, but I also genuinely believe there was, and I can't believe I'm still trying to, you know, pluck some kind of devil's advocacy here, some okay moments from Knock Knock. That kind of yep. says to me that if they can improve on that, if they can find ways to especially improve on their weaknesses, that they can have themselves an opportunity to avoid bottom two. That has to probably be the goal. Avoid bottom two. Yourself, Hasib, Warriors, and I guess Daystar, all three of those, that's going to be the goal for those teams. It's a long, long journey, though, in this group stage. Lots of learning opportunities, and they learn a lot from this match. 7-1 in this game to elevate. Far too strong. A great debut for the new roster. We'll go to a break. When we come back, of course, those on the desk will break this down. We still have, of course, one more match to come later on.
Um, I know my answer. Wow, so shocked. <laughs> Oh, what? <laughs> I feel dodged by Dev this. Dev copper stray. Yeah, Dev definitely copper stray. Actually, to be fair, I'll, I'll be on in five minutes, and you'll yeah. be on in like. Five yeah. minutes. Oh, actually, no, that's true. That is true. I am. <laughs> First frag. Yeah. Oh, that's actually really good. That's actually really good. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I've seen this guy farm a little bit. I've seen this guy farm a little bit. I went wrong. What? I went, yeah. what? I that's wrong. what I'm talking about, what? baby. Big dog. Big dog. Come on. Yeah. Thank you. Why did he? Why did he listen? I'm on drones. I figured you'd be just spawn picking. I'm on drones. He doesn't know how to get. So it, what happens oh, is and there's a someone <laughs> drones someone into the building, and the other yeah. player is an entry. It right? was who that's gets the, the first pick, not who gets picked. Not first. who watches yeah. it on a drone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, well, this might be a controversial take. I don't know. Only if I'm on drones can this person pull this off. Wow. Absolute <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> Yeah, hey, uh, let's go. go. I, uh, I really have just True. continued to just <laughs> you, know, you, are, the room. you are just you I, haven't played enough with this. The thing is, mate. Rob doesn't want to work together with anyone. No, I just want to run in and find as many heads as I can. We so. play it like another game that I shan't say. This is a tough one. I mean, it's not like you can't, you can't really kill yourself with nades anymore. You you can't. I've seen it. Well, you might if I haven't. Really I just picked the I just picked the worst. It's the most. That's what I'm doing as well. It's the most. Obvious. He already knows. He already obvious. knows. Let's turn. Yep. <laughs> Is that a first five out of five? Yeah. That's <laughs> a five out of five. Well, well done, done mate. Mother. Should be proud of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this one's. This tough. is actually tall. I, I know who I'm going. Okay, I have a story for this one. Come on, Amanda. Oh, oh she's a story. Oh! oh. Wait, what? Yeah. Wait, I have had say, to um... call both of you to get on an Asian show. Oh, <laughs> yes! That is true. That is true. I remember and, that. And then I called both of them over and over and over. Laura woke and me so, up and was yes. like, why is Mandy calling yeah. you over and over? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know why. And then I like, clicked in two seconds later. I was like, oh, I've got a broadcast. <laughs> like, now. <laughs> Um, oh, like I, I've got, actually got a good one here. Um, I've got a good one, and I want to. I want to see what everyone else says. Three, oh no! Two, this is a five out of five. One, Dev. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, not his fault. Most of the time, his luggage gets lost. Oh, yeah. Not yeah. due to his. Also, his um, issue. my shoes were stolen from my hotel room in Brazil, and I've never got them back. So. Are you barefoot right now? Yes, I don't actually own any shoes anymore. Um, get, and the, get the grippers out. Yeah, I've. This is an easy one. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is an easy one. <laughs> this is easy. Flip it over. Three, two, one. Yeah. There is a reason. Yeah. yeah. There's no, a reason. That, that is, that is bull. bull. It's there's, not look, there's a reason we call him the content. It's not because he's good at content. It's because he creates. Sorry, did I write guys? I meant to write me. Oh, oh well, that was really good. Uh -huh. Good segue. Did I make a mistake? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for watching Talent Drama. We will see you after the break. Well, it's a one in three chance. Thanks. <laughs> is that how this works? Is it? So, I thought there was. Yeah, one of us should at least get it right. I have no idea. This is just a guess. Because I, I, I actually don't know. I, I did not play any of the Rainbow Six games outside of. Alright. Ready? Siege. Someone's got it right. Three, two, one. Who got it right? <laughs> Yay! It's not a question I'm answering. Shit. I played a bit of Maestro recently, but I feel like I'm getting this wrong. <laughs> how? Could you get this wrong? I have no this idea. This is the. This is such an easy question. Ready? Three, two, one. Oh, I did 85. Did you say 85? Did you say it's 80? <laughs> Perfect. 80. Well, actually, See? there's 80 in the magazine. It's 81. One in the chamber. Yeah. So, That's what threw me off. Yeah, one in the chamber. Can't forget about the is one in the chamber. Is that why you typed in 81? I did 85. 85. Yeah, interesting. But not 86. Which was actually 81. also wrong. Could you imagine 180? Who is the dumbest opera? You don't even need to give me the multiple <laughs> choice, man. I know this one. Yeah. Uh, How do you not know this? Do you, you know, should be do doing you not know this one? Do you, do you not know this one? No. Some of us respect one. the law. Really? Could you explain why he's the youngest? Not because he was born after the <laughs> Stop looking at Maggie's homework. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Ready? Three, Three two, two, one. one. Electric cow. Or E, as we call it. Because there is technically a bomb site immediately adjacent. Oh, my. oh I know this one. I no Done! Of course no. right there. Easy. I saw Rob's answer. I, I can't don't wait to see how, how he reacts when he finds out that he's wrong. Easy. Three, two, Easy. one. Don't overthink it, guys. It's 30. Uh, 30 plus one. Ah! <laughs> that is not true. It is 30 because there is 30 in Ladies the bag. Ladies and gentlemen, the chamber. Ladies and like, gentlemen, you see this That's right wrong. Here. 30 plus three. one. What's 30 plus one? 30 we are one. being trolled by Mr. I'm going to dox him right now in the content. See, you guys are rookie if you don't know this. I actually have no idea. Ready? Wait. Oh, you want to yeah. cheat my homework? There you go. Ready? Three, two, one. Five. Four, five. five. Yeah! Don't ever cheat off wrong. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, if you actually, if you get this wrong, I'm just there. going with logic here. I don't, yes. know, I don't actually. No, no, no. Logic. He's an operator. He's a player. He's got... There is one operator that has something really long and shiny. <laughs> <laughs> what? Jesus. Oh, Ready? Three, two, one. Kai. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did we all run game? Yeah, we all run game. <laughs> Thanks for watching Big Brain 6 Quiz. Gus sat down just to come back and look down the barrel. Thank you. Thanks. Talent drama, take one. All right, when we, when we this is a really tough call. I'm actually not quite sure about this one. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna have to think for a really long time. Um, I know my answer. Wow, so shocked. <laughs> Oi! Oh, what's I feel dogged what by Dev this. Copper stray. Yeah, yeah, Dev, Dev copper stray. Yeah, Dev's copper Actually, to be fair, I'll, I'll be on in five minutes and yeah. you'll be on in like five minutes. Oh, actually, no, that's true, that is true. I am. First frag. Actually. I don't know, I've seen this guy farm a little bit. I've seen this guy farm a little bit. I went wrong. What? I yeah, went, what? I that's what I'm talking about, what? baby. Big dog. Big dog. Come on. Uh, yeah, he, thank you. Why, why, did he, why did he listen? I'm on drones. I figured you'd be just horn picking or something. I'm on drones. He doesn't know how to get. So it, what happens oh, is and there's a, someone <laughs> drones someone into the building, and the other yeah. player is an entry. It right? was who that's gets the, the first pick, not who gets picked. Not first. who watches yeah. it on a drone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, this might be a controversial take. I don't know. Only if I'm on drones can this person pull this off. Wow. Absolute bullshit. Yeah! Hey, yo! Uh, let's yeah, go! Yeah, yeah. I really have just True. continued to just <laughs> not read you the are, room. You are just... You I, haven't played enough with this, The thing is, mate. Rob doesn't want to work together with anyone. No, I just want to run in and find as many heads as I can. We so. play it like another game that I shan't say. This is a tough one. I mean, it's not like you can't, you can't really kill yourself with nades anymore. You, you can, I've seen it. Well, you buy it if I haven't. I just picked the I just picked the worst. The That's, what the well. That's what I've done as well. It's the most obvious. He already knows. It's the most he obvious. already knows. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Is that a first five out of five? Yeah. That's <laughs> a first five out of five. Well, well done, done brother. Should be proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this one's. Tough. This is actually tall. I, I know who I'm going. I have a story for this one. Come on, Amanda. Oh, oh she's a story. Oh! oh. oh. Wait, what? Yeah. Wait, I have had to that? call um. both of you to get on an Asian show. Oh, oh, yes! Yeah. That is true. That is true. I remember and, that. And then I called both of them over and over and over. Laura woke and me so, up and was like, yes. why is Mandy calling yeah. you over and over? Yes. And I was like, I don't know why. And then I like, clicked in two seconds later. I was like, oh, I've got a broadcast. I was like, now. <laughs> This might be a little toxic, but the last question we had there on the talent drama was most likely to lose. Um, do I dare? Uh, do I dare keep going with this bit, Mandy, or do you think we move away from it? We move away from it. Let's We're good. It, We're we? solid. Let's, 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 let's move away from it. Uh, look, uh, unbelievable performance from Elevate uh, to kickstart things here, Dev. That really. I guess that sets the tone for the rest of the stage, particularly more so for, for Knock Knock. We know that Elevate is a competitive team, but uh, is this worrying? For Knock Knock? Yeah, it's it's a bit of a worry, but you can always see them bounce back. We saw it in the South Asia League last year, like teams went all over the place. Like one week they'd be phenomenal, the next week they'd be finding their feet again. And of course, back when these guys were um, 
were the the old roster that they were last year. Like, it had great moments, but they also had pretty pitiful ones as well. Mm. And so I think really this tells us a lot more about Elevate because, yeah, we knew that they were going to be a solid team in theory, but we hadn't seen them play. But imports are uh, very much a new fit, and they're probably gunning for the top spot rather than just the top four ish where they were last year. Yeah. Uh, and so, I don't know. I, I want to have a bit of confidence in them after seeing them today. Sure. Well, uh, let's uh, speak to someone who thought it was a little easy, shall we? Speak easy. Lovely to see you, my friend. It's been a hot minute. I hope things are going well, but I'm going to kickstart with a super simple question here just to set the tone. How do you feel like the team's come together to perform today? Because this has been a, a, a very dominant win. Well, um, we do what we did in practice and nothing more, nothing less. Which I guess it works out well for us. It's uh, quite an advantage to start on defense. You know, we can set the tempo, um, how we want to play. So all these uh, victories so far, all the rounds that we get, you know, actually is is what we do in practice. So like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you look pretty chill after that win. Like, not quite what you guys looked like in uh, in Tokoname when you're like jumping up. Like, where's the energy, man? Come on, get up. Well, it's only the first game, so you know, there's a lot more to go. Well, I do have a good question for you. Hopefully, it's a good one. Uh, so, obviously, huge roster changes for you guys this year. Maybe last year, especially the second half, not quite what you were looking for. Big pickups though. MC Shed over from EU. Uh, and also N. Heichel, I believe is how you say his name. Uh, a, yes, a bit correct. of an unknown pickup for us. So can you talk us through the, the roster and how it's been going in practice and how you first... All right. Um, well, knowing after stage two, we need to make a massive change. Like, we can't stick with, with what we have. And especially, like, we are always chasing, like, what's the meta, you know? So um, what we have was, why not bring someone from EU who has more experience with screams and practice and whatnot and um i think those two pickups with um chat and mc uh, really help us with sort of like bridging the gap of what we have in apec and what we have in eu so far well for and heikel he's what we call a rank star so <laughs> um, <laughs> see a lots of potential um, in him and that's why we gave him a chance i think he only turned eight, he only turned 18 like this much so no, he's still got lots to prove and he's still have also lots to learn. So, yeah. It's really exciting roster that you guys have managed to put together. My question for you is, you guys haven't been together for all that long. As a five, what is your realistic expectations for the roster? Do you think you're going to be able to take it to the likes of Fury and Bleed when it comes to it? Well, of course, we always expect high, high, the highest. Um, with this new team, we, I would say... Not qualifying is actually a failure. So yeah, that's that's our wow. goal, and we're gonna stand damn. on that. Yeah, god damn, that's a that's a huge goal. I mean, that's you know, given the uh, changes that have been made, that's a, certainly something that's very like that's a very firm goal, right? Like you've got your vision in mind, which is uh, incredible for us to know. But we always do this speak easy. I'm sure you're used to this by now. But would you like to say anything <laughs> before we let you go? Well, thanks for uh, thank you guys for the support, all the fans, and can I give you one joke, guys? Please, please. Uh, knock, knock. Who's there? Split theory, baby. See you on the next <laughs> <you> tomorrow, guys. <laughs> Ciao, mate. Split theory, who? Wait, split theory, what? Hang on a second, we haven't finished the joke. What is split hey, theory? God. Someone, we're in APAC. We don't please. know split theory here, man. Explain to me what split theory is. Sorry. Please explain. Well, technically, Michael we just got go EU'd on. on. Yeah, we, uh, we we really just got EU'd <laughs> on. Uh, but Dev, it sounds like from both accounts of the interviews we've had uh, with Diewolves, now with Elevate, Joe, and now with uh, you know the new pickup for Elevate, what what it feels like is we're starting to foster that next generation of the the great Siege players. Yeah. Everyone's looking at Fury and they're like, guys, we need our own crit J. Can we find a crit J? <laughs> like, is there one in Singapore? Maybe N. Heichel is the crit J for Singapore. Uh, no, that was actually a phenomenal interview from Speakeasy. He really does speak pretty easily. And he gave us a lot of good insight into like how the Ross is forming. It does blow me away that like for him, anything other than qualification is a failure. Yeah, they made the Copenhagen Major as the second seed last year, but we're down to just one major spot for the entire of Asia, where realistically, I reckon, I mean, if Elevate is to be believed, 
There's Elevate, Bleed, and of course Fury. That's at least three very solid teams. On top of that, like Jolita, I wouldn't put it past. Who knows if Direwolves can fire up? Like, this is going to be a super competitive region. It is criminal that there's only one spot to fight over. Yeah, and you know, who knows what Daystar is going to be up and down. I'm just going to ride Daystar for the rest <laughs> of the stage. You're an care. ED simp. I am. I am the biggest ED sim. Whenever, whenever I build a connection with someone over a gaming chair, it's all over. Let's go ahead and talk about the final match of the night. Well, you know, before we do that, just kind of recap. It's probably important to recap where things have come from. Uh, again, you come into these stages really having a, a decent idea as to what to expect, but given turnaround times, given the, the the time frame of SI to you know stage one, all the quals in between, all the preseason tournaments, really you come into these with an open mind and i think that some questions have been answered tonight some are very much left to be desired but speaking of well desiring uh it doesn't get much better than bleed for asia right now you know fury obviously making three international events last year was very exciting the bleed are really the new team uh in this region that have just blown us away mandy and they go up against sib warriors i mean is is this First versus eighth seed? Um, I think you could certainly make a case that this is first versus eighth seed. Yeah, um, Hasib Warriors unfortunately had the same fate as the Knock Knock team as well, and they have not beaten a Southeast Asian team throughout the entirety of 2023 or since the conception of the new Blast format. So this is their chance to have a crack and prove themselves, but against Bleed Esports, it's pretty tough. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely a, uh, a tall order. You're looking at... <sighs> Dev, would it be as bold to say that this might be one of the best rosters we've seen in Asia? Yes. Like, ever? Ever. Oh, maybe. Maybe. I mean, I guess if you look at their international history, uh, obviously they debuted on the global stage in Atlanta. Uh, which was already a bit of a strange one because everyone expected them to go to Copenhagen and then they came third locally. They came second. They still lost to Fury uh, in uh, in stage two, but of, of course they uh, they went to Atlanta. They got top 11, which is insane, like top nine to 11. And then they backed it up in Sao Paulo at SI with top nine to 12, which yep. is just unreal. Like I think right, like in the current era, it's these guys in Bliss, the two best teams in APAC, and that's not sure. even a conversation, right? No, uh, no. But are they, like, one of the best ever in Asia? Maybe, like, I don't know. I'm thinking back to, like, the old Elevate team, that old Airwolf team. Are you just counting, like, SEA Asia, or are we counting Japan and I, Korea I did, well? I did open up to, like, when, when I originally asked the question, I was kind of thinking more broadly, but I guess, like, to, to keep it more niche and to keep the conversation relevant to this league, we could, yeah, definitely just keep it Southeast Asia, South well, Asia. You know what? I'll put it like this. They've gone from third place in Stage 1 last year, second place in Stage 2. Fury are the big dogs that they can't seem to beat. If they can continue this upward trajectory with Julio world champion coaching staff on yep. their mix. If they can continue that, go first place back to back this year, then yeah, this is probably the best run we've ever seen from a single team. So it's like, it's pretty exciting, I think, is is probably the, just the most basic way I can put it to, to see a roster like this. And I think what kind of caps it off, this is probably just like more of a personal anecdote than anything, but watching them perform at SI, watching their comebacks in person, watching the calm, uh, calm arrogance about them. Like, it's really, really interesting. You got Turd and Reaps, who are, you know, just such interesting characters to watch compete with a, a, a solid foundation like Mentalist. It is one of the more interesting rosters to watch interact in person. So, I truly am excited to see what they do for the rest of the stage, but they do have to get past their first hurdle. Might not be a hurdle, might be more of a toothpick, but we will start talking about their competitors for tonight. The Civ Warriors a roster that probably in this, in the realm of this conversation is going to be uh, definitely on the latter end of receiving the compliments, unfortunately. Uh, but Mandy, still in their own right, we have seen this roster uh, perform in the past. Again, seeing these individuals kind of show up through and through over the last four or five years. They haven't gone anywhere, they're still here. Are they going to be able to compete against the best today? Uh, the best today is a pretty tough best, unfortunately, for these guys, and I think it's going to be quite a tall order. Um, yes, we have seen them come up through uh, South Asia. They have consistently been at the top of the top two of South Asia, but 
their attempts to break into SCA have been pretty much not impossible in the past year, and yeah. I don't really see it being broken tonight either, but there is opportunity that the league has presented itself for. Well, it's, you know, I, I guess get it out of the way nice and early, Dev. Get, get something under your belt, and... It... It really is a free jab, you know. I really I don't like talking about uh, any kind of game in particular uh, with such, uh, I guess, heavy favoring. But really, to do to to not do so would be an injustice to what Bleed have achieved over the last six to twelve months. So, you know, a free jab. Uh, will they be able to do any damage? Will they be able to make the champs bleed? I really highly doubt uh, that we will see that. But let's get into the ban phase. Let's go ahead and see where we're going to be going again. I think if we can keep it standard, they might be able to get something going. Uh, if we see something a little bit more complicated, a little bit more interesting, are we going to see a border? Are we about Ooh. to see a... Oh, oh shit. <laughs> wow. Okay. Right. Uh, well, I guess the last two maps, it didn't matter which way we went, Deb. This was going to be something... I'm not going to say unprecedented or anything like that, but this is going to be a very interesting start to this league. Yeah. Uh, a couple of notes here. So actually... Believe it or not, both teams are actually on losing streaks on border. So if you look back at Bleed's <laughs> results, they lost to a little old team called W7M, now Furia. They lost to Sorry. a team called Space Station and a team called Cyclops. So like three performances at Majors slash SIs where they lost on border, but still took some rounds off some pretty damn good teams. Hmm. The one on Cyclops is a bit of a surprise to me because Bleed did beat Cyclops in the series. Uh, as for Hasib Warriors, like a 7-8 loss against Knock Knock, so still a valiant effort, and then a 5-7 loss against GG Go Next. So, in I was up. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> not exactly comparable losses, I would say. Like, oh, Bleed definitely... Know. Bleed are definitely like the team where you're like, okay, those losses make sense. Uh, but the biggest red flag isn't even about border for me, Rob. It's about the fact that the last time these teams played each other, which was back in September, it was a 2-0 in favor of Bleed. 7-1. 7-4. I don't think that Hasib uh, are going to be able to achieve a lot more than that. I just, I really think it's important to contextualize. GG Go Next is the next W7M. Um, so just, <laughs> Sorry, you, yeah, my bad. You really, like, you just, you're not putting the respect to the name uh, that it deserves. But Mandy, the, the, I don't even know if the context, even if it had been the other way around, uh, was going to be an exciting uh you know, an exciting headline for Hasib Warriors. It is very much a, a difficult game to come out in and, and try to upset even, again, like I said before, even free jabs, you know, making them bleed would be incredible. Uh, um, that's not even a pun. That's literally... Yeah, it is. Just... And you said it twice now in one second. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but it's, it, the worst part is I didn't even realize I did it the first time and I only realized the second time <laughs> after I said the word. Uh, but genuinely, I mean, what... what What's the pass mark here? Like, is is there a pass mark? Is this just get um, into the server and, and get the experience mm, under your belt? That's a good question. I would say the pass mark is to look competitive in the round. Mm. Not necessarily to win the round, but even just look competitive in the round and actually, like, put a fight to it. Like, you know, the way I see it is, like, if you're Hissy Boris and you're trying to improve, right, you want to go in these rounds, you're probably going to get smashed by these guys. But if you're there and you're at least trying to stay calm under the pressure and trying to make good decisions and just relax in that in that way where you know you can improve, then, like, look, to me, that's the pass mark, you know. Even if they get smashed in the gunfight at the end of the day, I think if they can take it as a learning, learning experience, then I think it's good. Dev, uh, it looks like we do have, you know, a couple of minutes at the very least to, to have a bit of a chat here. So we could probably open this up a little more broadly and turn it into a podcast. We can we can drop the shade for a second. And I got and, a question and... for you. Oh, please. I Look, I love it. Right. I love it when you ask me questions. I, it's totally changing the topic, but just what, what you Go said before it. got me thinking. Like, best, like, APAC teams <laughs> in all time. Like, oh, God, here we do go. Do we wow. currently have any wow. still what standing? Started, like Rob? <laughs> I know. You, sta terrible. you started this and I just can't start. And also, like, we had an interview with Speakeasy and I was just thinking about when he was on Aerowolf and they yeah. beat Giants at uh, at Tokoname. So, yeah. like, I'll bleed and bliss in their current form. Like, some of the best of all time that we've seen out of eight. You know, I'll, I'll 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 put my two cents in, and then I want to hear from Mandy because this is a this is a uh, an interesting discussion. I think primarily on where Siege is at right now, I would actually argue one hundred percent they are the two uh, best performing APAC teams in my in my head. You know that that's probably going to 
uh, piss off some old Fnatic fans, you know, some old Nororengo fans, even some old uh, Cyclops fans, you know, like that's really going back. And if you're a fan of D+, yeah, well, eh, you know, I love I love my homies, but I feel like they were kind of on the edge of that discussion point. I feel like they never broke into it back in 2021, 2022. D plus maybe just for their their kind of performance they had internationally. But again, when you go back to the consistency conversation, it's been very interesting. I do genuinely believe that we are in the greatest evolution of South APAC siege that we've seen for a long minute. And this have to exclude Japan and Korea. I am I am excluded. Including them entirely, my own the only love I have in 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 North APAC right now is for Scars, and that's just on the back of seeing a what couple talent, of good performances. Man. Look, yes, this is domestic, okay, Fabian. You can come at me, but when I see them go international, then I'll get excited. Mandy, I do genuinely believe yeah. that this these the two teams that have been. Uh, proposed here. I, I think Bliss has still got a fair way to go, but I think that these two are in contention for the best South APAC teams, maybe even the, just the best wider APAC teams we've ever had. I think in the context of like the modern, more modern era of Siege, I, mm. I suppose so. I feel like they could make the argument for that. I think it's hard to like make the argument against the competitive competitiveness of the combined regions. Like previously we had Australia and our Southeast Asia compete together in the same league in APAC yeah. South. I felt like in that era, it was a lot easier to measure the two regions against each other and then actually go and get a grip on, you know, how competitive things were. And sure. I felt personally when we were in that APAC South era that all eight teams were competing for that major spot. I'm pretty mm. sure the major spots, every stage were com- coming down to like the last final play day, every the time. stars aligned and then the team would go Five to the major, guys. right? Yeah. yeah, that type yeah. of thing, right? So I think it's hard to make a call on who the best team is at the moment because of how sure. top heavy the regions have become. Yeah. but. Yeah, I suppose so. If you want to say in the most dominant teams now of APAC, then I would say then yes, Bleed and Team Bliss are probably up there as the more dominant teams yeah, that we've seen in a long time. What what I found interesting, Dev, was uh, speaking to like obviously uh, you know going to an international event. My first time was very different because I actually got to speak to players face to face. I got to ask them genuine questions, and I, I was asking them, you know, like kind of taking the piss as I have done in the past. I don't know, shock horror me. Um, I was asking them like genuinely going up against Bliss or Bleed, what they thought of it, and each and every opponent they had didn't matter whether it was G two, didn't matter if it was from their own region, if it was Fury. Each team kind of said, yeah. The, like they are serious contenders. We actually have to be careful playing these teams. And I feel like that tone has genuinely changed thanks to the likes of these two teams. Yeah, 100%. And I'll, I'll tell you right now, like it all happened in Atlanta because in Copenhagen, mm. a, a, I think Copenhagen was like peak APAC 8, if I can say that, like in the wider community, yeah. uh, like because it was the first time that APAC had that many slots to majors. And I will just say, let's not forget it was playing spots like yeah you've got North Epson and all these guys that like maybe not La Vega maybe not like top 20 in the world but yeah they are top three in Japan and Korea and for all kinds of reasons Japan and Korea get more spots than Asia and potentially OS arguably a better region like I think Asia's really the strongest part of APAC at the moment agreed um but yeah like that was like the peak point where everyone was like these guys aren't winning any rounds like particularly the really struggled yeah. Um, and then we only had Scars do well that event out of APAC. Mm-hmm. Come to Atlanta, Scars actually were, were kind of average in Atlanta, but it was yeah. it was just Bleed and, and Bliss like farming. And Bleed ended up being the best team that event. Fury also had a really strong go. They were like one round off of knocking out Dark Zero, uh, you know. Uh, and then come to SI, Bliss and Bleed, and Fury to some degree step up again. So, yeah. yeah, we've definitely seen a shift. And I think if you ask those same players that you were talking to at SI back in Copenhagen, you wouldn't have the same level of respect. That I, I can tell you from some experience I had with international players, you know, <laughs> big, big names from North America, yeah. big names from Europe, they didn't give any credence to APAC teams. And to be fair, like, there was only one APAC team back then that was actually a decent match. Times have changed, and we've got to get with it. And uh, anyone who doesn't is going to be left at the dust by a team like Bleed. So it seems worries yeah. better be ready. Yeah, it, 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 it's always been an interesting conversation in APAC, especially when you speak to international teams. Uh, and I, I guess we are getting uh, a little more hopeful. We're getting a little bit closer. Um, now, we are going to go to break. I need to preface this for everyone at home. We are actually waiting for a player to join the lobby. Now, you know, what's happening right now? We'll wait and see. Uh, but I, 
I just want to take this moment. I I was never on Asia League last year, and I need I need to feel like I, this needs to be said. You gotta start rocking up in the server on game day at game time. You are wasting viewers' time. You're wasting your time. You're wasting other teams' Go time. In. You mm-hmm. need to perform better because South Asia have constantly been second best to Southeast Asia. They've always been the bridesmaid. I'm not saying this is the exact reason why, but we've we got to expect better from these teams we have to get better as a region and this kind of stuff will just continue to keep us down uh anchored at the weight but uh anyway look that's my uh segment done we're going to go to a short break and on the other side we pray to god that there's a game never mind never mind i just got calmed never mind never mind anyway. he's good he's in we're not going to a break now so Woo! After after that conversation, uh, looks like we're good to go. But it's still bloody valid. Get in, get done, get ready. If your game is at nine o'clock, be prepared to be in the server at eight o'clock. My goodness! But Dev, it does make us a little bit excited because obviously we get to see these last two teams yeah. compete, and it's really second, this is inc- yeah. Go shoot, shoot. For for a second, I thought we we're going to see zero rounds, but now we're lucky. We get to see seven. Sorry, I uh-huh. actually couldn't hear. Then give me, give me one more. Give me, give me that one more. I said time. for for a second we weren't going to see any rounds, and now we're lucky we get to see seven. Well, uh, I think that's all we're going to get. Now uh, let's speed run this baby and get into the server. Wait, I mean, so, sorry, I just. Sorry, <laughs> I, oh, we're actually going into the game. Oh, I forgot we had one more game for a second there. I thought these guys were uh, doing a little podcast. I was enjoying it too. I was. I'm going to say and echo what Rob has said. And you know what's funny about it too, guys? Because Rob obviously didn't work Asia League last year. I basically already made the exact same statement last year about South Asia and joining the server and being prompt and being on time and being professional. So I need to say it again. Guys, there's more than just you guys in the server. There is admins, there is casters, there is tournament operators, there is so many people. Just do the one thing you need to do and be in the server, please. Haseeb Warriors have finally made their way in. We can get the final game of the night underway. Bleeder Esports are going to be on the defense first. What's interesting about the map choice, guys, I was having a very quick look at it earlier where the map veto was obviously taking place. Border has actually not been a good map at all for Haseeb Warriors. They banned it out in the qualifiers. Then they eventually had it selected against them as it was a best of three. It was selected pretty early and they lost that map to Knock Knock. Uh, ultimately ended up winning that particular series. But it has been a map in which, yeah, as James pointed out earlier, obviously they have not been winning. So I'm a little surprised that they've allowed this through. Bleed will be very content with this. And I would imagine with the nature of this map as well, Bleed, quite honestly should be winning this like 7-1, 7-2 territory. That's just simply based on the mechanics in which Bleed are able to employ. They've got the Defenders experience and they should very much well be able to outfrag a team that has well clearly struggled on this particular map. Now I kid you not, this, this could be the moment Throwing where the gap between end of the last game and the conclusion of this one, or, or the gap between, sorry, the conclusion of the last game and the beginning of this one, so the, the break between the games, is actually longer than the game itself. I am expecting Bleed to absolutely wipe the floor in this game. This should be 7-0 in an ideal world. They speed run it. This game could be over before the, 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 the duration break. I would not be surprised if it's a 30 minute game. It will beat that. So let's see what Bleed can bring. I'm sure they'll be a little bit tilted. They've had to wait so long to get into this game and they will want it over in a jiffy. Um, unfortunately, I suppose in some respects, the initiative has to be shown here by his warriors on attack. So that may slow down the pacing a little bit. But expecting Bleed to aggress on the fringe of this map and prevent anybody from stepping foot inside the building. Mine activated. Does there come pressure though if you bleed esports? Like, I mean, quite literally, the entire R6 community is expecting, and I, and I say probably a hundred percent. Even the the bravest of all South Asia fans would say bleed uh, the team that should be winning this game. With that comes a level of well apprehension in terms of your performance, running around with your iron sights. Probably says it all. Reaps holding as well on the tube rail at that Montang. I think these guys are, are more than good when it comes to their mental fortitude, although Holman gets obviously outdone. Stop waiting. Beat up from down below. 
Other one was far too concerned about the Montank push over towards Stomp. He's dead and eventually loses his life. Not a bad start for Hasib Warriors. Lead over the last six or so months are a team that just don't really get mentally chalked. Maybe the first iteration of this roster, stage one last year, sure, but Doctor would kill on to Mentalist. Well, this is the dream start for Hasib Warriors. Reef's still very much waiting for that top East stairs push. It has not come through outside the Montag, which eventually has now got control of that area. Stand still, Reefs. Tess tries trying to give you a bit of a helping hand. Drone can't get shot out, and so far, this is just so chaotic. Logic Bombs obviously ringing around the map, and a lovely little peek out from Aspi. Might just bring the round back into control. But trades continue elsewhere. As Reeves are able to win, obviously, top medal. Hasib got one elsewhere. Three versus two now, with over a minute remaining, and still needing to deal with the Montag. Yeah, it's been a very, very fluid round for both teams at the moment. The bleed on the back forward facing the Monty. Maybe they can try and isolate other picks, though. Hasib taken low. Reeves DMR, so one more shot. We'll drop the Flores. But unfortunately, he is slain. So good swing, and now turn in 1v3. This is actually a really good start from Hasib Warriors. Bleed on the defense. So pushed out, so aggressive, so far off sight. Trying to get into the base of Hasib Warriors, and they've lost every single engagement. Turd, though, doesn't lose his Montank dealt with. But the plank going down from Vinny. Flashes. Both are quite low. This is actually extremely winnable for Turdster, even with still the plant having just gone down. Can he find a way to style on them? Jiggle Peak still on the diffuser. So he's got information. Flash knows he's close then, top metal. Should have information as to the whereabouts now of both players and what he needs to do. But a little push in might catch him off guard. More tag on to Dinny. Still expecting that player maybe to be close left. You can see the way he's peeking it. And Hasib wants peace, was able to get into a new position. Catching Turd off guard. Dream start for Hasib Warriors. It doesn't really get much better than that. Good early pressure in the round. Able to pick away at the bleed defense initially. And then I think they did a really good job playing around the Monty late. Um, punishing Reaps was a, a really, really good peek because he was obviously eager to try and get that Monty on an island. Narrative then flipped quite quickly, 1v3, and the Monty just feeding that information to the rest of the attack, which pivoted to the easiest point of entry with the least attack resistance with that last defender so deep towards Archives. So, good work from Hasid. And they've silenced me. My bold predictor, a 7 0. I think I might have also said a 7 1. There's still a possibility, but nonetheless, good start for this. Yeah, I mean, great start. It's a difficult site to win as well on border. Obviously, the way in which Bleed did actually play it to me actually was quite disrespectful, largely offside. Super aggressive hold towards that poppy stairs. They got sucked into that one thing, I felt like. As soon as they saw the monster push, they, I would imagine, it anticipated a pretty one-dimensional kind of attack from Hasib. Okay, it's a Montang. Top East stairs, huge priority. Redux makes an entry passport, gets killed through towards top laning. Something that probably caught Bleed off guard, and then with that, it snowballed. Now, it is group stage. These are essentially glorified seeding matches for the most part. But a win for Hasib Warriors, even at this portion of the tournament, would be such a monumental one. Even if it doesn't necessarily result in you going to a major or putting yourself forward into the playoffs, this would still be a massive statement for the South Asia region. Hasib Warriors are the top team from the region for a reason, and they will be more than capable of backing themselves in to be able to get the job done in this particular stage. Hovind does get that trade onto Hasib once piece, who's had a great game so far at the three kills, but he will have to sit this one out. No floor is available now for the remainder of this round. Four versus four. I just wonder as the game progresses, Bleed might just start to be taking this Hasib Warriors team quite seriously. Close left, barricade breakdown. Underway, Taha will get the shield back up though on the Montang. Shots coming out. Yellow ping as Aspi wants to get once again aggressive here, but the Montang will make it difficult. Yeah, they got to deal with the Monty. I mean, the entire... Uh, what is Rich doing? I mean, the entire composition with the trap heavy is to try and uh, counter the Monty. And Mentalist is, yeah, obviously dead now, so with that Legion of Fortnite, some health and the Oryx is available! Oh! They combine and ask for good for two. Really, really combina good combination there with the lead. And Sib, though, have half the round to pick themselves back up. Yeah, I mean, again, this is perfect for Hasib Warriors. You're playing on border, you want these scrappy fights. Bleed are giving it to you. They're not seeding sight. That's fine. 
will happily take these fights, says his warriors. Edox and Doctor now in the two versus two against Turd and Asfi. Asfi's done well to at least bring this round back. Bloodstone's going to work, though. An information that can now be relayed to the remainder of the team that can sit these particular cameras that do get hacked. 60 seconds left. Plenty of time for Zedox and Doctor. I'll tell you what, you win this round. Could be some very early alarm bells ringing for bleed. Rotate successful for Doctor to go and grab this kit. Outside on the exterior balcony. A little bit of information heard, I believe, maybe heard down below. Obviously, sight elsewhere though and now they start to head there Zedox has actually dropped into bathroom has been watched though on the bulletproof camera and now 30 seconds remaining it's all about the retake potentially nicely done from Aspi close right Zedox aware of this kit on the floor momentarily picked back up he taps it once just to see if anyone wants to peek it out still has got just under 20 seconds goes again a second time still no response though Turd and Aspi know full well they don't need to do anything although headshot from Zedox is clean now, this time, you probably have to stick it. And Turd is aware of that. Makes the big run through lobby. But he goes the wrong way, and suddenly the kit is now on the floor. Yellow ping information as well. The clutch drones and the effectiveness of it. And Zedux to play off of those yellow pings. As Sea Warriors coming out swinging here late into the night. A 2 nothing start on border and bleed. As Rob was alluding, alluding to on the desk, are bleeding right now. What is happening? Uh, I mean, there's a couple of issues at the moment. The Monty is causing a lot of problems here for Bleed Esports, and despite them bringing the, you know, ideal composition to deal with that, the players that are key encountering him, at least early on, we're, we're, we're off the board. You can see at this point, especially with Mentalus down. This here was a really good combination, though, right? So the Oryx to bump into the Monty, knock him down. Asfri then good target um, prioritization, get the first on balcony, then the second. The damage really had already been done, and there was a lot of that space and movement towards the side, which gave the remaining attackers the ability to make something work. Zedox in the one versus two, statistically not the best of positions, and we played a discipline. They didn't get baited by the uh, the, the plant fake out from Zedox, but nonetheless, there was information available for his sleep warriors, and Zedox converted it nicely. So maybe this is going to be more of a game than we anticipated. I mean. Would I have predicted her team to win this game? No. Did you just downright insane? But you've got to give this team the respect they deserve in the same way that we did for Knock Knock. These are teams that have been around the mix, dominating in South Asia, that have then gone to the Asia playoffs time and time and time again. Now, have they been able to get over that hurdle? No, clearly not. But with that, you gain experience. And you can clearly see this is a Hasib Warriors team that's just backing themselves in. They've got that experience. They've played against these teams before. This is not new ground that is being broken. 2 nothing start. It's now bleed. You've got to give them that full-blown respect. You've been to majors. You've been to six invitationals. And you've done well at those events. Now bring all of that experience back and say, hey, we might need to lean on that to take these guys down after all. Reap's the inside of office, likely to play a first contact position. And the Monty likely to be the one to contest for the side of Hasib. So let's see how Bleed respond this time around. Logic Bomb to confirm the position. Solos has been kicked out. Lines of sight, they're being established here from Bleed as the impact comes through. Reap's allowed to fall back. Nobody on that window in play as Turd tries to find one and almost runs to his death. You can see the chaotic nature of the defense at the moment for Bleed does look a little bit disorganized. Again, naturally here on border, it is difficult to find safe positions to play, but at the moment, they are presenting opportunities for the Sim Warriors to take advantage of it. You know what I like so far as well? It's not an over-reliance on this Montang. Is it a factor? Yes. Are they playing off of it? Exclusively, no. It's kind of like almost a solo Montang a lot of the time here from Taha in the first couple of rounds. And so Bleed are probably a little confused. We saw that with the Top East hold where they were kind of like primarily focused on what that Montang was doing. But no one was really playing behind it anyway. And then they ended up getting kind of picked apart elsewhere because everyone else was kind of moving in on the entries around the map. Which is really what you want to do on a map like Border. I mean, they are actually playing this really well. And I'm quite surprised because of the, the again, class. the historic nature of it. I mean, Dev mentioned on the desk, it's been a losing streak map for them. I mean, they lost it to Knock Knock in the qualifiers. 
Oh, lovely shot from Hasib once piece. Yeah, Mentalist, 0 oh 3. No impact on this at all. Doctor, there's a frost mat down there, and also there's an Astrophy. Two very important objects to uh, take care of. 30 seconds remaining in the round, though. Time. Certainly not on the side of Hasib Warriors, but they've got the player advantage. Well, Astrophy does get isolated, taken down. The rat play does not work. The planet now to be attempted, but Hoven can flank. And he's able to. Ooh, I thought maybe able to get two, but not to be the case. The turd reaps 10 seconds. Play going yeah, down. Can... Melee from Reeves off the initial headshot that he got. Now, suddenly a, a changing tide maybe Five in the round, but didn't he? He got off the plant and got the kill. An impact there massively. Turd needs to deny he cannot. Yeah, plant will be beat. successful, and for the third round in a row, Turd's to fight himself and a chance to maybe salvage the round. Doctor, initial spray. He goes prone. He doesn't need to peek this. Dinny holds close left on that kit. Turd will heal back up. Back to full for him. 30 seconds. Knows where one is. Doesn't know. Maybe close left. He could still be. Doesn't check it. How do you not check that, Turd? I thought he knew. Did he not know? I mean... Uh, well, clearly yeah. he did not know. But he also he's... never made the cross. You know he's made that plant. You've watched it the whole way through and he hasn't crossed. I think initially he did expect him to be there and perhaps then second-guessed himself. Just the, the way he positioned himself in the crosshair placement, I thought he was just trying to isolate the first one and then he knew that the second one was up on the boost, but maybe second-guessed and thought it was the, the doorway then, I guess. I, I don't really know what happened there. But either way, it's not really a position he should have won anyway, 1v2. Hoven had to win his double here, get that diffuser on that uh, particular position. It could have been a different story. Don't know what was going on there with the Monty. That was misplaying Reap's knife that, but... This is a scrappy game. This is very weird. This is, yeah, by far and away the most perplexing game we've seen tonight. But I want, I want to say this is Hasib Warriors are playing well. Like this is not a matter of like, oh, bleed and making mistakes and bleed is looking crap, whatever. Like I genuinely think that what we've seen from Hasib in the way that they've been able to get swift entries, opening kills, playing off of set executions on the operator picks like the Montang, for example, they're getting bomb plans. Like I mean, like they are doing everything, guys. Bleed have done nothing in any way, shape, or form in being able to stop this. Outside of maybe some, like, mechanically good shots from Reaps and Asfi, they haven't looked like they've had any control defensively here on border, and that is quite astounding to Attackers me. For to a team that is of this caliber of experience, this should not be happening. But Hasib Warriors are very much proving that they are a threat in this Asia League early on. A lot still to play out, but so much respect has now been gained already for this roster. And a matter of the remainder of the teams in this league need to take notice. Well, Bleed take their tactical timeout. They need to formulate a response to the Monty. Now, it's not the only piece of this attacking puzzle that they are failing to counter, but in my eyes, it has played a significant role in disrupting and taking that control. And I think as well, just relaying information that the rest of the teams are capitalizing upon. So, the Super playing around the one tank well. We really need to be a little bit more disciplined, I think, the way in which they approach this room. And we'll see how they go about doing that. Doctor on the Brava this time around, so Kludge Drones will be in play, additional info gathering, and the ability to hack Fenrir Mines as well. Not exactly the plethora of defensive utility for him to hack, but default cameras are also an option. Once again, Zaha onto that Montang. Pretty swift entry towards break, if not mine though, will delay. Moves away from that one, maybe expecting more aggression from Bleed. Mine activated. Asfi to switch up the F-Nots. Deep in towards security. We actually saw Asfi go for the swing earlier on. Close to shot out. Already three drones gone for his hit warriors. Good information as well. The barbed wire being broken up by Taha on the Monty. Big, big push coming here from his hit warriors. Triple stack so far outside security, including at Montane. This time they may actually look to play off of the Monty. Mentalist. Wanting to go for a peek, but what can you really do against that shield in the corner? Not much. There's the fights and opening kill though on to the Hasib once piece. There's that swing from Asfi, even with the Montang in the corner. It's the Lex to go for it. And suddenly, time has been wasted a little bit. Much better from Bleed defensively. They're not overcommitted, not overpeaking. Fighting a good pick. But also, there's not much Taha can do. He's surrounded on both sides, stuck in the corner. Really difficult to get out of this position as well safely. Oh, there's his four. 
Better from Bleed here. z Darks, well, he's been a big standout so far and he's made entry in towards top waiting. Well, that is the Legion taken down. So Taha now will need to be facilitated. Goo mines now at a premium. Only those already deployed will be in play, and a lot of them probably centered around this position over towards Break and CC. Zedux to lead the charge in towards a 1v1 against Asphyr, who has been drawn out, and Zedux almost catches his tail. Asphyr, though, able to at least initially Copy escape, that. but overstays his welcome. 40 seconds, we could be like a sieve, but an equally good trade from Mentors. Activate. Colvin backs him up as well. Advantage bleed. They haven't really been in this position so far in this match. You know, three on two, 30 seconds left. Surely they can close this round out and get an opening round win on the board. You lose this, and well, mentally, they may get, be completely shot for the remainder of the night if you were to lose from this position now. Dini with the kit. Doctor very low. In towards Fountain. Spray probably needed to find a kill there. Doctor does. Despite the low health, he gets the headshot onto Hoffman. Now top metal. Oh, it's a freebie! Turn's not even watching! Suddenly they may very well lose this round after all. The plan has to be stuck. They know where mental is this. They cover to come from Doctor! What the hell am I watching? There is no way! I must be sleeping and dreaming! I think Reap's reaction says it all. They're shell-shocked at the moment. Bleed are just completely asleep at the wheel, the way they are playing this at the moment. The initial reaction in the way in which they played the early round in response to the Monty was the best we had seen so far with the Legion coming across. The really good communication they had with the Triangle through CC and then across into Armour with the Mirror Window playing Mentalist. Once that started to break down, just the late round there was really poor and Toad giving away his life for free all but confirmed the round for SC, but the retake there was going to be very, very challenging with the Crossman Held. So. Phenomenal work from Hasif, not trying to take away from them at the moment, but it has to be set. Bleed, arguably, for many probably being pitched as the best team in the league and the best chance to go to Manchester. They are just not in the server at the moment. It is day one, it is a seeding game, but this is just not acceptable. Yeah, I mean, it's a massive result for Hasif Warriors so far. That round, two on three, Doctor has virtually no health on one of the primary defensive sites of this map that it has. New mag. And arguably Bleeder in great positions to close that round out. They can watch all entry points. They've got the numbers advantage. That might be one of the, the first rounds in which I think Bleach is making critical error after critical error gave such a strong pathway back into that round. Dinny and Doctor though, they took that and ran. They still had to hit their shots and make their entries and they did. So far, no one from his Sea Warriors has put a foot wrong. Don't look at that KD of Taha. Yeah, one and four, but playing the Monty role perfectly. Everyone else is basically on fire right now. Two rounds to go in this half, and for his Sea Warriors, they are more than sensing the reality of the situation, which is a dramatic statement to kickstart the Asia League. What can Bleed Esports do now? to get themselves back into this game. It has already been quite embarrassing. You lose this though, and it's horrific. Deploying Claymore. Setting Selma. I very much wonder what the message from Julio was during the tactical timeout, just an opportunity to try and reset the team and refocus them. Unfortunately though, round four, it doesn't really pay off. So into the fifth. Minute 40 on the clock, decent slow out here over towards the top of his position, but this is where we see the Montank come into play. Taha can just take all this free ground. Really good counter to the likes of the Fenrir utility as well, because ultimately Bleed already know he's coming. And we'll see what kind of space he's able to take, and if the likes of Zedux can get in frag fragging positions. He's already sneaking and probing over towards Break. They're just getting They're really good ground, and Bleed are getting caught off guard. Oh, that was, well, that was almost going to be another freebie, but it wasn't. They were aware. Still one in towards security, but how much have they just kind of backed off a little bit? Reaps gets the kill on to Z-Duck. Massive. Boy, they needed that. I mean, they did get the opening kill in the last round prior, but it still didn't get them a massive result. Doctor, Hatcher, Hoffman, two rounds in a row. That's the mirror dealt with. Receive wants peace. Still very low on health. 
has the flashes. They have a smoke as well, which has now been expended by Doctor over towards 90. And Taha eventually can now either go in towards Fountain or even through Top Metal. And suddenly they go for a rotate. 40 seconds left. They've decided to change things up a little bit. Well, that default. Oh, now scrappy. in engagement over towards that box position. Doctor's been able to sneak forward. So again, Hasib in good key it. positions, but turned this time, able to find his one. Doctor as well, though. So 3v3, 20 seconds. Yeah, it slipped into archives and Reaps had no idea. Lovely shot back from Turdstar. Okay, can't lose this one. Especially with the Montang that has quite literally one HP. Doctor has done one more great thing in this round. Three great things in this round. Suddenly, Taha on one HP. This is the unlosable moment. With one second and no kit, there's no way he finds the double kill. He got one. But Bleed finally get one. And a pause now has been called as well with one round to go in this half. Tech issue, unfortunately, for Bleed. Ultimately, it's still a relatively close round. And to the credit of SC Warriors, this... I don't really want to say the word, but... Or, or the, the two words. Split theory. But they're actually kind of trying to... <laughs> did, you just whisp did you just whisper it so as to not summon fresh? <laughs> yeah, well, it's. I'm pretty sure it's like, what? Coming to midday in the UK, so... Or, or EU, so fair chance he's awake. And he might be watching, so... It's like, it's like almost 4 p.m. there, apparently. My God. I don't want to oh, get, so I don't want to get late. added on Twitter. Oh no, it's so late here. Yeah. I mean, I mean, because they're, they're, they're navigating themselves in these really awkward positions where they bleed don't have the information, and they're finding it difficult to then react accordingly. And I think that their slowness and their, their lack of reactivity is what cost them really early on in the game. That time though, it was a little bit better, and, and Toad clearly was in a good position to cut the entry up towards that office half of the map. So he steps up, does a good job. And then with limited time remaining, uh, the 1v1 never came into fruition. So, better from Bleed. Question though, has the damage already been done? Two rounds defensively will be okay, but it's still not, you know, great in the context of this match, especially. Well, I mean, you're right in that. And the real thing is, even if Bleed were to come back and win from this position, it feels like is, is it fair to say reputation tarnished? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. That the, the shining on the armor maybe has been scratched. That they are not this kind of immovable object when it comes to Asia League. You know, when we talk about the fact there's one slot and who maybe, quote, owns that slot, it's Bleed. That's been kind of the talk coming into this particular stage. Are they vulnerable? Well, I mean, I think so. And you can harp all the way back 2023 stage one undefeated in the group stage only to then fall short to fury in the playoffs now they got over that hurdle in atlanta and with that they were able to then go to six invitational great on the main stage they've been great on the main stage it's getting there that's always kind of been a bit of the issue i don't think they will be concerned about even if they lose this a group stage play day one loss and it doesn't matter who the opponent is. That's not taking anything away from Hasib Warriors. It's just the nature of the beast in which all you've got to do is make playoffs. From there, a couple of best of threes, and you can go to the major. And that's where I think they will pride themselves on the experience to be able to get the job done. But it's still not a good look. But it's an amazing look for Hasib Warriors, a team that, you know, not to throw my colleagues under the, under the bus, but I certainly will. They were kind of getting clowned on the desk. There was very little expectation, even yourself, guys, saying 7 0. Sorry, guys. Wow. That. It's clown. Consider it, consider it more of a, a, as a reference point and to what they've now <laughs> been able to do since then. So I don't, I don't take it personally. It's like, I know you don't. It's, it's all about. I, that, you know. I am already red-faced after my round one comment that this was going to be a 7-0. So. But I mean, well, I like, mean to, to be, be fair, fair to yourself, can you really, though, right? Can you really blame me? As good as no, the Super Warriors no. can be locally, we have seen the gap between the gap between South Asia and South East Asia not even stagnate. I would say it's probably actually grown over time. So 
this result in a vacuum really is a surprise, irrespective of where it lands from here. If Bleed win the next six rounds and win the game, even still, the start and the promise in which Hesse Warriors have shown throughout this match is really good. And probably goes back to my earlier discussion um, and the point that I made after my game number three of the evening. Maybe that then throws into disrepute the idea that seven and eight in the standings is already locked in for South Asia. Maybe there is potential that a team like Hasib Warriors could contest for a bracket spot, which mm. means who's going to be the team from SEA to miss out? Well, I mean, that does kind of, at least from a viewership standpoint, make it exciting. It kind of sucks for a region that I think deserves way more than one slot. I mean, this region should never be in a situation where there's only one slot. Like... I obviously have to be very careful with the words that I say here, but I will just reiterate on that. It shouldn't only have one slot. That's all I will say. Whether it's two, three, whatever. But it has to be more than one. It's it, Especially with what we've seen from this region continuing to improve. Now, unfortunately, and I, I, I probably can say this, but yeah, issue with Mentalist's PC. Uh, he's had to swap out his monitor, so... Hence the technical pause in question that was actually called out by mentalist pretty quickly and it looks as if we will be ready to go as per mentalist so a break in the action does that benefit bleed probably not all that much because i actually won the, the, the last round anyway prior to the technical pause so that little streak of hasib warriors had already been broken up ever so slightly as we go back into the game fortunately Thank you, everyone, of course, for just you know, bearing with us there as we had to wait for Mentalist to swap out his monitor. We are back in. All one lead, Hasib Warriors, so far, have been great. The sensor on. Will they be able to continue that? And then also into the defense. It's a whole different ask. I think Bleed are certainly more than capable in the attack itself, but bringing into question the map, right? It is Border. Like, if, if there's going to be a map in which it's going to be attack sided Border certainly can facilitate that. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, again, it's going to depend on what sort of attacking Whoa, ideas we're going to bring into the server. They themselves could play something crazy like Deimos Double Shield or Deimos Shield. Five seconds left. Jackal Shield. Um, and really ev evolve upon what I've seen from the Sea Block. Fun around though, focus uh, here for the attacking half of his Sib Warriors. Once again, it's going to be centered around that Monty. Bravo also in play. So Hasib haven't really deviated much away from what they've presented so far in the game. Maybe that can be seen as a negative if they go on to lose this next round because it's a positive in the whole game and their ability to eventually react. But we'll see. A lot of these rounds have been quite volatile. And one of the more exciting parts of said rounds has been this open duel. This time it's C-Dux. Taken very low. That was probably not a favorable fight for him, but he is able to escape but has the potential to lurk and have impact later on. We move carefully and not right out. Toxin set. Yeah, very low health now for Zedar. Makes life a little bit more difficult. Especially when you want to probably play that entry role, you want to be the Ash, you want to be aggressive as Taha just gets information of its position inside a fountain. I'm going to stop here a little bit if they've got back up to a rhyme. Who minds just slowing things down a little bit though for his Seed Warriors. Taha has also just copped the knife himself. He has been able to at least kind of brush it off. That from Mentalist, I would imagine. So though it's here, be killed. Once again, see warriors are able to find ground close by to site. Hoven just feels under the pump. He's got oh, he's a, dead. a Montang on one Ooh, side, but then the push on the other gets the down on to Hasib wants peace. Oh, and then a bit of an issue. Taha steps on the go mine. He just slips over on the floor. Zedux eventually gets the kill on to Hoven. They will be able to get Hasib wants peace back up, but he'll be low. Lovely shot from Reaps from down below. And a two versus two with 60 seconds remaining. It's another close finish to a round. But hey, if you bleed, there's one player you want up at this point. It's Reaps. Yeah, Reaps has a lot of clutch potential. His sim still is going to keep ammo up above. Meanwhile, Dinny potentially able to navigate into a plant position as well. But he needs to make this cross right here. And it's up to Reaps to deny the cross. And then that plant position near the single wall, which has been breached 
open. As Sib have a little bit of time. Rips to reposition. This is still a very, very close round if Hesib have the the right read. But as you can see, double cross. Both defenders have Swapping. a line of sight towards this plant position. So it should be pretty tough, actually. Drone shot out. One more available if required. Ventilus does hit the shed shot yeah. on to Dinny. And then Reaps had the cross the whole way through. Reprieve momentarily for Bleed. After succumbing the opening four rounds to Hasib Warriors, they win the next two to close out the half. They get two defensive rounds. And for all we know, this could end up being pretty attacker-sided. Bleed are more than capable on the attacker border to bring this game back. Armory and Archives is where Hasib Warriors will go to first. Very curious to see how they're going to play this. Doubling down Fenrir and Malusi on the anti-entry to maybe slow down Bleed as much as possible. We are seeing actually a massive return. Actually, I don't know if massive is the right word. I shouldn't use that. Attackers we are seeing a return of Malusi. It has started to be picked up once again. Why? Difficult to say. You do have the Fenrir, which acts quite similar. We have not mine information and the well, Banshee information. And yeah, this was... What happened there? Like, well, they he... knew the player was in Fountain. I think he You're forgot cool. the player was in Fountain. I think he just forgot. It happens. Yeah, look, uh, it's a ble uh, bleed salvage the half. I don't think we have uh, any reason to go back on our earlier comments, though. The start of the bleed was a disappointment. It was not good. I'm sure they'll be the first to admit that they were not playing anywhere near their best to kick things off, and they were bullied out of the server, really, and the hand forced to take the early tactical timeout as well. That's one thing that has Sid Warriors will have in the pocket for later on if they uh, so wish to use it. In terms of this attacking composition though, no Monty, no shield play here from Bleed initially. Except some dedicated flame core, Triple Nomad in play, Grim for info gathering. Rocket does persist. Quite a decent amount of utility that the Pludge Drones will be able to hack. And Reeps, well, he gets the opening pick. He's been a standout for Bleed inside of the server. A large reason as to why his team has been able to salvage a couple of these rounds. Big pick through the last round and a couple of key moments earlier on as well. And here to start off the attack is good for that opening kill. Yeah, and, and that's what we expect from Bleed. You know, I think coming onto the attack of Border, being able to get themselves swift entry, but also play the exterior value in positions. Mentalist. Mentalist. <laughs> He gives up on that rotate. They're making a lot of noise as well, and actually one has pushed him at Zedark. Metalist's got no idea. Yeah, no idea. Had he actually not messed up that rotate initially, he would not have been in that position where he dies to Zedark. So it's little things that have just not gone the right way for Bleed tonight. Four and four. Top main stairs control as well. You don't have that lurk, but what an angle from Aspie. Doctor able to at least get a trade inside of the server, brings it still... So three versus three with 90 seconds left. Dinny well, feels like under a bit of pressure here and low on health. But I'm still good up. positions being held for Hasib Warriors. Well, let's have a look at the overhead. We can see two on site, one over towards top east. That is Hasib himself. Nitro ripped. Information in the hallway. And it, well, doesn't land. Perhaps shot through the air, I would imagine. Flash should come through. And that's actually a problem for Hasib to push forward. <laughs> Straight into the air jab, but still survives. So Aspie must have turned around. And the chaos continues here in the second half. Yeah, I mean, as expected. I don't know if the, the swapping of the sides was going to change all that much, to be honest. In terms of the health advantage though, favor to bleed and now also with the numbers. Although, again, short lived. Nitrosol down below. No, Doctor, too good. Never mind, top main. 13 and 4 from Doctor. So influential. I see one's piece is still down below, but now by himself and has to make his way up top main. As Doctor lost his life to Reaps, who's starting to activate. And we'll finish off the round as well, just the way in which he started it. And a bit of excitement started to come back to bleed as well. Smiles and a little dance as well from Reaps. And suddenly for Hasib Warriors, it's very much a case of, hey, we started off great. The Bleeder getting themselves back into this game. That scoreline of 4-0 has evaporated to 4-3. We've got our work cut out for us if we're going to want to steal this opening game. They still need three more rounds. Bleed, though, are creeping up. Yeah, I mean, structurally, Bleed are just playing far objectively better. And they look way more comfortable here already in the 
in the second half to kick it off. Attackers need to locate and Reaps, of course, doing a really, really good job to get that opening kick. That continued there. Pretty important fight to win there. Hoven was very, very low on HP, and in the post plant, Hesid may have had an opportunity to, especially with the shotgun, at range to win that fight. So credit to Reaps. Now this one, the player cam, big contrast in terms of body language. Uh, I still remember back to the opening phase of the game where he quite literally had his head in his hands. That time though, a bit of a dance, a bit of a cheer. And it might just be, honestly, one of those games where it comes down to Reaps having a big game and perhaps making up for some of the shortcomings elsewhere in the team. And that's okay here and there. It is, again, only the first day of the league portion, but not ideal for a team that we're pitching to perhaps be the best, but long, long way to go still. Yeah, but even if you're the best, you can still have a slip up here or there. You look back to Bliss last stage Attackers last year, they lost to Kelton's Knights, for example, then still went on to obviously qualify, make the major, then into SI, and, and how well they performed from there. So you can't be perfect every single night. I do think it's more of a case that Hasib Warriors probably just gave them a bit of a sucker punch to begin this game. It played so well out of the gate. No mistakes, fast and furious in their approach. But this is where Bleed have been able to at least use their experience, get the game back on their terms. You know, it's kind of been a, a first half you, second half us. You know, you had us in the first half, not going to lie, kind of moment here, but Bleed have responded. But now it's up to Hasib Warriors. Have, have they got a second wind in them to be able to kind of go once again and, and get control of this match? Because it is very much now out of their hands. Bleed are the team that is controlling and dictating the server. That's Mentalist with another little minor error. It's not been his night. He needs another monitor. <laughs> <laughs> he needs another monitor. He couldn't, couldn't see the line. That's good. Now well, here is the Clunge Drone in play. So the Magnet's currently being targeted by Reaps and that will reduce the catch potential for the defense. So projectiles now become a little bit more consistent, a little bit more powerful for the attack. Mentalist drops off office and will now go below, perhaps divert a position out. There is presence though inside of Workshop, so he needs to be careful. And said player now rotating bot metal stairs, they will time one another. It was docked up, he's now gone back up above. 13 kills for him, so probably best that Mentalist didn't fuel him. Now in a position to divert from down below. 60 seconds remaining, opening kill for Asfi, good swing as well from Holven. 90 control, good for Bleed. And with that, they got themselves the player advantage quite significantly in the round again. Really starting to get control of this game. Nasib wants peace though with a fire back. And oh, a lovely second shot. What a tap onto Hovind's head. And another one potentially towards Fountain. The re-swing through the doorway though, unsuccessful. Has to be strong. But he was just on a bit of an island. Keeps himself afloat. And with that bleed now have the advantage again in the round. 30 seconds. But... They've got the player advantage. Doctor still holding strong. Deep back end of lockers. And Dinny goes for a drop on the rotate. Still has an impact available. But suddenly time has evaporated a little bit. Bleed need to still get that kit down. And Asfi's quite low. Ten seconds remaining. Ten seconds then. It'll flash this to come through. Can Asfi stick the plant? Or can they deny from down below to see it? Fortunately, that denial does not come through. Mentalist to swing, finds the kill, 1v3 post. It'll be a bleed round. It'll be a 4-4 scoreline. And they have very much flipped the script. Diddy looks to make his way up top east. Denied. Round 8 goes the way of bleed. I wonder if we get a tactical timeout coming shortly from Hasib Warriors either now or maybe at the conclusion of the next round, depending on how it does play out. It is still only a 4-4 scoreline, but what a response from bleed. It's very easy to make negative comments about them the way they started this game, guys, to be shocked. But you've got to also now tip your hat because mentally, there's some top teams that in that position would just forfeit. Not literally, but mentally. You're down for nothing. The challenger has just outplayed you in every single way, shape, or form. It's also not a match that's do or die. It's very easy to just kind of check out mentally, but they have not. They've dug deep. They've kept themselves in the game. And with that now, I've actually got them back into a position where even though the scoreline says 4-4, they are in control of this match. 
No if ends or buts, and the tactical timeout has not been taken by Hasib Warriors. So that momentum has continued to just build and build and build now for Bleed Esports. What can Hasib do defensively to stop this avalanche? Reaps is activated. Aspie's having a great game. Turb and Hovind are getting their kills as well. I mean, it's all starting to click a little bit more now for Bleed. Five seconds left. Yeah, I, I think if I'm Hesip at the moment, I'm just investing all my resources and effort into trying to win the entry duel. What happens from that point onwards, wait and see. But they just haven't really put, been able to lay that foundation yet and then been able to play off it effectively, really, in most cases. And a lot of those fights have also just been quite isolated or favorable. So Hesip can maybe look to, to tag team around the map and be in more tradable positions at the very least. See what they uh, elect to do. Velk in play, but again being countered nicely here by Bleed. You have the IQ in pocket. Osa as well, so Mentor's now flexing on that. A slightly different piece of utility defense to deal with. Triple Nitro lineup though, so explosives available. Xenox does fall though. And I was just talking about these isolated, unfavorable fights, and that's a perfect display of one. Who else but Reaps to win the fight as well? Up to double digits here for Bleed. Yeah, where's the response now for Hisib Warriors under the pump? It's all well and good to have that that dream suddenly looking like it's on the edge of reality, but now it's slipping away. That opening start to the stage that just looked oh so amazing is just now looking like it could be out of their grasp. The response from Bleed has been paramount. Turn through customs. He's got a good sightline in towards site as well. Dinny on the other side, though. On towards server side. A similar angle. 90 seconds. Bleed. Not really making any crucial mistakes either. Mentalist with the miss flash and the miss rotate hole. Those are so incredibly marginal. It's irrelevant. As a core unit, as a core team, they are no longer really making critical errors. They look far more switched on. In sync and synergize. This Reaps is obviously leading from the front in terms of the frag department. But as a team, even here, not rushing. Now they actually look... Oh, never mind. Aspie doesn't check the left-hand side. I could see that coming. <laughs> there was a trade in top east stairs in control for bleed with that kill from Hovind on to Doctor. Hasib wants P still watching that window carefully. Reaps on the outside of it. Dinny with a good headshot. Mentalist go over the plant now. Ooh, what a swing! It's like a Ferrari peak from Hasib wants peace. Shot back from Hovind as well through the soft wall. Oh. And then Denny with a Nitro Cell. Hovind in a one versus two. The peak comes through. You didn't need to make that though. Defenders for Hasib wants peace. And Denny and Hovind in a one versus one on the retake. Critical point in this match as well. And Denny's actually going to go for the push. Top east. Hovind though has the talent shield. Denny will even check. What? Oh, no. They're not watching each other. And Hovind makes it back to safety behind the shield. And with that, Dinny knows he probably can't win the round. Needs to get on it and stick it with a long arm of the, the law. He can't find the angle. Wait, wait, Hovind wait, wait, just taps away for a bit of fun to just say, you're not winning the round. I mean, there's a lot to unpack in that round. That Osa double shield talent set up there from Bleed is really gnarly because it adds the, the first layer of Mentalist being able to get the plant down. And even if he gets impacted or nitroed out later on in the post, which we saw a really, really good retake there of the objective itself from Hasib, there's that extra layer up above where with Vert in play, that talent shield up there means that anyone trying to retake up East Stairs is in a lot of trouble. Now it almost actually fell apart. Hoven vaulting there almost resulted in his death. Like he yes, almost just yes. straight up threw and died because he didn't just sit behind the shield. But ultimately, it did work out, and that entire little uh, preset play there from Bleed. Yeah, that's the moment I'm talking about. He literally almost just completely threw. I wonder if um, he heard the, the sound cue and got confused and thought that he was down, and maybe he didn't have an angle. Like, the, the position behind the shield wasn't actually good enough to spot the kit, for example, or to think that, oh, maybe he's found an angle. I've heard something. And then, because you could clearly see, he had no idea that he was actually pushing up top of his stairs. And the timing of it was just incredible. The fact, though, that Denny was not really watching the entry point either is probably what saved Hoven in the end. The tactical timeout has been taken and obviously now has elapsed and I think really well timed as well for Hasib Warriors. Just make an argument they could have taken it at 4-4 but back themselves in and I like that. I think this is now a good usage of that timeout and curious to see what they can bring. 
The one downside, though, so far, guys, is they have not been able to win a defensive round at all. Lead have now won three attacking rounds in a row after having then won two prior to that to close out their own defense. So five rounds in a row now for Bleed Esports. And you have to give them the credit in terms of this response. Both teams, I think, can take a lot away from this game. If Hasib Warriors do lose this match, they've still gained a monumental amount of respect, I think, moving forward for the remainder of the stage. But there certainly will be concerns regarding allowing kind of bleed back into this game. But I think that just speaks more towards what bleed are capable of when they're at their best. When they're not making mistakes and they're playing at their best, they are a very difficult team to beat. Yeah, for sure. And I think the structure they have here on attack is really solid and certainly a level above what Hasib would be playing against domestically in South Asia. So it's, it's pretty difficult to fault them here in the second half. I think they've already uh, rocked the bed enough with the first four rounds. That was a valiant effort. And they've now just been outmatched by a team that has uh, arrived in the server officially. Either way, round 10. Reaps on a heater. Double digits, as mentioned previously, has been a key part of the entry for Bleed. As the attack will gain a little bit of ground top east. And with the Nomad in play, it will make the ability for said defense to retake a little bit more challenging. No one really contesting through the CCTV portion of the map either. So Bleed will get a read on that pretty quickly and uh, take that control, cut off main stairs, and then look to start pinching in positions like Office, where red ping information is available. Drop those two come through and ask for you to take ground through waiting. A bit of a slow burn of this round. We haven't really seen too many of them. Border, for example, and two teams that are happy to play aggressive. They've been pretty fast in their approach, but 90 seconds left, still a five versus five. I'd say that's a good thing, probably, for Hissy Warriors. Going through the hatch in towards bathroom, the spot one. Uh, apparently, it survived as well. Z Ducks, big, big chunk of damage onto him. Frag thrown from Mentalist, wants to take the battle, and in the end, Z Ducks just probably felt like he couldn't really move, stuck on an island. The frag will be his demise. Hasib wants peace Reloading. with a critical kill there onto Reaps. Shuts down the main fragger of Bleed. Especially when there was a three versus five momentarily, now four. With a minute remaining. Doctor in customs with a bit of yellow pink information, but honestly, he's kind of wandering around aimlessly. Not really Attackers close to any of the Bleed attackers. attackers recovered the bot and user. I admit this match is really displayed when the key players have... Uh when they diverge a little bit, right? z started off so well. It was an incredibly important part of his success early on, but then Reap's able to step up, and despite now being in the grave, he still had an impact in this round. So just showing that those star players can have a difference, for better or for worse. Turd, though, Do to compound 20 seconds, 4v2. Dr. Caught out. Oh, okay, Turd. Activated late into the night. Seconds left. Uh, Mental has got off the plant there momentarily. Sib wants a piece, maybe just causing the ruckus up above. It uh, has obviously gotten him off it. Doesn't really matter. They obviously are able to close him down. And with that, I think Bleed are pretty close to being able to close this game out. It was a massive scare to begin this match. 4 nothing to Hasib Warriors. For those that are maybe only just tuning in, six rounds in a row, though, from Bleed, the response has been nothing short of perfect, Gus. They haven't made really any mistakes. A lot of the rounds have been in control. They've been the team that's typically been winning the rounds. Even if there's been a moment here or there where it's 2v2 or 1v1, Bleed have always been the team in the better position. Defenders, protect your bombs from being defused by attackers. Match point, 6-4. And the Amaru comes into play potentially here for Bleed in the upcoming round. So you think that they may look to uh, just shift up the pace and be a little bit more direct in towards site, most likely. Archive Sense also in play. So, I mean, all the hallmarks of an Archive stack here from Bleed. We can just get this one across the line in a clean fashion. Um, they defensively does have Solace in play, so there is vertical denial potential. Likely means that Bleed will need to try and navigate in a position on that Ritz um, portion of the objective so they can Five get the plant down safely. It does open up weaknesses elsewhere, especially through the likes of the fountain. So let's see how Bleed deal with it. 
And if they're even going to go for that particular push, also an option to maybe go over towards Armory side as well. Um, so options are plenty here for the attack. It's really difficult now to kind of dissect this match for Hasib Warriors, where it's so easy to praise them in that first half and the way in which they started. It was great. They were playing amazing. And as strange as it is, it's not as if they've stopped playing amazing or they've started playing bad. It's just believed to have really gone to another level. Nice feet. Very much setting up for the fast hit here. That could actually spell the end of the Sib Warriors for the night. If this is successful from Bleed. Yep, everyone just getting in position. The U2 will be layered accordingly. Asfi is the one with the fuser in hand, so probably a sandwich plan. And straight in, wins that battle against it. He does get taken down. ROU has been thrown out as well, successfully by Mentalist. Now looking to open up some sight lines. Get down on the floor, but two players on the floor for Sib Warriors. So far, a win at the moment for Bleed as the Hive Launcher being utilized by Hover. No more canisters available, so no more bees after this. It is very much a do-or-die kind of moment. Z Ducks caught wandering. Turd was watching. Bot West Main. There's another player in there as well, and Doctor is that other player. And unfortunately for Hasib Warriors, they're all just stuck on the floor. Taha, Hasib wants peace. Dinny, at least one revive to come through from Doctor. And even though it says it's a four versus four, it is not. This should be all she wrote. Seven rounds in a row from Bleed and won't be checking that left side. Headshot from Turdstar. A double to finish it off from Bleed Esports. You thought you had us. It was never that close, says Bleed Esports. GG's in chat. Respect earned from Hasib Warriors, but no win, no points. For Bleed Esports, they are able to escape the nightmare. Oh, we got baited. Uh, <laughs> not really uh, much more complicated than that. Bleed, uh, yeah, first four rounds, I think we were right to be concerned. The way in which they played was just so far off the expectation that they've set and the standard that they have set over the last six to 12 months, but they tidied it up. They put Zedox on an island, completely shut him down. Reap's put in playmaking positions, continued to improve. Turd start with some really, really big moments as well. So Bleed turned it up when it mattered and um, Ultimately, they walk away with three points, which is the most important part of the puzzle. Got to take solo though, and what we saw from the Sim Warriors in those first four rounds, in the way they were playing. It's border, it's attack, sure, you could definitely kind of dissect it really deeply, and, and maybe you can take some pieces out of that and say, okay, well, here's some reasons why they're able to do that, but they still did it. And that's the key takeaway for me. Very curious to see what the remainder of the stage is going to be like for them. They've caught my attention. And obviously for Bleed though, they've got the win and that's the main thing that matters. Both teams can take a little bit away from this game. And uh, we are going to be bringing the desk back in to the fold, of course, to kind of close things out for the night. That was our final game of the night. Robert, were you panicking a little bit there in the first couple of rounds? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we all were. I think everyone was starting to stress that the uh, script that had been written almost two years ago has started to crumble before our very own eyes. But no, uh, they do tidy things up. And uh, to quote uh, Dev uh, from the OS League, you know, it's the most league. Well, this is the most game. I don't really know what else to say. I genuinely am stunned by what I've seen, Dev. Uh, but ultimately, you know, we, we get what was coming. It just took way too long to get there. Yeah, yeah. I don't really understand what was going on in those first four rounds for Bleed. And I think dozens that I'll give credit uh, to Seabus Warriors, right? Like, they played really well in those first four rounds, and I don't want to discredit that. Uh, but once Bleed figured out what was going on, Rick had his moment to face palm or whatever it was, and then they came back with seven in a row. They really dialed in and we saw that in the results which is uh, exactly what we expected out of bleed it's not yep. maybe the first four rounds uh, i think nuttery said it best uh one of our production members he said that was definitely one of the games yeah uh there's kind of speechless at the end of that one man he definitely had expected a little bit different but ultimately you know we, we as we've mentioned it's done. It's dusted. We can move on. We've got to take the portions of that game for each team. We're going to take the first four rounds for Hasib, and we're going to take the last seven rounds for uh, for Bleed, and just leave it at that, right? 
Yeah, I think so. You asked me at the start what I thought was the pass mark for Hasib Warriors, and I said just look competitive in rounds. You don't need yes. to win them, and then they won four. So I think very much they've passed my mark, at least. They've done well. <laughs> well, they get the tick and uh, the tick of approval they'll need because ultimately uh, they've just gone up against the very best, and they've been able to... Uh, I guess they've been able to pull their own punches, and that's something that we will have to continue to keep an eye on throughout the rest of this league. But, Dev, across the course of the night, we've seen a lot of games played out for in total. Uh, I feel like the majority of it's gone to scripts. Uh, I think the first game of the day was probably the least expected. Uh, obviously, Jolita and Fury... The game of the night, the classic Thai rumble, and Jolita, believe it or not, took that. So they were down 5-6 in regulation, and they came back and won an 8-7 overtime, which is a massive booster for them. Fury, the back-to-back -back champions of the Asian region from last year. They didn't miss a major, the only team from the region to do so. They went to SI, and Jolita, oh, with the new pickup, the new... I don't know, is it a new roster or a new org? Because you had the no-cap roster and the Jolita org, and Jolita just ditched all their old players and picked <laughs> up the no- Whatever, however you want to play Best it. of both worlds. It's a, it's a great debut for Jolita, that's for sure. That's the highlight for me. Uh, yep. We still we learn a little bit about the new teams as well. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with what we saw out of Die Wolves, even though uh, Daystar did give them a good fight, and I want to credit Daystar for that. Uh, Elevate Knock Knock was, was an okay game as well, but uh, yeah, I think Knock Knock have a long way to go. Uh, Elevate are the really... Uh, I think Elevate, Fury, Jolita, Bleed, they're the four for me at the moment, the big four. Oh, he hasn't even said... F Wait, did you say Fury? Yeah, El yeah Fury, oh, okay, Jolita, okay, okay, Elevate, sorry. Bleed. Yeah, so yeah, not cool, cool. I was about to go. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I was about to have a panic <laughs> attack for a second there. But Mandy, uh, final, hey, thoughts our, <laughs> final, uh, final thoughts on our final final thoughts on our first night of uh, Asia. It's not not finishing too late. Wow, really? Yeah, well, it's only three in the morning at the moment. That's not too bad for us, is it? It's no, not. I thought bad. it was a good night. Mm. I thought it was a good night of Asia League. Um, I was pretty happy to see Daystar, especially debut. I feel like for me, that was personally one of my highlights of the night. To be honest, I think that was a pretty fun, chaotic game. But I'm keen to see how far they can make a run through the tournament. Well, look, there's a there's a lot of uh, a lot of and ifs and buts around this league. Hopefully, we'll start to get a better idea as to what it's starting to shape out. Uh, really, in a couple of weeks, it's not going to be tomorrow night. I can I can reassure you of that. But speaking of tomorrow night, we're going to be back for this league, for Asia League, again, same place, same time. The uh, Meta League is actually uh, starting their broadcast in. One hour and 45 minutes. So if you haven't had enough Siege for the night, if you haven't got your fix yet, make sure you stick around for that one. Otherwise, uh, if you just want to watch the Asia League, of course, again, same place, same time, tomorrow night. Until then, please take care, stay safe, and good night.